Hey, Pokemon Masters, Perky Toby here, and welcome to the future. It is a very bleak future, mind. Things have changed a lot since you were here last. Things have gotten a little bit bizarre. Not to worry, though, you are here now, and that's what's important. We can finally sit down and have that talk about alien Pokemon. And you can't deny alien Pokemon this time. I mean, we've spoken about Jigglypuff and Clefairy before, but I have reports from Alola talking about mini ores there, or BHMs in Unova, and Cresselia and lots of the other legendary Pokemon are all said to have come from the stars. Here, take a look at this. In the Alola region, there's reports of a trainer who stumbled on a man who wanted to see a Solrock and a Lunatone. This man, when spoke to, said that he could finally go home and disappeared into the sky. Further reports from the same trainer speak of a Pokemon called Nebby. I'm not sure what species that is, and Nebby is not so much an alien, but rather cosmic dust particles that have become a Pokemon. That said, I see it as proof that life outside our own planet exists. So we know, Pokemon Masters, that aliens exist. You certainly know it now. But what you don't know is, where am I? I am in Neo Saffron City, a metropolis, a hub of human ingenuity, and home to the greatest tech company that the Pokemon world has ever seen. Talking, of course, about Selfco. Why they produce everything from potions to Pokeballs, and oh, oh, sorry, they probably even created the tech that developed my AI. This is Al, and Al has been deciphering and decrypting the information that I stole from the old Selfco building. Let's see what he has to say about alien Pokemon. Hey, Toby. I found something about them and their sister company, Devon, deep in the files of the old Silfco building. About a decade ago, a meteor headed on a collision course with Earth was discovered to be the alien life form we now know as Deoxys. The planet was saved thanks to a young Pokemon trainer. However, Silfco and Devon had their own plans to never leave the Earth undefended again. Porygon is an artificial Pokemon first developed by Silfco that can travel through digital cyberspace. He was made entirely from programming code before being actualized in the real world, thanks to incredible scientific advances. Its upgraded version, Porygon 2, is known for its ability to travel in deep space. It also knows the move Conversion 2, which makes the Pokémon the same type as the attacking opponent. This makes sense seeing as Sylph had no idea what they are up against in this line of defense. The last part here says that a Porygon 3 project was in production at a place known as the Aether Foundation, but never saw full development. Toby? Ah uh, yes, the Aether Foundation. Now they are a very familiar foe of mine. I had to stop them before from opening up an ultra wormhole above a densely populated area. I mean, their CEO, was she mad? An ultra wormhole is not a good thing for this universe, Pokemon Masters. No, it is a tear in the fabric of reality that leaves this version of reality open to, well, a creature that we are not ready for. We can deal with alien threats like Deoxys, we understand them. But the Ultra Beasts that come from Ultra Space, well, they are scary. And right now, there is an Ultra Wormhole open right above my head, Pokemon Masters. This city square used to be bustling with people and Pokemon, but ever since UB01 showed up, they've been frightened and in hiding. Many people have lost their lives, many Pokemon too. This is the apocalypse, and we should be trying to get out of here ourselves. Pokemon Masters, there's something I've yet to tell you. I am a member of an organization known as the International Police, and we've been researching the Ultra Beasts, and perhaps a way to defeat them. Al is right, there was a Porygon 3 in production that was meant for this task. It's no wonder that the Aether Foundation gives away Porygons. It was meant to explore alternate dimensions. You can find that much out in Porygon Z's Pokedex entries, but it's called Z and not 3 for a reason. Something went wrong, and I think it was a sinister hacking because the data of Porygon 2's upgrade is not correct. Instead of a second upgrade, we got a dubious disk, and all the data is corrupted. Pokemon Masters, I know you really want to save this world, but there's nothing more we can do. This is the darkest timeline, but don't worry. I've built us this teleportation machine, and with it, we will go up right through the heart of the Ultra Wormhole to the parallel Pokemon world on the other side, and we can use what we've learned here to save that world from the Ultra Beasts. Isn't that great? Oh, there is one problem, though. In order to use this machine, you need one of these, and, well, this is the last one I could find in the old Selfco building. You don't mind if I just, uh, saw high Pokemon Masters. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Patobi here. 
Oh, I know, right? Poor Pidgeot. Fate, what are you doing out here? I'm out here looking for my room key. That should be me. Uh, yes, number 301. No one appears to be home to serve me, although that's not surprising given where we are. Damn, I could go on for ages. <laughs> Listen to me chit chat. This is no place for that. Let's get out of the darkness of the lobby. Pokemon Masters, you know I am a Pokemon researcher, and you should also know that I am particularly interested in the supernatural claims about the Pokemon world. For example, who is the ghost girl from within Phoebe's room of the Elite Four? What was the deal with that Spiritomb from C. Marvel, and did Lavender Town Syndrome actually ever happen? Of course, today I am researching some supernatural claims from deep within the Eterna Forest. Eterna, derived from the word eternal, which is a great word to describe this place. I am talking, of course, about the abandoned old chateau. Oh, Stantler, you too? It's a shame with the holidays coming up, there'll be one less Stantler running around. Although I can't say I'm surprised, this house was once owned by some very rich people. Not anymore though, however, and no one really knows why. No one knows why this mansion was abandoned. But then that's why we're here, to investigate. And I'm glad you're here with me because the noise is like, whoa! I'm sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. Perhaps you'd feel more comfortable if you were better informed. Let me tell you everything we know about this mansion so far. Now to the public eye, this used to be a luxurious mansion that was abandoned for an unknown reason, but it also used to be the home of the original recipe for the old gatto, a consumable sought after all over the Pokemon world. Of course, now it's just the home to ghost type Pokemon, Ghastly, Haunter, and Rotom. Oh, you don't know about Rotom? Rotom is an electric and ghost type Pokemon that is made primarily of plasma. I've done a lot of research on Rotom before, and some say it's a legendary Pokemon, and others say it's the ancestor to all Shuppet. <laughs> some people in Alola even claim to use this Pokemon in their Pokedex. This is because Rotom can get inside the motors within machinery. Fans, lawnmowers, fridges, you name it. And while normally it's quite a playful Pokemon, a harmless prankster really, the evidence of this place suggests otherwise. There are ghosts within these halls and we know that, not just the ghosts of Ghastly, Haunter and Rotom, but there are rumours of human ghosts, departed spirits from beyond. An old man, a butler of this house perhaps, and a little girl are reported widely to have been seen within these halls, haunting them. The most common reason that spirits in folklore tend to remain bound to the earth is if they have some unfinished business. Of course, I have seen no such ghosts during my stay here. Although, something peculiar did happen in the library earlier. This old notebook fell on my head, seemingly out of nowhere. The text is worn and faded, you can't read it, although there was one passage I could make out. It said, something so peculiar should make off with the motor. What do you suppose that means? I guess it could be referring to Rotom. Oh, I've just realized. You're gonna love this. I have another old notebook that I found in the Sinnoh region. In fact, it's the only other one. And I believe that if you combine the two, perhaps, its text also refers to Rotom. Take a look. I found it in the nearby Team Galactic headquarters found in Eterna City, and the text inside, as well as the design and name of the notebook itself, is the same with the one found in the library. Of course, that begs the question, what would Team Galactic want with this dusty old notebook? Well, it's possible they came here looking for Rotom. After all, there is a well-documented member of their team, Sharon, who appears to be somewhat obsessed with Rotom. He has a mysterious notebook himself, very clearly written by him and his research on Rotom, but amongst his notes was this old notebook, which clearly wasn't written by him, and has some clues about not only Rotom, but also what happened here in the old chateau. It's a story about a person and their toy robot that turns out to be being possessed by Rotom. The two become the best of friends, inseparable in fact, apart from one little problem in their relationship, which is... They can't hug or touch because of the electricity that Rotom produces. It would simply be too deadly for the human trainer. However, there is a bit of an accident one day. The human trainer startles Rotom, and Rotom flees, but not before discharging a lot of its electrical power, leaving our author unconscious. 
when the author awakens, they go looking for Rotom just to let them know that they forgive Rotom. And eventually, they do find each other again. They make up, they hug, and they remain friends for the rest of their lives. It's sweet, isn't it? But there's a problem here, Pokemon Masters. Have you worked out? Just a moment ago, it was talking about how they hugged when they reunited, but a few paragraphs earlier, it was talking about how they couldn't possibly do that. They couldn't touch each other because of Rotom's devastating electricity. Now, it comes to mind that the writer must have been a child, because who else but a child would own a toy robot? And there is the ghost of a child walking around these very halls, a young girl who's been seen here frequently. She seems to be stuck in the old chateau with some unfinished business. And that paints a very different picture if she's the writer. Because if she is, it means that Rotom was her friend and when she startled him, he accidentally electrocuted her, killing her. Like I said earlier, Pokemon Masters, one of the main reasons in folklore that spirits remain attached to the earth is that they feel they have unfinished business here. The little girl had a lot of unfinished business. She needed to find her friend Rotom and tell him that he wasn't to blame for her passing out. Of course, as we know from her perspective, she would have just blacked out and woken up, but it seems more than likely that in fact that's when she died and wrote the rest of the notebook from beyond the grave. Another good indicator is that that is what happened, is that her toy robot was found in the trash heap of her nearby town. Why was it there instead of just in her bedroom waiting for her? Or maybe it's because her parents threw her out, because with the toy, they were abandoning it, much like the old chateau. Luckily, the story ends with the two of them reuniting, the little girl and Rotom, best friends back together. And finally, now that they're both ghosts, they can hug. It's the only way that comment makes sense. The story ends with them saying that they'll spend the rest of their lives together. Dot, dot, dot. Seriously, that's how it ends. It ends with a dot, 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 a eh? to be continued. Uh, this isn't the end. Uh, there was something left unsaid about that last comment. The rest of their lives together. <laughs> sure thing. Then again, I suppose you and I, we have all of eternity to think about that. Pokemon Masters. This is Ash Ketchum. You just watched a video for your Burkeeper Tony. That makes you a Pokemon Master. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Burkey Toby here, and welcome to the Great Crown Tundra here in the Gala region. I'm just out searching for some old Pokemon rocks and uh, plugging my new merch. Available now using the links below. The secrets of the Pokemon Earth are fascinating, but some are better left are not dug up. From ancient temples and ancient ruins, some things are just better left alone. I'm talking, of course, about the Regis. Route number 134 in the Hoenn region is made up of a complex series of waterways and rapids. A beginning trainer will be pushed all the way from Pacific Dog Town in the east to Slayport City in the west. But a master of these waterways will find themselves in a very peculiar dive spot, which will take them to the sealed chamber. Built by people who used to live there, there's hieroglyphs on the wall telling you the story of these people. And as well as that, they've left behind some instructions. Use dig on the wall, have relicanth and whale lord in your party, and caverns across the Hoenn region will open up with, of course, more really strange tasks for you to do. Use strength, use rock smash, use fly. Stand still and just be patient, and these caverns will open up and reveal to you the resting place of three of the most fearsome Pokemon in the world. I'm talking about Regice, the iceberg Pokemon that has a body that emits a mist of less than minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Reggie Steel, which is really strange for an ancient Pokemon because the technology that seems to make it would appear to be futuristic. And Reggie Rock, made of different stones from across the world, it hasn't eroded over the eons. These Pokemon are like immortal beings, but what are they doing locked up here? And what about the two new Reggies that have been discovered? Pokemon Masters, this place is fantastic. There's all sorts of traces of ancient Pokemon in here. Here in the Gala region, there are two newly discovered kinds of Regis, Regilecki and Regidrago. Combine those with the aforementioned ice, rock and steel, and we have five. But those five are merely pawns. They are the keys that lock away the king. And Regigigas is sitting on his throne. 
Reggie Gigas is the creator of the Reggies, and according to its Pokedex entries, it is an enduring legend that says that it moved continents with ropes. On top of that, it is known for being the creator of Regice, Regirock, and Registeel. A creator Pokemon to be sure, but also possibly a destroyer. Moving continents is incredibly destructive. And it is perhaps for this very reason that it was sealed away, not just under the seafloor cavern, not just in the Hoenn region, but instead, it was locked away, sealed in Snow Point Temple, which is the northmost point of the Sinnoh region, miles away from the warm waters of Hoenn. There, locked away, alone, away from the other Regis, it seems to have reduced in power. In Pokemon Platinum, when you encounter it, it is only level 1, suggesting that its power has diminished and been reduced across the eons, which was maybe the point. Additionally, the Snowpoint Temple is an incredibly isolated place. The whole of Snowpoint City seems to have been built around it. Why else would there be a town all the way up in this big icy tundra? But it seems to be the case that whoever locked away Regigigas wanted to be certain that the only people that would ever unlock it and reveal its location would be trainers who are worthy and strong enough to tame it. But here's the thing, Pokemon Masters. The question we have to ask ourselves is who would lock such an incredible creature away? My suspicion is that it would be the people of Pacifidog Town, a seafaring people, and communities like theirs can be found all over the Pokemon world. The Seafolk Village in Alola, or even in the Fior region, their Summerland, where the Pokemon Rangers live. My suspicion is it is a people like those who know all about the history and lore of the Pokemon world who would be afraid of such a creature. Not only do they live next to the Sealed Chamber, but they also live next to the Sky Pillar, which means they're possibly related to the Draconids. These people of Pacific Dog Town are likely related to the Draconids. Lore keepers of old, they know all of the secrets of the Pokemon world. They seem to be intimately familiar with the goings on of Infinity Energy, the battles between Groudon and Kyogre, where Rayquaza came from, the origins of the Eon duo and the Reggie trio, and it would seem to be the case that the people of Pacific Dog Town all do seem to have information about different legendary Pokemon. The Draconids are also responsible for building the Sky Pillar, and it would seem that Structures like this can be found all across the Pokemon world, homing all sorts of different legendary Pokemon. It would seem deep in the jungles of the Fior region there is the Jungle Relic, an ancient temple home to the legendary beasts, found just by a sea village known as Summerland. A place that has very similar architecture to Pacifidog Town. And actually a similar group of people can be found in the Seafolk Village in the Alola region. Additionally, there is the Embedded Tower in Johto. A great tower where Groudon, Kyogre and Rayquaza can be found. And sure enough, the Draconids have a presence there as well. The Dragon's Den is home to a group of Dragon Masters, the leader of which wears a Rayquaza on their head. Suggesting that there might be some connection between this Johto-based Dragon Clan and of course, the Draconid people who traveled all across the world. Even the Reggie ruins of the Crown Tundra have architecture that resembles that of the Embedded Tower and the Relic Stone. Additionally, their presence can be found in the Granite Cave in the Hoenn region. There they've placed a memorial to the beings that once wreaked havoc in the Hoenn region, Groudon and Kyogre. Additionally, the idea that the people of the Seal Chamber, the people of Pacific Dog Town and the Sea Folk Village, and the people who made these ancient ruins, the Draconids are all related, is combined through the very clues that the people of the Sea Folk Cavern left behind, using Relicanth and Whale Lord makes sense for a seafaring people. We even see a boat shaped like a Whale Lord in the Seafolk Village. Additionally, the need to access these chambers using Dig, Fly, and Strength makes sense for a people who use Flygon and Salamance. Trapinch learns Dig naturally, Salamance can learn Strength via HM, and both can learn Fly and both Pokemon are famously used by the Draconid people. But if these Aboriginal law-keeping people, the Draconids, are really the ones who locked away the Regis, then it's safe to assume they also locked away the master, Regigigas, up at the Snowpoint Temple. The cold waters of Snowpoint are about as far away as you can get from the warm waters of Hoenn, so they locked it away pretty far from the other Regis. And in order to get to the Snowpoint Temple, there's only two ways. Either you go by sea, because you are a people familiar with the sea, or you travel through Mount Cornet, which is a place that has a lot of magic and mystery of its own. Below it lie the Iceberg Ruins of Regice, above it the Spear Pillar, where legendary Pokémon are said to be summoned. And through it, a dense field of electromagnetism capable of powering up a particular Pokémon that is sort of like a Reggie in and of itself, or rather, an anti-Reggie. But you know what? Who knows?
Deep in Granite Cave, where the memorial of the Weather Trio is found, another Pokemon can be found sealed away in stone, not too dissimilarly to the Regis. Only obtainable by using Rock Smash, again, much the same as the Regis here, you can find Nosepass, a sort of mini golem inspired by the East Egg Islands. These heads are known as Mawai, and they are deeply tied to Polynesian culture as guardian spirits. The Polynesians inhabited a whole group of islands across the Polynesian Triangle and the ocean. They're an Aboriginal people and they traveled a lot, which sounds very similar to what's going on here with the Seafolk people and the Draconids. Guardians of the Oceans and Traveling and the Ancient World Nose Pass is the perfect coming together of this. Its Pokedex entry reads that its magnetic nose constantly faces north. Travelers check Nose Pass to get their bearings. This makes Nose Pass the perfect Pokemon for a sea traveling people. And with a little help, I've been rummaging around in some files of a ruin maniac, and we found this. Nose Pass is a Pokemon that appears to have deep ties to Infinity Energy. In Hoenn, it is found at Granite Cave, where Champion Steven was searching for information about the Mega Evolution and Primal Reversion phenomenon. Maybe the answers Steven was looking for were left in the cave in Great by the Draconis, a group of people who are also masters of this kind of energy. Traveling around the world, they would have lots of uses for Nose Pass. This Pokemon could guide them as they traveled by sea, to places like Akala Island, using its magnetic nose as reference, and sea travel is ingrained to nose passes design. They are modeled after the Moai from the Eastern Island, made by people from Polynesia who reached this place during a major sea migration that saw them reach places like Madagascar, New Zealand, and Hawaii. Nosepass can also be found around the ridgy ruins of Unova, as well as on Route 10 of Kalos, which also has deep connections to Infinity Energy. It would seem that Infinity Energy, the sea travelers of the Pokémon world, the Draconids and the Regis are all somehow connected. But what is the story here? Well, if you ask me, the clue is in Nosepass's nose and in its Pokedex entry. The nose always points north, but what is in north? Sure, the North Pole, it's good for navigating and traveling, especially if you're a seafaring per people. But also in the north of the Pokemon world is the Sinnoh region. We know already that it's north of Johto, Kanto and Sinnoh, and at the northmost point, Snowpoint Temple. So Nose Pass could be used as a way of finding the temple and being aware of where the danger is. And given that it's locked away behind Rock Smash, like many of the temples are locked away behind HM moves, are we suggesting here that Nose Pass is created? And if so, is that what it's for? When we look to the other golems of the Pokemon world, and no, I don't mean golem here, we see Claydol, Golurk, and Stonjourner. Both Claydol and Golurk are brought to life by a special kind of energy, and Stonjourner's origins seem to be a complete mystery as well. Though deeply connected to runic monoliths in the Gala region, they were likely made by people, again, and brought to life through special manipulation of energy. And while not all rock Pokemon are formed this way, Nose Pass, based on its facial structure and the magnetic qualities, are very clearly carved and shaped. They would seem to have been created. In this respect, Nose Pass would seem to be a guardian of this tribe that was perhaps using Infinity Energy, which is an energy that the Draconids were very familiar with, to bring Pokemon to life. But not only that, it ties in with the Regis, being found in many of the areas and caves where you can find Regis across the Pokemon world. Even in Pokemon Generations, we see Probobass outside Snowpoint Temple, aiming to stop intruders from coming in. Its Pokedex entry claims that it exudes strong magnetism from all over its body. It controls three small units called Mini Noses. Mini Nose Nodes. That seems very similar to Regigigas and its three initial children. Probopass is the ancient Reggie, with its three noses being its three mini Reggies. Given that and its connection to Snowpoint Temple here in Pokemon Generations, it might be safe to assume that these Pokemon are somehow related. It would seem to be the case that inspired by the creation of Regigigas, Nosepass and Probopass are there to act as guardians to trainers who would seek it out or try to stop its reawakening. Isn't it amazing? The idea of an ancient civilization saving the future of the world by locking away Regigigas behind HM walls and ancient caverns and leaving nose pass as protectors. Except there's no nose pass in the Gala region, there's certainly none here in the Crown Tundra. And if there's no nose pass to protect the Reggie temples, then surely the Reggies are closer to waking up. And I think I know what's happening here. 
Here is the big problem though. The Pokemon Matang is highly attracted to the electromagnetism that Nosepass produces. According to his Pokedex entry, it will pursue Nosepass at speeds exceeding 40 miles per hour. Talk about a rock smash. It's interesting to state that there's this relationship between Predator and Prey, between Matang and Nosepass, given that they don't actually live in the same locations at all. Yet, this Pokedex entry needed to have come from somewhere. You can, of course, find Beldum in the Hoenn region, but there's only the one given to you by Stephen Stone. It doesn't seem to be naturally forming on the Earth. In fact, even the, in the Alola region, where Nosepass appears on one island, Beldum will appear on Mount Hukulani, on an entirely different island, perhaps too far away to detect the electromagnetism that Nosepass gives out. Beldum, Matang, and Metagross can also be found in the giant chasm, but thankfully for Nosepass, it lives inside caves instead of outdoors where the Matang live. And the only other place that you can find these Pokemon in the wild are, of course, in the Crown Tundra. And there, Nosepass cannot be found. Like I say, this Pokedex entry had to have come from somewhere. Where was it that people witnessed Matang approaching Nosepass at speeds of 40 miles an hour? Perhaps there were Nosepass in the Crown Tundra, but now they're nothing but pebbles. It's amazing that the Draconids put so many things in place to protect the world from the Regis, hiding them in temples all across the Pokemon world behind HM walls and leaving Nosepass behind to protect people. But Nosepass is gone here in the Gala region, which means the Reggie temples are unprotected, and they might be about to wake up. So high, Pokemon Masters. Pokemon Masters, Berkey Batovi here. Recently, I've been playing a lot of Super Smash Brothers for 3DS. Playing as Mewtwo, no doubt. Well, hello there, class. I haven't seen you in a while. Where have you been? Well, I've been off watching Avengers. Age of Ultra. Wait! Don't spoil it for me. I haven't seen it yet. Although I'm very excited, the trailer seems to show Tony Stark creating an entirely new entity called Ultron who threatens to destroy the world. Well, doesn't that sound like a familiar Smash Bros. character? Well, yeah, it does! Mewtwo is a Pokemon created by Team Rocket scientists in their attempt to clone Mew, the most powerful Pokemon. They go to some rather radical measures in DNA splicing, and eventually they succeed. Sadly, after finishing the creation of Mewtwo, it goes on a bit of a rampage, destroying the laboratory it was created in and killing all of the scientists. Eventually, it goes on a quest of world domination, trying to kill all of the humans. Well, I have an idea that Mewtwo isn't all that different from humans after all. In fact, I believe Mewtwo is part human. One of the giant distinctions between humans and animals is humans' ability to recognize and contemplate their own existence. In the Pokemon world, this behavior isn't typically exhibited by Pokemon, except for one, Mewtwo. We are first introduced to Mewtwo in the Japan-only short, The Birth of Mewtwo. We come to understand that Mewtwo shares brainwave patterns with a girl called Ai, who is also being cloned. Despite being separate entities, Mewtwo and Ai communicate and share memories with each other telepathically, and Ai even makes remarks like, you and I are the same, and you could be human too. Sadly, her clone and the clones of many other Pokemon do not survive the process. However, Mewtwo does, as it is being cloned from the strongest Pokemon, Mew. So here's something interesting. I looks like a little girl, and all of the Pokemon being cloned look almost identical to their original forms. However, Mewtwo doesn't look anything like Mew at all, as if something's been added. Mew is the new species Pokemon. It looks a little bit like a cat or an embryo. However, Mewtwo only shares a few of these traits. Instead, standing at over human height at six foot, and is able to know human speech, unlike its counterpart. In his first appearance, Mewtwo travels around the mind of this little girl, I. Together, they visit various areas of her consciousness telepathically. This could imply where he gets his psychic powers if they share DNA. In fact, the short goes outright as far as to say that there's a data transfer between her mind and his. Mewtwo is one half ancient power cat and one half little girl. Later on, there is another short film called Mewtwo Returns, which focuses on his existential crisis. He is living in Recluse with other clone Pokemon. However, aware of his origins, the movie centers around the question, am I a real Pokemon? What if instead it's not about him being a clone, but more alluding to the fact that he's more of a person than a Pokemon? In this movie, he's caring for Pokemon, similar to how a trainer would theirs, and in the first movie, he even creates Pokeballs. He's just that smart, but there is so much more. In the Pokemon Adventures manga, Mewtwo is confirmed to be part human. He is made from the cells of Mew and Blaine's arm. Now, him and Blaine have a sort of symbiotic relationship. 
One of them can't be too far away from the other, and they can communicate actions, thoughts, even pain telepathically. Now, this connection is severed when Blaine's arm is healed. Now, this to me symbolizes the birth of a child. The child relies on the mother until its birth once it becomes its own being. Speaking of birth, in other canons, Mew is said to have given birth to Mewtwo. This is according to notes in the Cinnabar Island mansion, which is typically very different to how Pokemon reproduce, normally laying eggs. However, humans can give birth, and it's possible that by experimenting on Mew and implementing it with human cells, they could give it the correct one to allow it to give birth and any failed projects may very well have become the blob Pokemon Ditto. Ditto has lots of connections with Mew, it has the same colorations, they can both learn transform. It's found in the Cinnabar Mansion where you find the notes about Ditto in Cerulean Cave where you battle Mewtwo. And it's also worth noting that Ditto is the Pokemon based around changing cell structure and breeding. In the first movie, Mewtwo refers to itself as both the strongest Pokemon and the strongest Pokemon trainer, implying a human connection. But that's not the only Mewtwo in the anime. Ah, of course, another Mewtwo shows up in the Genesect movie. This Mewtwo is able to Mega Evolve into Mega Mewtwo Y. However, it was before Mega Stones were announced, so it doesn't use one. But what if that means something deeper? Mega Evolution normally requires a strong bond between a Pokemon and its human trainer. This Mewtwo, unlike the Mewtwo from the first movie, is very content with its own existence. It's worked out the meanings of life. You could suggest it has a strong bond with its own inner being. So, if it was part human, that would make perfect sense as to how it can mega evolve at will. It's the human trainer and the Pokemon perfectly, literally, bonded. Wow, so Mewtwo is a Pokemon-human hybrid, and that is confirmed in more or less every single canon. It's a shame that all these creatures of immense power always turn on their creators. Am I right, Ultron? Hey, no, shoot, get out of here! Spoilers! Bad Ultron! Well, we're just gonna fly away now, probably play some Smash Bros, but make sure you check out Klaus's channel. He made all of the music for this video and lots of Pokemon music, and if you're a video maker too, you can use it, provided you credit him, of course. I could not have made this video without his support. Well, see you soon. Mega Mewtwo X or Mega Mewtwo Well, hello there, Pokemon Masters. I'm glad you could make it to our afternoon tea party. Glad to see you've got your invitation. Tell me, how do you like your tea? With sugar or bitter? Sorry, how rude of me. I haven't introduced you to our other guests. Uh, don't, don't stare, of course. It's awfully rude. We're throwing this whole thing for Binette. She's been feeling a little bit sad and abandoned lately. You see, Binette is the marionette Pokemon. A marionette is a puppet operated by strings, but in this case, I think the strings are maybe hypothetical. You see, according to Binette's Pokedex entries, an abandoned plush doll became this Pokemon. They are said to live in garbage dumps and wander about in search of the children that threw them away. It is frightfully sad, isn't it? Though despite being the marionette Pokemon, there are no strings controlling Binette. No, no. Arbanet instead is more of a cursed energy that possesses the abandoned doll. You know, I had a theory once about Burnett and its relationship to some ghostly sightings in the hallways of the Hoenn Elite Four. These ghosts are sighted in the room of the Elite Four member Phoebe. She uses two Burnettes, and there appears, based on the various camera angles throughout the room, to be two ghost girls in the room. Look, you can see one just there. Two Burnettes and two trapped souls. I'd say those young scallywags got what was coming to them. You know, I do love it when a good Pokemon theory holds up after all these years. And tell me, have you met our other guest, uh, Mimikyu? Oh, Mimikyu didn't used to get invited to tea parties very often. She's quite jealous of Pikachu. In fact, that's why we sit them apart. So, when it comes to Mimikyu, apparently 20 years ago, Pikachu hit the big time, a massive star. This made Mimikyu envious. Apparently, Pikachu got famous because that trainer from Kanto, Red, beat the Elite Four, defeated Team Rocket, all with Pikachu by his side, and that made Pikachu famous. Wait, w w was it Red? Or maybe it was Chase from Let's Go? Or Ash Ketchum? Oh, all of these names, I don't keep track of the drama. But anyway, what happened is Mimikyu ended up being very envious, and so it's possessed a bit of cloth to look like Pikachu in the hopes that it might be as cute. And if you still don't think the Mimikyu's adorable... Then it'll eat your soul! <clears throat> Sorry. Cake? You know, there have been many theories about Mimikyu. 
the idea that it's a jealous Clefairy spirit that's annoyed at Pikachu for taking its spot as the mascot of the series, or the same again for Porygon for getting it kicked out of the anime. Despite the mystery, it's honestly seemed rude to ask. Tell me, have you met our next guest? No, 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 not Stuffle. That's a Pokemon doll. Can't you tell the difference? Our next guest is one that's come from right here in the Gala region. T? Oh, Teageist is a new Pokemon appearing in the Gala region, and it's not the teapot that's possessed, but more so just the tea. It's infused with black tea, my favourite, and according to the Pokemon website, it makes the tea quite delicious. Possession has always been a key part of the Pokemon world. Pokemon like Rotom uh, take control of all sorts of appliances. As we've already mentioned, there's Mimikyu and its cloth, or Bonnet and the doll. And possession of objects in the real world is usually done by Poltergeists. And Poltergeists are responsible for the taking control of and levitation of objects. One such reported Poltergeist was for a doll named Harold. Harold was bought in Webster, Florida for just $20 at a flea market. The buyer was warned about Harold when it was bought. Warned about how when Harold was first obtained 60 years ago, people would hear singing, crying, and laughing from Harold's room. Harold certainly seemed to have a lot to say. The original owner who bought Harold for his son tragically lost his son a few years later. He decided Harold was a bad omen and decided to try and burn the doll, but it just wouldn't seem to burn away. Now I'm sure Harold didn't mean badly, I mean he's just one of many such dolls across the planet. Then again, maybe you don't like these horror stories, maybe you prefer your kids' films, like Toy Story. In the Pixar film Toy Story, the toys in Andy's room come alive whenever he leaves. The idea of an object having personality is called animism. The idea that animals, plants, rocks, and even objects have a spiritual essence about them. This idea dates back to ancient religions, including Shinto, and in fact it's so prevailing in Japanese culture that it's made its way into their video games, including Pokemon. Now you might be thinking, just because it's in a few horror movies doesn't mean that my cuddly friends are really here in the room with me. But think about this, Pokemon Masters. If all Pokemon are based off of real animals and real objects, and there's enough documented cases across the world that Pokemon are based off them, then what's not to say that the plushes and toys in your room aren't watching this video with you right now? I'm afraid you'll have to leave. It's time for our afternoon nap. Sleep well, Pokemon Masters. Hello, la, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Batovi here, and welcome to Mount Lana Killer, the only snow peak in the whole of the Alola region. I'm here doing some very serious research on the Pokemon that live here. For example, Vulpix, the Alolan form, which is a variant of the form that you find in Kanto that's a fire breather. I love Alolan Vulpix so much that I actually have one on my Alolan festivities jumper, available while stocks last. I love Vulpix, and I also love its evolution, Ninetales, and the backstory behind it, because, according to the Pokedex, Ninetales was created thousands of years ago when nine wizards combined their powers to become one Pokemon. It's like magic. And that leads me to today's question. Does magic exist in Pokemon? Now, obviously, by their very nature, Pokemon are pretty magical creatures, and the word magic is defined as something being supernatural, out of this world, and yeah, Pokemon possess incredible abilities. There are some Pokemon that can breathe fire, others can shoot lightning bolts, and others can fly. Some Pokemon can even bend time and space at their will, so what exactly is supernatural in the Pokemon world? Well, what about Ninetales? Wizards aren't highly documented to exist in the Pokemon world, and the idea of people turning into Pokemon is stranger still. A man has awoken to find himself turned into a Kadabra one day, or died and become a Gengar, according to the Pokedex. And even in the TV show in the episode Hocus Pokemon, Ash briefly gets turned into a Pikachu. But we know that there are psychic and ghost type Pokemon and they are pretty mysterious. And there's even psychic type Pokemon trainers who appear to have powers. Possibly these things could explain those kind of events. So clearly people transforming into Pokemon isn't the strangest thing in the Pokemon world. And heck, transformation is even an ability possessed by Pokemon like Ditto. Ah, oh, that's better. Even looks good as a t-shirt too, right? Anyway, why don't we try looking at a different kind of magic in the Pokemon world? Namely, 
alchemy. Alchemy is a mystic science, a kind of precursor to modern day chemistry. Scientists and mystics alike would once try to purify metals using mystical or divine powers to obtain godlike objects such as a philosopher's stone, a stone that is said to help you live forever. And if you have been typing Pokemon into YouTube this year, there's a good chance you've already seen one of Loxton's many videos about this exact topic. There are so many references to alchemy in Pokemon. However, again, Pokemon fails to be supernatural here because alchemy relies on the powers of deities and gods and mystical creatures, which in the Pokemon world translates to legendary Pokemon, which while yes, they are rare and hard to obtain, they are still part of the Pokemon lore. They are natural beings, not supernatural. In fact, while researching Pokemon lore and fandom, I found it very difficult to find anything that could really be considered magical for the Pokemon world. But I did find one thing, a character actually in the most obscure part of the Pokemon TV show, and that character is Santa Claus. Santa Claus is a character who appears in just a few episodes of the Pokemon TV show, but in this small part of the Pokemon canon is a nod to something just a little more magical. For example, Santa Claus is said to have the ability to visit all homes across the world almost simultaneously, and over the course of one night deliver a present to everyone. Now, I don't know about you, but I've never seen Santa Claus have an Abra that knows teleport or a Dialga that can stop time. No, the only real Pokemon I've seen Santa Claus use in the show is a Stantler. Oh no, not again. His Stantler is special though, with the ability to fly his sleigh. And last time I checked, Stantler can't learn fly. Now, whether or not this is magic in the Pokemon world, or whether it's just an illusion being conjured up by Pokemon, nobody really knows. But one thing is for sure, and that is that the Pokemon world is a very magical place. Happy holidays, Pokemon Masters. Our world is inhabited by strange creatures known as Pokemon. Sorry I'm late, Professor. Well, well, well. If it isn't red. Late as usual. A Pokemon trainer is never late. You will get the last choice of Pokemon. Will this be my partner? Together you shall face perils beyond compare. And in the end, you will win together. Charmander, I choose you! You right? What? Oh. <clears throat> Charmander. One boy's dream is about to become a reality. Charmander, the fire is a Pokemon. A flame that burns at the tip of its tail is an indication of its emotions. What? You want to drag? But will he be up for the challenge against the future city gym leader? This is it, Charmander. This is our chance to prove the blue into everyone else that we can be the very best. Sure, kid. Whatever. Nice to meet you. The name's Brock. Ooh. Onyx, it's time to finish this once and for all. Well, looks like the end of the line. No, you can still do this, Charmander! It's evolving! <gasps> what? Oh, about freaking time. Okay, well, can we get on and shoot this thing? Why do people do that? Every time, it's loud. It's an audio thing, dude. It's loud. Okay. Hey, Pokemon Mars. Really? Hey, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Patobi here, and welcome to the new Vermillion Mega Mart Mega Merch Mega Mart store. My name is Bird. What? Dude. Due to pl plummeting ad revenue and constant demonetization hits, I've had to start my new job and my second enterprise here on the Vermilion City Docks, selling some of the best Pokemon items. Just like we have Pokeballs. These things are literally everywhere. Do you think? Do you think they know that I just bought these from the from the Celadon Mega Mart? 
They won't. No, they won't. No, they won't. No, they won't. They won't. Usually these are 300 polka dollars a piece, but if you come down to the Vermilion City Mega Mart, oh, there's a Pikachu in here. Usually Pokeballs are 300 polka dollars a piece, but if you come down today, you can get five for 1500. That's massive savings. It's not a saving. <laughs> Make sure you've got enough Pokeballs to catch your Pokemans. Also, 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 we have, we sell. What are we sinking for? What are we sinking for, Klaus? Have you seen the rare evolutionary stones? We got a Thunderstone, a Firestone, and a Waterstone. So you can evolve your evolution into whatever you like. Even Leafeon? What the heck is a Leafeon? And look, we even sell the latest in Pokemon dolls. Oh my God, it's alive. It's alive, kill it, burn it, fight, set it on fire. You think that had rabies? We're good, right? We're good. Come on down to the Vermilion City Megadox today and you can get yourself a totally real Pokemon. Come on down to the Viridian City Megadox Viridian. today. Sorry, you oh, sorry. You said Viridian, it's Vermilion. I know what I, I said, Vermilion. Viridian was the forest, it wasn't Vermilion. I know what I said. Klaus. Come on down to the Vermilion City Mega Merc Merch Mega Docks today and you can get yourself a totally real Togebi egg. It only appears to those with a pure heart and a big wallet. <laughs> if you want to get your stuff together and like we could just finish this thing, please, please, please. I really need this. There's workers rights, you know. I need this. Now it's time for our special product, the new tree of Ultima Evolution, featuring all 151 Pokemon. There's 800, dude. There's how many? This poster depicts how every single life form would evolve if they were all related to each other, and is available with the link at the top of the description. And if you buy it now, it'll cost probably the same as I'm gonna make it cost tomorrow. If anything, I'm probably gonna up the price. Don't worry, I'm not actually gonna up the price. And if you wanna know why I've placed all of these creatures, where I've placed them, then you can check out the Ultima Evolution episodes. New Ultima Evolution series. New episodes every other week. The best Pokemon series on the internet. Are you paying me for this? Um, order now while stocks last. And if they don't last, then we'll replenish them because I really need the money. Oh, oh no, wait, actually the posters are selling really well. We have to make this. You guys are all fired. Class, I hate you, buddy. These products have been endorsed by Gary Oak. Smell you later, losers. Hey, Pokemon Masters. So I've spent my morning summiting the great sand dunes in uh, Colorado. I've never summited anything before in my life. You know, I'm used to sitting at home playing Pokemon on my DS. And, you know, over here I'm seeing sand on the mountain peaks. Over there I'm seeing snow. And the way that nature is coming together, not to sound too much like a hippie, is just like in a Pokemon game. You've got the Hoenn region. You've got these vast oceans and blistering deserts and rainforests next to each other. And, you know, I'm on my way up here and I'm seeing all these trails in the sand. I think a snake's patting its belly curving through the sand. And, and and bird feet, there's bird claws, incredibly long claws in the dirt here, in the, in the sand, and it's amazing to me, seeing all of this life, how it survived up here, how, you know, away from everything. I mean, there's nothing around us for, for miles, and to just to see how stuff's come together. And it makes me think of the creatures in the Pokemon world and how really they're just based off of stuff in nature. I mean, you think of you think of Trapinch, for example, the ant lion Pokemon. It's based off of the ant lion, a creature that sits in the sand with its jaw wide open, like the the pit from Star Wars: Return of the Jedi, where the ants will crawl along the sand. And you know what happens? Is the vibrations of the sand <laughs> mean that the Trapinch, the ant lion, knows when to open its jaw? Heck, Trapinch's evolution in its Pokedex talks about how it, it, it fly gone creates sandstorms, incredible sandstorms, and it cooperatively hunts with Crocodile, who is a totally different predator. And Crocodile swims in the sand and they share the bounty. It hides in the sandstorm that Flygon has created. Cooperative hunting, it happens in nature, it's rare. But it happens, and it's absolutely astounding to see how these things are just reflections of real life. I mean, heck, in the in the deserts of Unova, there is a ruin in which you can find Volcarona, a Pokemon that replaced the sun in ancient times. When Necrozma, possibly, stole Solgaleo's fire and made the sky turn black, there was eight minutes. That's how long it takes for the light to get from there to here to cast our shadows out onto the desert. Perhaps Volcarona is the Pokemon that saved the Pokemon world back then, but it in itself is just just the sun, it is the sun personified into the games. I think I'm just walking up here and I'm not making this video because it's got anything to do with the latest Pokemon games. It's not for views, it's not, you know, we don't have the best audio equipment out here, we don't have the best lighting situation going on. I'm filming this 
because it would be a crime not to remind you that you live in the Pokemon world. But the Pokemon world is the world that we're in. I know it sounds hippie and magnificent, but it's true. Go out from time to time. Get away from the DS. So high, Pokemon Masters. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Berkey for Toby here. And I'm currently in the Redwoods in California. Uh, yesterday, I was at Yosemite, and there I saw a tree that was 1,800 years old. I actually took a piece of the bark, because, you know, I want a piece of that. I want to live for 1,800 years. Imagine all the things you could see. Some of the sequoias in this forest live to 2,000. I mean, there's very few Pokemon that live that long. Ninetales supposedly lives for a long, long time because of the stuff to do with myth and legend. But this isn't myth and legend. This is nature. This is evolution produced, just like you and me. I mean, there's water that can live for several hundred years, like turtles can in our world, but even turtles and tortoises, you know, they don't live thousands of years, and we don't live that long. And you think, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to live that long? Wouldn't you want to see 2,000 years of the human race, what we could achieve, what we could do, what we could create? Where would technology go? But there's a certain, I think, somberness to the serenity of the life of a tree. You wouldn't want to live in these shoes or in these roots, because they're still... You know, they endure lightning and fire and snow and rain, and they are resilient. I mean, not all of the saplings make it to be this big, but um, they're still stood in one place, only seeing one part of the earth. We get to go on great adventures, uh, collect Pokemon, for example, and there you can see some of the trees come to life in the form of Pokemon. You can see many of the insects that you would see in a forest. I think the forest is the best place where you can see it. Pitcher plants and, and Venus flytraps, or, or, or even just general big plant Pokemon or insects. You can see them and how they've been inspired by nature, even the technology they're played on. The DS's, the, the stuff you're watching on this on, the, the camera that we're filming this on, all that technology is part of nature because it is produced from a human brain that was produced from nature. Yes, we share the same evolutionary uh, ancestry, I suppose, somewhere along the lines. We're all just made of the same star stuff, but ultimately, I think we lucked out because no, we don't get to live for thousands of years, but we get to live. We get to go on great adventures, we get to collect Pokemon, and we get to uh, create. And I think that's, I think that's cooler than being a tree. Yeah. So high Pokemon Masters. Hey! Pokemon Masters, Pokeeper Toby here. I am currently in Bombay Beach, Salt on Sea, California, and this is truly the most disturbing place I have ever been. And I'm making this video just like the others because it would be a crime not to share this place with you. But I warn you, do not come here. I've dealt with creepy locations before, Lavender Town, um, the, the uh, yeah, ruins of Alf, and the creepy noise that plays there. And I've talked about ghost Pokemon in my Pokemon theories. For ghost Pokemon to be here, that would be too obvious. This place is terrifying. It is scary. No. No, scary is the wrong word, Pokemon Masters. I've seen scary things in the world of Pokemon. Ghost Pokemon, for example, no. Scary is the monster under your bed. Scary is knowing that the end is coming. Creepy. That's this place. You know, there are people that live in Lavender Town. There's also people that live here. While preparing for this video, me and Mike, who's behind the camera right now, stumbled across someone inside one of these bunkers. This place is someone's home. It's creepy. A home that doesn't look like a home. A Pikachu that's sad for some reason. A bit of music in a video game that could potentially kill them. That is creepy. Creepy is a line of teddy bears waiting for the apocalypse to come. Teddy bears are supposed to be safe and comfortable. Much like how Pokemon, it's just a kid's game. And I think that's why the horror really works there, because when you see something like Lavender Town Syndrome, or theories about ghost girls, or the sound in the ruins of Alf, it doesn't quite fit. It's ambiguous. And that's what makes it truly disturbing. Stay, Stay safe out there, Pokemon Masters. So. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Vidobi here. And I am currently in the Lava Butte Syndicone in Oregon. This is not a place I was expecting to be today. And as I walk around here, I'm seeing the ground. It's made of a rock unlike any other I've ever seen. It feels different, it sounds different underneath my feet. It's dried lava. 
Millions of years ago, the volcano here erupted, spewing lava into the sky, and as it rained down like hellfire, it landed and settled here like hot bits of Macargo, and eventually it dried out. It's like the volcanoes in the Pokemon world, like Mount Chimney or Cinnabar Island. You can see how the destruction would have been caused right there. And you know, I'm standing here and it's hard not to think about legendary Pokemon like Entei, a Pokemon who every time it roars, a volcano erupts. It's hard not to think about uh, Heatran, the Pokemon that is a living magma. I suppose Heatran would be made of this stuff. It's hard not to think about Groudon, of course, a sun deity itself. It brings out the sun and causes great droughts. It's dry here. But then there's also plant life, and that makes you think of Shaman, a Pokemon that shows that nature prevails. Here you really see the earth and you can think about Regigigas, the mover of continents, or so many other legendary Pokemon. And I mean, I've talked in this series before about how the animals of the Pokemon, of the real world, are like Pokemon. I've talked about how the, you know, the sun is personified into Volcarona, or how the mythological creatures of our world have become Pokemon. And there's something that's not hard to see here is right from the volcano peak up there to the snow peaks behind me, the forest that's right there and the earth underneath my feet, the magma that has dried up from millions of years ago where it was this destructive force. The earth is legendary. It has inspired so many legendary Pokemon because that's what it is. Legendary. So high Pokemon masters. Hey, Pokemon Master, Spooky Potobi here, and I am at the Hawalock Castle in Galar. Did you know this place didn't always used to be a Pokemon battle arena, instead it was a castle, home to the royalty of the region. I was getting ready for the latest game when suddenly the skies turned dark, and I wondered if we were about to experience once again the worst day in Galar's history, the darkest day. And if so, it could be because under there, there is a Pokemon known as Eternatus. Number 890, Eternatus is the gigantic Pokemon, named because it is literally, well, not just gigantic itself, but responsible for gigantism all across the Galar region. It exudes an energy that spreads out into underground dens, beckoning in Pokemon. Pokemon who can even transform into the many Gigantamax forms. These areas are also known as power spots, and the Galar League chairman, Chairman Rose, built gym stadiums here to fund his new Galar Empire, effectively becoming the face of the region. His studies into Eternatus started in the Galar Mines, where he would have learned about Eternatus from studying wishing stars, part of the sleeping Eternatus' body that fell down from the sky across Galar. It is between the clouds where Eternatus has been sleeping for thousands of years. According to the Pokedex, it was inside a meteorite that fell 20,000 years ago. This date has only ever been recorded in the Pokedex once before, as the date of the creation of a Pokemon called Claydol, a sort of automaton sentry guardian that guards sacred sites across the Pokemon world. Its psychic type may be specifically designed to be strong against Eternatus' poison type. Its likeness can even be seen across the Galar region, but I digress. As I mentioned, Eternatus was sleeping above the skies of Galar, but when it awakens it rampages and exudes enough energy to darken the skies of Galar and initiate an event known as the Darkest Day. The namesake for this day came from 3000 years ago, where Eternatus' energy caused Pokemon everywhere across Galar to Gigantamax and Rampage. Toxtricity Gigantamaxed for the first time above Turfield, contaminating the earth with toxic sweat. There, the events had been recorded. In other areas, Pokemon didn't just Gigantamax, but Dynamaxed in general. A giant Dugdrio appears in Stowon side, ravaging the earth. And above it all, Eternatus threatened the region with destruction. Luckily, the history for Galar was recorded, and we know what happened next. It is in rooms like this where the history of the Pokemon world is stored, and that's wonderful. Preservation is a brilliant thing. But what happens when the history is wrong? Who decides what remains here for the future to see? According to the histories of Galar, as found in the Dragon Vaults, two heroes appeared with the power of the Fairy Sword and the Fighting Master's Shield. They were able to repel Eternatus, pushing it back to sleep and dealing with the Darkest Day. Together, they established the castle of Hamelok and became the king heroes of the region. This history can only be seen by a few privileged eyes in the Hamelok Dragon Vault. And while it's not the full picture, it is the closest thing to the truth that the public knows. 
In other areas of Galar, though, the truth has been distorted. In the more modern town of Motorstoke, a statue of a single hero wielding both a sword and shield can be found, as if to distract from the true nature of history. There is another statue more in line with the true history of Galar, hidden in Stoan's side behind a mural depicting the truth of Zacian and Zamazenta, the sword and shield that aided the heroes. In Sir Chester 2, a banner can be seen revealing the location of these Pokemon's shrine in the slumbering Weald. And the Weald itself is a sacred place, an odd area of forests separating the main region of Galar with the land of the Crown Tundra below it. It is here a Pokemon known as Calyrex was said to have once moved a large forest and all the Pokemon living there to a new location overnight. And in its Gigantamax form, legend says that by using its power to see all events from past to future, this Pokemon saved the creatures of a forest from a meteorite strike. Could this forest be the Slumbering Weld, a location moved up from the Crown Tundra to protect it from a meteorite that was in fact the first crash landing of Eternatus 20,000 years ago? A place where part of its body, a giant wishing star, is said to reside still today, an area researched by Chairman Rose. But then why isn't Calyrex mentioned in the Dragon Vaults or any of the hidden history statues? A clue though might be found in Zacian's Pokedex entry, which describes it as the Fairy King's sword, and Zamazenta describes it as the Fighting Master's shield. This could also be a reference to the other DLC Pokemon Kubfu, who is the Fighting Master, and of course, Calyrex is the Fairy King. Is it possible that this duo of a king and a fighter are somehow tied to the hero kings of the ancient past of Galar? It would be peculiar for sure, but these kinds of patterns repeat all across the Pokemon world. In the Kalos region, it's said that two brother kings went to war. In the Unova region, two twin hero kings and two twin heroes again in the Galar region. This surely can't be a coincidence. A pair is one thing, but three of the same, all with dates stretching back to around the same time. Something's up here. In Unova, we learn of the twin heroes of truth and ideals. Their ties to royalty are also apparent in both the Zekrom and Reshiram movies, as well as the crown being an actual theme in the Unova games. The very opening cutscene shows us the coronation of N wearing what looks to be the Relic Crown, an item that looks like the head of Zacian. The Relic Crown and other ancient items can be found in the Abyssal Ruins, a castle sunken into the sea in eastern Unova. And in western Unova, there is another castle that can be found sunken into the sands. It's possibly from here that Team Plasma found this second crown. So we have two kings, two castles, two heroes. Is this the same from Galar? When we look to the date of the relic item of 2,500 years ago and the darkest day being 3,000 years ago, it's not too far away for there to not be a connection. As well, when we look to real world inspirations, Unova is based off of New York and Galar, England. It seems likely that at one time the monarchy of the Galar region moved over to the Unova region before it fell, tearing itself apart, making way for modern day Unova. But the story of twin hero kings doesn't stop there. In Kalos, a war raged 3,000 years ago between two brothers who were also kings. AZ, the king of Kalos at that time, warred against his own brother, the ancestor of Lysander. After many lives were lost, the brother of AZ saw the error of his ways and buried the ultimate weapon, the device used to end the war on a very dark day. 3,000 years ago, the ultimate weapon fired, taking with it the life force of Pokemon. That force, that infinity energy, has been at the core of the Pokemon series over many generations now. It is believed that this energy that allows Pokemon to mega evolve is just one expression of infinity energy. In Alola, we see that very energy seep through ultra wormholes and cause Pokemon to transform to get bigger and become totem Pokemon. In Galar, Gigantamax Pokemon. And even in the old days of Hisui, that energy came from the sky out of the space-time distortion and caused Pokemon to become frenzied and noble Pokemon, bigger versions of their regular forms. Across the last few generations of Pokemon and the entire history of the Pokemon world, it's hard to know how many of these events are connected or the same. However, Hisui's connections don't stop there, as there is one more important part to this mystery. For all the questions that Generation 8 of Pokemon throws at us, there is one big one, which is, what's the deal with all of the horses? Seriously, Glastria and Spectria, Dialga and Palkia in their origin forms, there are so many equine-like creatures, and they all tie back to Arceus, the god of the Pokemon world. Heck, we even got a shiny ponus of this generation for free. But why? What's the deal with the ancient past of the Pokemon world and horses? 
Well, it could be that this generation of Pokemon is preparing us for something coming in Generation 9. A new darkest day, an ultimate end to Pokemon, something apocalyptic. In Western mythology, there is a popular tale that suggests that the end will be heralded by four horsemen of the apocalypse. Pokemon is a lot less dark than that, but it does love its symbolism, and across this recent generation of Pokemon, four horses have come, signifying perhaps the end of time time and space, and also death in the coldness of Glastria and the shadowy spectral form of Spectre. And this generation of Pokemon goes full circle with Dialga and Palkia trying to take on a horse-like form that allows it to imitate and emulate God. Eternatus itself also has ties to Arceus in its Eternamax form, taking the shape of a giant's hand. Arceus is said to have shaped the world with its 1,000 arms, so could it be that Eternatus is a corrupted, poisoned hand of God now turning against its own creation? Its skeletal form signifying the death of God itself. It seems to me that all does not look good for the Pokemon world going forward. If Eternatus really is back, Pokemon Masters, then we may be doomed without a new hero to come and save the day. I hope that could be you. So hi, Pokemon Masters. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Blanky Patobi here. I'm just channeling my inner Tangler, my inner grass type. I wasn't expecting to see you. You must have got the same invite I did, the Oaks Letter. An event item first introduced in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, which, once you've beaten the Elite Four, will take you across a special path on Route 224, the Seabreak Path, where you'll find your way to the Flower Paradise and the mythical Pokemon, Shaman. Shaman is one of the mythical Pokemon of the Sinnoh region. Hopefully we'll get to encounter it in Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. And it's a small grass hedgehog. It's the Gratitude Pokemon, and when you give it the Cressidia flower, it will transform into its sky form, which it's hotly debated as to whether this is a dog or a reindeer. Look, clearly. It's a reindeer. It's said that Shaman can dissolve toxins in the air to instantly transform ruined land into a lush field of flowers. It's known that Shaman helped create the flourishing of Falroma Town. In fact, the Seabreak path that leads you to Shaman shares the exact same music as Falroma Town. The two are connected. Additionally, there's the NPC who lives in Falroma who gives you the Gracidia flower. This mythical Pokemon, like many others, wasn't released in the base game of Diamond and Pearl, but instead was only unlockable by an event. You'd obtain an event item called the Oaks Letter, which would take you to Route 224, accessible only in the post-game of Diamond and Pearl, and hopefully it works the exact same way in Brilliant Diamond Shining Pearl. There you team up with the character of Marley, who travels around with you. She uses her Arcanine and is interested in meeting Shaman. Eventually you find your way to Professor Oak, and the flat stone that sits at the end of the route. But you know, Pokemon Masters, ever since I first played that event, Professor Oak kind of confused me a bit, because he mentions that something like the White Stone has been found in the Kanto region, but we've visited the Kanto region twice since then, in Heart Gold, Soul Silver, and Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee, and as far as I can tell, there's nothing referencing Shaman in the Kanto region at all. I suppose we better start looking for Gracidia flowers. As I've mentioned, the Gracidia flower is a special key item that allows Shaman to transform between its two forms. It's also interesting to note that while in Diamond and Pearl, you can only visit Route 224 after beating the Elite Four, in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, you get given a flower bouquet with a flower that looks a lot like Shaman's Gracidia flower sitting in it after you beat the Elite Four. Speaking of Let's Go Eevee in the animated series, Eevee has a couple of little connections to the Gracidia flower. They're only small and a little bit tangential, but it's interesting to note them. So Serena's Eevee wears a flower crown that seems to have little Gracidia flowers on it. Chloe and her Eevee hang out together, and Chloe's design has a little pink flower that sits on the back of her hair. Whether that's a Gracidia flower, again, it's very tangential. But because of this connection with Eevee and flowers, there's actually a flower crown form of Eevee that appears in Pokemon Go. And again, just look at the flowers on its head. I do like this idea, though, that there might be some connection between Eevee and Shaman, because Eevee in Pokemon Red, Blue, and Yellow is found in the Game Freak building in Celadon. City, a city with a grass type gym leader. It's a city with a floral identity, much like Falroma Town. The rainbow badge is the prize you get for beating Erica, and that looks like a giant flower. But despite this connection to nature, it is also one of the biggest industrialized cities in Kanto, with both giant shopping malls and a game corner, and then there's of course the CD underground headquarters of Team Rocket. It's interesting to note though that when we look to Marley, the companion character for Route 224 in Sinnoh, we see that her ace is an Arcanine. And this is interesting because 
Growlithe doesn't appear in the Sinnoh region, unless you have a Kanto game, Fire Red, tucked into your DS. However, a possible place for a Arcanine trainer to have started their journey is Celadon City, as Growlithe can be found on the routes outside and the Firestone can be bought in the Pokemon art. Is it possible that Marley is another connection to Shaman and that she is from Celadon? I know, Pokemon Masters, it, it seems like I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here, but here's the thing, Marley coming from Celadon? It's a big city of the Pokemon world, and in fact, they pulled a move like this before. In Pokemon Gold and Silver, you learn nothing about this, but in Crystal version, we meet the character of Yusin, and it turns out, in that version only, he mentions that he's visiting his hometown, Celadon. And he's an interesting character. He's hunting down the legendary Pokemon Suicune, which seems to be unconnected to Shaman at first, until you remember that Suicune can purify water. This is a problem that Celadon is rife with. Perhaps the reason that Yusin is hunting it down is because in Generation 1, Celadon is home to all sorts of water Pokemon in its central lake. But by Generation 2, and the time of Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl, the lake is filled only with Grimer and Muck. In Generation 1, your chances of finding a Grimer or coughing was only 1%, but just a few years later, toxic Pokemon have overrun the city, and the water system has become fully polluted. <laughs> What do you think, Pokemon Masters? I made it for my home in Celadon. Really? I, I made it myself. We know Yusin lives in Celadon City, so if he's hunting down for Suicune, then that makes sense, because Suicune can purify water, which Celadon City needs. And if Marley happens to also be from Kanto and maybe from Celadon, then her hunting down Shaman would also make sense to help purify the toxins in the city's airspace. But that still doesn't answer the initial question with Professor Oak when he mentioned that something like this had appeared in the Kanto region. What is that something? And can it be found in Celadon City? Well, if you're anything like me, you'd jump straight into Celadon City and search around, but you wouldn't have much luck. Not with Pokemon Red, Blue, Yellow, Gold, Silver, Crystal, Fire Red, Leaf Green, Heart Gold, Soul Silver, Let's Go Pikachu, or Let's Go Eevee. You can search around Celadon, but finding that connection to the White Stone or anything like it would be very hard. However, if you happen to have an original Japanese copy of Pokemon Red or Green, you might find something of interest. Inside the Game Freak headquarters, you can find something to interact with, and the Japanese text translates as, it's a household Buddhist altar. This was removed from later versions of the game to avoid any controversy, however given its rounded shape it was changed to simply being a statue of a diglet. That dome and that flat shape below it, it's not the same as the white rock, but perhaps it's something like it. This as a Buddhist altar is much like the flat stone of Sinnoh, a place where a person would give gratitude for the things in their life, and Shaman is the gratitude Pokemon. It would make perfect sense to be a place where someone would want the gratitude Pokemon Shaman to appear. If the people of Celadon City need help to get rid of the toxins in the air and bring back the town's floral identity like in Falroma Town, then capturing a Shaman makes sense. But you're going to need someone who can get through Victory Road, which explains why the Flower Paradise is after Route 224, why they sent Marley, and why in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, they only give the Grisidia flower to champions. But sadly, we can't know, because in Fire Red and Leaf Green, the statue is gone. Instead, it's been replaced by a pretty picture of a Pokemon that looks like it's feeling good. It would be so nice to imagine that this is a picture of Shaman running around in a field. However, there's no confirmation, because then by the time of Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, even the picture is gone. Instead, there's just a little vase on the table with a small pink flower in it. Well, Pokemon Masters, if the people of Celadon City want a Shaman to appear, I guess all they need to do is say what they're grateful for. Like how I'm grateful for you watching this video. Thanks for the support. And of course, so high Pokemon Masters. Hello, Pokemon Masters, Blood Keeper Toby here, and welcome to the Lost Tower of Sinnoh. I know what you're thinking. Toby, are you a ghost now? And like, no, obvi obviously not. Look, give him that hit. This is just my good buddy Gallade. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to tell in the Sinnoh region. After all, Driftblim soars across the skies, taking children to who knows where. And at the Hallowed Tower, the odd keystone is filled with 108 angry spirits, who knows where they came from. And more so than in any other region, human ghosts plague the Sinnoh region, but why? Hold on to your hats, kids. It's not just Gallade who's gonna need a revive today.
Ah, yes, Pokemon Masters. So when I'm talking about hauntings in Sinnoh, I'm not just talking about ghost Pokemon. Sinnoh has more than its fill of human ghosts that appear across the region. In fact, it's more frequent than in any other region. We've seen a few human ghosts in Hoenn, for example, the little girl that lives in Phoebe's room. And we've also seen one in Kalos, the one that comes out of the elevator. Very creepy. But Sinnoh has more than any of these other regions, and in fact, even has impact in other regions. For in Unova, there is a young girl who has been haunted by a dark cry. She died in her sleep and is now stuck roaming the world of the living. Speaking of dark cry Pokemon Masters, while it's not exactly a ghost type Pokemon, in relation to its Sinnoh event, you will meet ghosts. If you find yourself in Canalive City with a members card, the event item, don't go to the northmost house. That is the Harbour Inn and home to someone who's been there for a very long time. This man in the Harbour Inn will literally tell you that he's had this reservation for a long time, and when you check the item description for the members card, it'll reference that the last date on there was marked as being 50 years ago. And I don't think the player characters of Diamond and Pearl are 50 years old. This character seems to take complete control of you, moving you over to the bed, where you then enter the nightmare world of Darkrai. You'll end up being able to battle and catch Darkrai, and after confronting the creature, you'll wake back up in the Harbour Inn, but the man will be gone. Given what we know of the ghost girl of Unova, who was trapped by Darkrai until you used the Lunar Wing to free her, it seems that this man was likely a ghost, trapped in the mortal realm for over 50 years by Darkrai's nightmarish powers. But now Darkrai is in your Pokeball, and you have freed him. And Darkrai is just the beginning. See, I've been to an old house like this before. You may remember my visit to the old chateau, and while I didn't see any ghosts myself, I've heard stories of an old man and a young girl seen wandering the hall through the windows in the woods. No special event needed for this one. These two can be seen patrolling the chateau and seem to be tied to the backstory of Rotom. This is something that I discussed in my video where I visited the old chateau and I'm likely to discuss again in the future because I think this might tie into the backstory of Cyrus of Team Galactic. Theories aside though, these two definitely did meet a horrible fate. There's an old notebook, part of which can be found in the old chateau and the other half of which can be found in the Team Galactic headquarters in Eterna City. There you learn of Rotom, the Pokemon of the old chateau discharging electricity beyond its usual power range. Is it possible that this was the shocking event that killed these two individuals, trapping them in the old chateau? The sudden and unexpectedness of their deaths, their ghostly bodies now floating through the halls, warning people not to come in. Don't come into the old chateau, and definitely don't go up to the old TV room where Rotom still lives. And it's not just in a turn of forest. Up in the frozen north of Sinnoh, ghost Pokemon have been seen blending in with the snow. This is because on Route 217, just below Snowpoint City, there is a house sitting as a beacon of safety within the snowstorm. However, when you enter, the lady inside the house will be shocked. It's rare for visitors to appear in these snowy, snowy conditions. She'll give you this spell tag, an item that boosts the power of ghost-type moves, and when you leave the house and then return in, she will be gone. Did you really encounter anyone? Or given the spell tag, did you encounter a ghost? Or perhaps what you encountered was the spirit of a woman in her final part before she transcended and became the Pokemon Frostlass, whose Pokedex entry reads, Legends in snowy regions say that a woman who was lost on an icy mountain was reborn as a Frostlass. That sounds like what just happened to me. Pokemon Masters, I know the question you want the answer to then is, why are there so many human ghosts trapped in the Sinnoh region, stuck between the realm of the living and the realm of the dead? Well, I've done a lot of research on the topic, and I think it might have something to do with one of the four big deities of the Sinnoh region. That's right, four big deities. I know Dialga and Palkia have lots of statues and songs to them, there's legends and stories of Arceus, but there is one other forgotten deity who lives on the reverse side of reality. One other whose presence can be felt all across the Sinnoh region. I'm talking, of course, about Giratina. 
Giratina is the renegade Pokemon and the guardian of the distortion world, a realm that exists on the other side of our dimension. Something I've theorized about before and that we've discussed on Hoops and Hip Hop's channel is the idea that the distortion world might also be the ghost dimension that's referenced occasionally in the animated series as well as in Pokedex entries like in Haunters that states that it's trying to come through from another dimension. Ghost Pokemon aren't actual ghosts. They're not dead people in the way that these people that I talk about in this video are. They're also not ghosts in the same way that in Lavender Town you can encounter, you know, actual ghosts. Instead, these are Pokemon and the ghost is simply a type, a type that we use to describe a specific type of life form. They are alive. Ghost just represents a certain kind of energy type, something on the spectrum of infinity energy. And they seem to come from an otherworldly dimension and that's really what ghost should mean, otherworldly. Sinnoh's own Duskenoir also references this. The antenna on its head captures radio waves from the world world of spirits that command it to take people there. This feared Pokemon is said to travel to worlds unknown and when we look to its pre-evolution Dusclops, we learn that its body is hollow and perhaps like a black hole, and black holes are thought to be gateways to other dimensions. So perhaps the distortion world is this, it is the world unknown, the world of spirits, the ghost world, the distortion world, the realm where Pokemon like Giratina really thrive. Giratina is after all the first ghost. And this makes sense because Giratina can be found in the Turnback Cave in the Sinnoh region and behind Giratina there's a pillar that reads, this is that where life sparkles. This is where life has faded. A place where the two worlds overlap. Perhaps this is why there are so many humans who are stuck between the worlds of the living and the dead. So many ghost Pokemon with references to other dimensions in the Sinnoh region. Perhaps this is why all of these sightings happen. Because the distortion world energy bleeds out from this place all across Sinnoh. And when that portal is open, some people get trapped between the two worlds. All I know is one thing is for sure. This region truly is haunted. So high Pokemon Masters. A huge thank you to the team over at Bath Exit for allowing me to film in their escape room. Use code TOBY20 for 20% off when you book today using the link at the top of the description. Thank you. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bucky Potobi here, and I am out in the sandy desert route of the Sinnoh region below Stark Mountain. I'm looking for a mythical Pokemon inside a cave of wonders. If you find its Pokeball, they say if you shake it three times, it will appear. What mythical am I talking about? Surely I must be talking about Shaman or Darkrai or Arceus. No. I'm talking about the mythical Pokemon, Hooper. I know, I know, you think Hooper's not of the Sinnoh region, it's not even connected, but personally, I think Pokemon like Arceus and Hooper are probably related. The theory is a bit long-winded, and you might have to jump through a few hoops to get to the conclusion. But let's explore. Well, Pokemon Masters, Hooper is the mischief Pokemon, and it's actually a mythical Pokemon of the Kalos region. Despite this, its counterparts, Deancey and Volcanion, are way more heavily tied to the Kalos region, with Deancey looking a lot like the Anastar City Sundial, and Volcanion having lore scattered across various NPCs that can be found throughout the region. Hooper feels a little bit out of place. And in truth, Hooper could be from anywhere across Pokemon space, because it has the ability to create portals that can tell teleport people and Pokemon across space and possibly through dimensions. <laughs> I found treasure, Pokemon Masters. You know they say that Hooper takes treasure from all across space and hoards it in its lair. What do we have? Uh, oh, not Hooper. <laughs> Still, it's not just trinkets that Hooper can transport. No, in fact, by warping dimensions, it's said to have even moved a whole palace at one time, stealing it with its rings. And in the Kalos region sits the Parfum Palace. We all know that the Kalos region is inspired by France, but the Parfum Palace is scarily similar to the Palace of Versailles. The Palace of Versailles was built by King Louis XIV, and there's actually an image of what would seem to be King Louis on the wall. However, when you interact with it, it's supposed to be AZ, but come on, they look nothing alike. And Hooper is extraordinarily powerful. In Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, these portals can access legendary Pokemon from across the Pokemon world. This 
this is the same game where we learn about interdimensional travel and how portals called link cables can fire meteorites from one version of Hoenn to another. Perhaps the way that Devon and the space station in Sutopolis have this technology is by studying the portals of Hooper that are all around the region. Which means that these are not just regular portals that teleport things around space, but they actually warp the dimensions. Perhaps the Parfum Palace actually is the Palace of Versailles from our world, and if you can warp dimensions, then you can also warp the dimension of time. This is a Pokemon that has the ability to manipulate. In fact, that's a little bit backed up by the title of its movie, Hooper and the Clash of Ages. Note the ages for the time connection. And there we see it summoning all sorts of legendary Pokemon. Zekrom and Reshiram, no problem. Bringing Primal Kyogre and Primal Groudon again, I assume from the past, piece of cake. There is only one Pokemon that can stand in the way of Hooper and one human, a human priest, a worshipper of Arceus. Only this human with a power granted to him by Arceus can take Hooper's unbound strength and seal it away in the prison bottle. Of course, by the end of the movie, Hooper gets that power again, and the unbound Hooper form wreaks havoc, and the only Pokemon that can stop it is Arceus. Even Dialga and Palkia bend to Hooper's will. They get red eyes, and they look like they're being controlled as if by the red chain that we see in Generation 4. In my mind, Hooper is no ordinary mythical Pokemon like Diancie or Volcano, but rather its powers and abilities rival that of Arceus. When it comes to the manipulation of time and space, Hooper's powers are a lot like that of Dialga and Palkia, Arceus's main children. And actually, as a servant of Arceus, Hooper would be amazing, able to distribute legendary Pokemon across the Pokemon world. It would be very, very useful for Arceus to have control of a Pokemon like this as a sort of backup or an extra, a sort of demigod. We know that Hooper takes a lot of inspiration from Jin, but when we look to its traits in its unbound form, we see curved horns and a pointed tail, which might fit in more with the Eurocentric view of Satan in comparison to Arceus's role within the Pokemon world. But to prove a connection between these two Pokemon, well, that would require some doing. Luckily, I found a very interesting scroll, the Veilstone myth. This is the Veilstone myth that today you can find in the Canalive Library, and it reads as follows. A young man, callow and foolish in innocence, came to own a sword. With it, he smote Pokemon, which gave sustenance with carefree abandon. Those not taken as food, he discarded with no afterthought. The following year, no Pokemon appeared. Larders grew bare, and the young man, seeking the missing Pokemon, journeyed afar. Long did he search, and far and wide too, until one he did find. Asked he, why do you hide? To which the Pokemon replied, If you if bear, you bear your, sword your sword to bring, to bring harm, harm upon us, with claws, with claws and, fangs, and fangs, we will exact, exact a toll. From, from your kind, we will take our toll. Our toll. Done, done, it must be to guard ourselves. ourselves. And, for and for it, it I apologize. apologize. To the skies, the young man shouted in dismay, In having found this sword, I have lost so much. Gorged with power, I grew blind to Pokemon being alive. I will never fall savage again. This sword I denounce and forsake. I plead for forgiveness, for I was but a fool. So saying, the young man hurled the sword to the ground, snapping it. Seeing this, the Pokemon disappeared to a place beyond seeing. A place beyond seeing. You might think that the Pokemon of this story is Giratina, a legend of the Sinnoh region that can disappear into the distortion world, and that would be a fair assumption to make, except I don't think so. Because I've never known Giratina to talk unlike Hooper, which I have known to talk. There's also all that stuff about traveling far and wide to find this Pokemon, and this is the Veilstone myth. And Veilstone City is just a stone throw away from the Sendoff Spring, which is where you can find Giratina. No, I think this is a Pokemon from further away than the Sinnoh region altogether. Additionally, there is all this stuff about a sword of great power, we don't know about many powerful swords in the world of Pokemon. There's Zacian and there's Aegislash, but I don't think they're related to this story. But there is one sword that I found of particular interest. And actually, when we look at the Pokemon manga, we do see a sword. The manga is much darker, and both characters of Archie of Team Aqua and Maxi of Team Magma are coming to the end of their life. So they have a fight, and they're fighting over a special suit of armor and a sword. Archie wins the battle and adorns the armor. The armor is called Eternity, and it has the power to slow time and preserve Archie's body. And the sword is called Instant. It's able to reflect the attacks of Pokemon, which sounds very similar to Hooper's ability of absorbing an attack in one of its portals 
and then redirecting it back to other Pokemon. He becomes this new character called Ghoulie Hideout. A character with armor and sword that can manipulate time and space. But what does this sword of time and space manipulation have to do with Veilstone or the Veilstone myth? Well, despite being more or less the only sword of significance in the Pokemon world, other than perhaps Zacian Sword or Aegislash, neither of which I think are the swords in the Veilstone myth, it also has the kind of powers capable of slaying Pokemon that I don't think an ordinary sword would have. Most Pokemon will be able to destroy conventional weaponry, which is why we don't see much of it in the Pokemon world. This sword is special and can rival them in strength and certainly could smite them. Additionally, the person who gave this sword to Archie was Cyrid, an undercover manga exclusive character Character, a Team Galactic admin who was undercover and actually is Cyrus's second in command. And where is the Galactic main headquarters? Veilstone City. Of course, I can't prove the connection between any of these things, but it is interesting to think that perhaps the reason the Galactic headquarters was built there is because this is where the sword, after it had been snapped, was found and then repaired. Perhaps we'll even see this Veilstone myth unfold in Legends Arceus, and maybe we'll get a good look at Eternity and Instant being used to slay the Pokemon of Sinnoh until Sinnoh is left a barren. Perhaps they could be some kind of villain in the game. Anyway, the point that really interests me about that Veilstone myth is less so the sword and the armor, but more the Pokemon with teeth and claws with the power to disappear into a world beyond seeing. Again, it's discussed often that perhaps this is Giratina, but Giratina doesn't really have fangs or claws, certainly not as obviously as Hooper does. And unlike Giratina that lives in the Turnback Cave, which isn't far from Veilstone at all, you really would have to travel far and wide to find Hooper. Additionally, Hooper is the only Pokemon that you wouldn't be able to slay with a sword that can manipulate time and space because Hooper can do it as well. It has a strength that rivals that of the sword. And of course, after it disappears into a place beyond seeing, it could use its portals to repopulate the Sinnoh of the ancient past. And this is why the Veilstone myth talks about a barren Sinnoh, but today we see a Sinnoh flooded with Pokemon life. Perhaps this was Hooper's doing. As a servant of, or rival to, Arceus. All of that, however, may just be a Pokemon myth. A story lost to the sands of time. A legend. I'm hoping to visit the Spear Pillar pretty soon and get to battle Arceus. And if I'm going to do so, I'm going to need a Pokemon that can rival it in strength. And from this, all I've learned is that there is at least one Pokemon here in this Cave of Wonders that can do so. And I think I found it. So hi, Pokemon Masters. Alright, okay, alright, okay. This is it, this is it. <clears throat> Testing one, two, one, two. Hey guys, Pokemon Masters. My name is Todd Snap and welcome to my YouTube channel. And I know what you're thinking. Todd Snap? You're good. I know, I know, last time you saw me I probably looked like this, right? Oh, those were the days riding around in the Zero One taking some of the best photographs of Pokemon to exist. I know you all have fond memories, I do as well, of course. Uh, a lot more polygons now though. And uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, uh, hi, I'm Todd Snap, world famous Pokemon photographer, Pokemon Times Person of the Year. Look, unlike you, I don't just catch Pokemon, okay? I catch Pokemon. I capture a Pokemon's true mom, essence. Mom, would you like a coffee? No, Mom, I'm fine, thank you. I'm just, I'm filming a video right now for YouTube. Thanks, I'm good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I am back home in Gala. Uh, I'm back living with my parents. I know a lot of you are wondering, Todd, where's Pokemon Snap 2? You know, you've been waiting for ages. That game was so beloved. And look, I thought it was going to happen. At the time, I truly felt that working for Professor Oak, doing that internship was going to open up a lot of pathways for me. And then Professor Oak went and did a runner after it turns out he was Ash Ketchum's father. Some DNA results came out and Mr. Mime got angry. It was a whole thing. Long story short, yours truly here. Oh, my career took a little bit of a hit. I thought Pokemon, big popular franchise, maybe I'll get a call about a movie deal. And they did a movie based off of a spin-off of a Pokemon game. Ryan Reynolds should have been playing me. Not to worry, I have a plan, see? Uh, age of the internet, latest Roton technologies, and tripwire cameras set up all over the Gala region. This is Pokemon Snap 2. Todd Snap snaps back. I am working on a title. You can uh, suggest yours in the comments. Because that's right, it's Pokemon Snap 2. It's a vlog series. And hopefully Pokemon Snap 3, that'll be the live action movie. Or possibly another game. 
In the meantime, I'm just looking to revitalize my career by taking it into my own hands and becoming a pokey tuber. You know, like Jay Witz or Lockstein or Birdkeeper Toby. Not my favorite, that one. And as I mentioned earlier, I've got my tripwires set up all around the region. Look, it's probably just better if I show you. Aw, oh, look, see, now this is in Galar Mine number one, and this little fella is Roly Coley. He's so cute. Roly Coley is the coal Pokemon, and it races around on its unicycle, just whizzing about on its wheel. Look at it, it's, it's seen the camera. This Pokemon is actually sustained by burning coal. But Roly Coley is not what I am after at all. In fact, Roly Coley is just a small fry compared to what I'm looking for. And would you look at that? It looks like Roly Coley's mother wasn't that far away. This Pokemon is Colossal. It's the final evolution of Roly Coley, and it is usually peaceful. It lives in the mines of Gala, but vandalism in the mines has sometimes forced it to attack people. With a heat of 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. That would certainly be enough to melt my Rotom cam if it got angry, but luckily this one seems friendly enough. And 2,700 degrees? Pompeii wasn't even that hot. The movie Pompeii, or what you're probably more familiar with, the Doctor Who episode, The Fires of Pompeii, but not the hit song Pompeii, all depict the events of Pompeii, an ancient city, where a terrible event happened in 69 AD when the mountain Vesuvius erupted, spewing volcanic ash and magma into the air. And it did all of this with an explosive force 100,000 times stronger than the Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs. The force was so powerful that the eruption consumed Pompeii, preserving many of the people and structures that were there in volcanic ash. And trust me, nobody likes ash. And yeah, the lava coming out of Pompeii, colossal heat is even hotter than that, but I'm not interested in just a regular old colossal. I am one of the best photographers, no, the best photographer in the Pokemon world. And if we get lucky and we check back in with our colossal, oh yeah. This, this is it. This is Colossal getting ready to Gigantamax. More than just Dynamaxing a Gigantamax Colossal, this Pokemon possesses so much power, so much fire, so much heat, 3,700 degrees of, oh no, oh no, no, no. Okay, oh well. All right, it might be a little bit harder than I think to get Todd Snap back on the map and get some good photos of these Pokemon. You know, Gigantamax Pokemon have always confused me. How people just sort of allow them to walk around the Galar region when so many of them are just so destructive. They are essentially Kaijus, giant creatures that stomp about and usually in all of their depictions destroy cities. And we're just like, yeah, put them in a stadium, make them fight, let's put them in the ring. Although there is evidence to suggest that Colossal, during a time where there was a giant cold wave in the Gala region, actually saved many lives thanks to its heat. So I guess they're not all bad. Though if you ever did need to counter a Colossal, and not that I hope you ever have to, might I recommend a Pokemon I've already got some footage of. One of my favorite photos, in fact, and that is Lapras. Oh, Lapras, a gentle natured Pokemon that you find at a beach. If we look at Pokedex entries from 20 years ago, back when I took this photo, we learn that Lapras was almost overhunted to extinction. But nowadays, when you look at Pokedex entries, it talks about how there is an overabundance of them. And in fact, fish populations are going down as a result of the, the conservation efforts for Lapras. And I think we can all agree that the saddest thing about that is that now Lapras is less rare. Uh, my photograph seems less cool. Stop saving the Lapras, please. You're making my career really, really hard. We don't even need Surf anymore. What's the point of Lapras if it's not for Surf? Nobody uses HMs anymore. I guess, as I said earlier, you can use Lapras as a counter against Colossal. Hopefully having one of these around uh, might keep the temperature down so that your cameras could take a really, really nice, perfect picture of Colossal using Fire Blast. And Lapras itself is said to have a Gigantamax form, though I've never got a photograph of it myself personally. Hey, maybe one day. And maybe one day I'll get a photograph of a really cool Gigantamax Pokemon. Obviously, it's up to whenever my trip wires go off and my cameras start getting footage. And when they do, I'll be back to you with episode two of Pokemon Snap. Todd Snap snaps back. Second Snap. Snap, Crackle, and Pokemon. Look, okay, I'm, I'm really, really struggling for a title here. Anyway, in the meantime, if you wouldn't mind helping out my career, we can get that Pokemon Snap 3 to finally happen. Uh, all I need you to do, of course, is subscribe to my YouTube channel by clicking the button down below, leaving a comment, leaving a like, letting the algorithm know that you want Pokemon Snap 3 to happen. 
or for them to just make a Pokemon Snap 2. And in the meantime, if you're looking for some more Pokemon content, as I kind of suggested earlier, might I recommend, uh, as I said earlier, Loxton or Jaywitz, uh, but definitely not Bird Keeper Toby. Don't, don't search that. With that said, thank you for watching, and I'll be Snap. Back. Back. No. Just. No. Thank you for watching. Well, hey, Pokemon Masters, Bucky Pizobi here, and thank you for joining me. I don't want to be alone in this place anymore. It's really early hours of the morning now, and I'm trying my best to stay awake. I'm trying my best to stay stimulated, so I'm hoping having you here is going to help that. Team Snooze leader or not, I mustn't go to sleep, no matter what the time is. I love this fob watch. It's one of my favorites. It actually reminds me of a hypnose pendulum. Isn't it gorgeous? Although, actually, does that even make sense? A hypnose pendulum, I mean, how can that send you to sleep? I've been looking up the physics of it, and, well, here's what I found. Hypno is the hypnosis Pokemon, a creature feared throughout almost all of the Pokemon world. Always holding a pendulum that it rocks at a steady rhythm, it causes drowsiness in anyone nearby. It's based off of the Baku, the dream eater spirit of Japanese folklore. But is this possible, Pokemon Masters? Is it possible for perpetual motion to send you to sleep? They rock babies to sleep, or they say you could count Mareep because it's kind of mundane, it's boring, it will send you to sleep. Don't try it right now, I'm really trying my best here to stay awake. But the thing is, hypnosis isn't even really sleep. It's a meditation state, a state of focus, it is a, a trance through which a hypnotist, or maybe hypno, will give you suggestions. For example, they give you the object, the pendulum or the spoon, and the idea is that you focus in on it, that you stare at it that you get into a deep state of trance and you just listen to my voice as I give you subtle commands like to subscribe and hit the notification button because the sub boxes aren't working. Sorry, fourth wall break. The thing is that when it comes to Hypno, I suspect its intentions are far darker than helping you out with your meditation. Putting you in a trance or in a dream, either one, it is feeding you dark thoughts and then feeding off of those dark thoughts, powering itself and making you suffer. They say in the Alola region that Hypno leaves people alone because of the presence of a Pokemon called Kamala, a Pokemon that is permanently asleep, permanently comatose. It can't wake up to tell us any difference, so I can't be sure, but I suspect that those Kamalas are in excruciating pain for the entirety of their lives. And Hypno gets an easy meal. Sleeping Pokemon Masters just feels like a silly thing. I mean, evolutionarily speaking, why would we evolve to lay motionless for hours every single day while there are predators out there? And again, first thing on a Monday morning when you're absolutely exhausted, just staying in bed a few more hours. But no, I can't. I can't go to sleep, especially when the predators live in the world of your dreams. I have been studying the world of the dreams of Pokemon. I've been sharing my research notes with Dr. Fennel from Unova, who tells me that that space, their dreams, it's like a real place, an alternate dimension, much like Ultra Space. Funny, because there is an Ultra Beast that shares its connections with the night sky. Of course, I'm talking about Lunala, a creature that opens up Ultra Wormholes and lets creatures from its world into ours to destroy them. Much like Necrozma, a creature that will shroud our world in complete darkness. I've been alone in the dark, listening to the sounds of Lavender Town. I have been to the old chateau and met the spirit of a young girl. I could barely survive the night there myself. And I have seen the end of the world caused by the Ultra Beast and even beyond into the apocalypse. I am Bird Keeper Toby, ultimate Pokemon adventurer. I'm so sorry, Pokemon Masters. I am just so sleep deprived. I am so exhausted. Problem is, stay awake, something bad could happen. Go to sleep, something bad could happen. Stay awake, it could mean that I am a fatal familial insomniac. There's only really a hundred cases known around the world, and these people never sleep. And as a result, their brain doesn't get the chance to recharge, it shuts down, and they die. Of course, go to sleep, and I might suffer from sleep paralysis, a condition in which the victim believes that they are awake. The dreamer thinks that what they're experiencing is real, when goblins, demons, or reported monsters sit on their chest. That's what they see. They believe it's real, and they cannot move. They scream for help, and they cannot be heard. Anyone who's gone through this experience knows that it is completely terrifying. And here in the Pokemon world, there are monsters in our dreams. Especially here, in the Canalive Inn, the hotel on the harbour. This is where a particular legendary Pokemon lives in the world of dreams. It is terrifying, but I think I'm going to have to go to sleep. I think I have to face it. If I don't wake up Pokemon Masters, then you can consider this my final snooze. 
It means that I've met the mythical Pokemon Darkrai, the nightmare monster that parents warn their kids about. Don't be naughty or Darkrai will get you. But it's no laughing matter. According to its Pokedex entries, Darkrai is probably just protecting its own habitat. Perhaps the Harbour Inn was built on Darkrai's home and now it takes people in their dreams to warn people to stay away. And by rights I should probably do that, but if there's a chance that I can save those who have been taken before me, then I have to try it. If I don't wake up though, I will be in a coma. A coma is an extended period of unconsciousness in which I won't be able to respond to the outside world or outside stimuli. I will be in the world of dreams forever, potentially never waking up. Pokemon Masters, if I don't wake up, if I don't make it out there and I can't beat Darkrai, then it's a good thing you're here. My research has indicated there is another legendary Pokemon, part of the Lunar Duo that has the power to repel Darkrai. If I don't wake up, do me a favor, find that Pokemon and bring me out of my snooze. I can't believe I'm saying that. Sleep well, Pokemon Masters. Pokemon Masters, Loki Potobi here. Oh, I keep on struggling to get to sleep. I've been having bad dreams, nightmares about a Pokemon. A Pokemon that I thought was my favorite, but now I find absolutely terrifying. I'm talking, of course, about number 143, Snorlax. Snorlax is the sleeping Pokemon. It is one of my favorites, a generation one Pokemon. It is a normal type. With the ability Thick Fat, it is known for its enormous size and weight using powerful body slam attacks. It is rare, weighs just over a thousand pounds and has its own Z move. This Pokemon is incredible. And its most common Pokedex entry says that this Pokemon is not satisfied till it eats at least 900 pounds of food a day. And then it goes promptly back to sleep. So Pokemon Masters, you might be wondering how Snorlax has become one of my favorite Pokemon. It started off as a bit of a joke, really. I mean, we all know I have an affinity for napping. Bird Keeper Toby, more like Bird Sleeper Toby. You've all seen Team Snooze. Many of you are members. Yes, I love to nap and I love to eat. And those are things that just resonate with me. And so when I see those traits in Snorlax, I think this is the Pokemon that best represents me. It's a classic Pokemon and it was part of the generation I grew up on. It was a, a viewer favorite. So why am I now scared of it? Well, I want you to think about the Pokedex entry that was just read to you. Snorlax is known to eat somewhere between 880 to 1,000 pounds of food every single day. And that just seems like a throwaway number. The Pokedex over-exaggerates all the time, right? But actually, that number, based on my recent research and the nightmares I've been having, makes a lot of sense. It is a monstrous amount. Granted, that much food is how much it needs to be satisfied, not how much it needs to be alive, but if it's in the Pokedex, then that means that that amount has been recorded being consumed by a Snorlax. And you can believe it from everything you've seen. And while mostly we see domesticated Snorlax eating fruit, it is possible that Snorlax eat other Pokemon. The problem there is just how many other Pokemon Snorlax would have to eat. Just have a little look at the graph I have made measuring the pounds weight of Pokemon. Yes, it could eat a Steelix once a day. Of course, that's the same as eating two Tyranitars or four Kangaskhans, eight Hippopotases or 16 Azumarils, 32 Gumshoes or 64 Bulbasaur. Can you imagine it eating 64 Bulbasaur a day? That's the same as 126 Torchix in weight, 256 Togepies, 512 Joltix, or 1024 Minior Cores. Every day. And even if it's just eating fruit, which I doubt, the world's heaviest fruit is 70 pounds, so it still need to eat quite a few of those every single day. Now you're probably wondering, but Toby, why? Why are you so scared of Snorlax? You already knew that it ate loads, right? Well, go back to what I was talking about before, Snorlax eating Pokemon. There aren't a lot of Pokemon that match that kind of weight, 800 to 1,000 pounds. Snorlax is likely uh, not a vegetarian. 
This is because it's based off of a bear, and bears are carnivores. And this is where I start drawing strings together, because Snorlax is a pretty rare Pokemon. It's said that when, when you battle it in the city, it, it returns to the mountains where it actually lives. That's what happens if you don't catch it. And sure, domesticated Snorlaxes are going to be eating a lot, lot less, because their trainers don't have access to that kind of food source. After all, consider that there's about 1,230 calories in a one pound steak, and a human's daily recommended allowance is somewhere around about 2,000 calories. If you do the maths, you're looking at Snorlax eating a day to be satisfied over 1,842,000 calories. That is a lot per day. 540 times our recommended daily allowance. And this is why I'm so scared, because Pokemon Masters, there is only one food source, one thing in the world of Pokemon that Snorlax is going to be able to eat each day to get that kind of calorie intake, to eat that many pounds and be satisfied. And that Pokemon Masters is other Snorlaxes. If you take into account that about 15% of our body weight is our skeletons, which presumably a Snorlax hopefully wouldn't eat, and you scale that up to the weight of a Snorlax and minus 15% of its body weight due to that being skeleton and bone, what is left in the organs and skins and, and furs and things of the, the like, that is what Snorlax would need to eat approximately to stay satisfied. The horrifying truth about Snorlax, and the reason it's so rare in the world of Pokemon only appearing one or two per region, is because in order to survive up in the mountains, Snorlax are eating themselves. And if you don't believe me, then know this. Cannibalism is a real thing, even in the world of bears, especially in the world of polar bears, when food is in short supply, and they will eat their own cubs. Poor Munchlax! And all my research has led me to believe that the only reason they put that information in the Pokedex and have that information match the weight of Snorlax is it's letting us know that Snorlax are cannibals. And the only way they are satisfied is if they kill and eat one of their own. Either that or I'm just overthinking it because of a lack of sleep. I should probably try and get some Zs. You know what I'm talking about, Team Snooze. Anyway, I should definitely try and catch some sleep. Saw high, Pokemon. Oh! Saw high. Pokemon Masters. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bucky Potobi here, and Pokemon eggs are a mystery. How do Pokemon reproduce? How does Ditto work? How do Pokemon of the unobtainable egg group continue to reproduce? So you want to learn about Pokemon reproduction and you use the YouTube search engine instead of anywhere else on the internet. Good, you're on the right track. You could ask the daycare people, but they have no idea how your egg got there. And I don't think they're just protecting your innocence here. They really do not know. Because Pokemon reproduction, I'm sorry you degenerates, it's not biological. It just doesn't happen the way you might think. How do I know this? Well, Pokemon reproduce via egg groups. There's the bug egg group, dragon, fairy, field, flying, grass, uh, monster, waters, one, two, and three. There's also the ditto egg group group and the undiscovered egg group, which I'll talk about a little bit later. But basically, if a Pokemon shares an egg group with another species of Pokemon, they can reproduce. This leads to wild things like, for example, infamously Skitty and Whale Lord being able to produce a Pokemon le egg. I was about to say leg. They can't produce a Pokemon leg, but they also can't produce the rest of the Pokemon body because biologically speaking, there is no world where these two things can work together. Additionally, genderless Pokemon can reproduce in the daycare, and actually the legendary Pokemon Manaphy is also able to create a Pokemon egg, though not an egg of another Manaphy, but instead of a Fione. We'll get to that. Speaking of legendary Pokemon, we know that there are baby legendary Pokemon out there. There's a baby Lugia in the animated series, suggesting that Lugia has a growth cycle and must have probably come from an egg at some point or another. Additionally, we see Arceus creating an egg seemingly out of nothing in the Sinjo Ruins event for Heart Gold Soul Silver, in which you can get a level 1 Giratina, Dialga, or Palkia. It creates this egg using the help of the unknown, and likely what's happening here is the manipulation of life energy or life essence, whether you call that aura, whether we're talking about the version of it that is used and turned into infinity energy in Auras, the life essence of Pokemon. This magnificent energy is being constructed into an egg. It's interesting to note that the processes of eggs hatching as well is more like a Pokemon evolution than it is a physical egg breaking and a Pokemon bursting out. And a process that's like a Pokemon evolution and a little bit more magical makes sense for how you can have, for example, baby Kangaskhan already inside the mother of the Kangaskhan when the Kangaskhan egg hatches. There are a number of NPCs in Pokemon who quote Professor Elm, who's somewhat of a leading expert in the world of Pokemon eggs, in stating that eggs are not actually eggs and more like cradles. Cradles of what? 
how are the eggs not like eggs? Well, it seems likely that eggs, lowercase e, indicating that, you know, the things that we have here in the real world are things that exist in the world of Pokemon. I'm pretty sure mayonnaise exists on the Pokemon sandwiches. And chickens, which likely did once exist in the world of Pokemon, as did many animals, as indicated in the early generations on various artworks, including Pokemon cards and in the manga and in the animated series, uh, and referenced, of course, in the Pokedex, did probably exist and lay eggs once upon a time. So eggs, capital E, Pokemon eggs, are not actually eggs. They're more like cradles. I mentioned mayonnaise on sandwiches earlier. Nowadays, you don't take your Pokemon to the daycare, but instead your Pokemon seem to breed while you're having a picnic, and that would be highly inappropriate, except for the fact that you can literally stare at your Pokemon, watch them not move, and then have eggs appear in your basket. The daycare man was right. They literally have no idea how the egg got there. The process must be magical. But if that's the case, then what's the point of a daycare center or a picnic at all? You know, obviously, to, other than to eat a sandwich, because yeah, that's what picnics are actually for. Well, it seems that while Pokemon reproduction happens in the wild, because of course it does, there are populations of Pokemon out there, when trainers start catching Pokemon and they want to be able to reproduce them, there are certain environments that sort of allow for that a lot easier. A Pokemon daycare, a picnic, a nightclub on a Saturday night. These are the environments where Pokemon are more relaxed and just up for a good time. And again, by a good time, I really am talking about the transferal of magical energy. As they mind meld, like the Chow in the Chow Garden, they do a little dance, or maybe nothing at all, and an egg is just created out of nowhere. A cradle of potential Pokemon energy that will one day transform into a Pokemon in its first stage, before again that same collection of energy allows it to mature up to the next stage of evolution, and so on and so forth. The egg is very much part of the Pokemon's life cycle. This completely accounts for how genderless Pokemon, Ditto, and the Pokemon in the undiscovered egg group reproduce. The egg group in their case, it doesn't exist, it's just simply undiscovered. It also means that Pokemon that share an egg group that are wildly biologically different, like Skitty and Whale Lord, that's how they reproduce. However, as we scroll down the undiscovered egg group, we see legendary Pokemon, baby Pokemon, and what is that? Why Why is Nidoqueen and Nidorina here? Not reading Nina around female, Nidorina and Nidoqueen. At first glance, you might think, well, yeah, Nidoran female and Nidoran male are gender variants. This is sexual dimorphism, which we see in the real world at play. Just to nail down any confusion here, by the way, I think Pokemon is conflating sex and gender. Technically, what we're talking about is sexual dimorphism, uh, but that's in the same way that Pokemon uses the term evolution, when technically what we're talking about is metamorphosis. Sexual dimorphism is a condition where sexes of the same species exhibit different morphological characteristics. I read that straight off of Wikipedia. It's a whole lot of big words for me, but that explains basically why the different sexes of Pikachu have different tail shapes, or the different sexes of Rhydon have different horn sizes. There's a whole list of Pokemon and traits that this applies to, but not need around male and need around female and their evolutionary lines. What they're experiencing is something completely separate from the rest of the Pokemon franchise. So not only is Nidoqueen and Nidorina not breedable Pokemon, they're in that undiscovered egg group, but also Oddity number two, they are somehow related to the Nidoran line, but aren't in the same way that any other Pokemon species with sexual dimorphism are. The third oddity, in one of the Pokemon movies, the Mewtwo Strikes Back, or the, sorry, it's Mewtwo Returns, we see a baby Nidoqueen. Not a baby Nidorina, a baby Nidoqueen. And actually, there is one more oddity here, which is when you looked at the shiny forms of the Nidoking line, they all look to be the colors of the Nidoqueen line. But when you look to the shinies of the Nidoqueen line, by the time you get to Nidoqueen, it changes, it goes a different direction. So yeah, what's with all these oddities? My theory, these Pokemon are clones, not actual true sexual dimorphism of the pre-existing Nido King line. Clones, you say, Toby? Clones? Well, we know cloning exists in Pokemon most prominently with Team Rocket and Team Rocket's leader Giovanni, his key Pokemon, are Nido King and Nido Queen. And it would be much easier to test on a more common Pokemon like Nidoran for the decades preceding Pokemon Red and Blue while you work on the technology before ultimately getting your one shot on a Mew fossil. Additionally, side effects of cloning in the real world are those of 
of the animal's lineage is becoming infertile down the line, which is exactly what we're seeing with Nida Queen and Need Arena. Additionally, animals having stunted growth, which could be what these baby Nida Queen are. And so this idea of them being a batch of clones released into the wild that can, of course, reproduce, but they can only reproduce either in their Need Arena stage or, of course, they're in the undiscovered egg group, so we just haven't discovered how they do it. But it doesn't work under the usual conditions that make Pokemon reproduce, which is why you can't take them and reproduce them in the daycare. Uh, yeah. This is, this is my explainer for that oddity. By the way, if you want to learn about sexual dimorphism in Pokemon, there is a really, really interesting video on my friend Umbreon Libris' channel. I recommend it wholeheartedly. Check it out. Anyway, anyway, right, let's move on to part three of this whole Pokemon theory, and let's talk about Ditto. I want to give you my definitive take on Ditto here, because Ditto is a Pokemon that can reproduce with any other Pokemon, apart from those in the Undiscovered Egg group. So what exactly is going on with Ditto? Well, Ditto is a Pokemon that is known for mimicking the thing that it is looking at. It is able to change its cellular structure. It can't mimic itself and transform into another Ditto, because it is already a Ditto, and two Dittos in the daycare won't make an egg. So how does reproduction work with Ditto specifically? I'm going to put to the side any theories about Ditto being a clone of Mew or a fail clone of Mew, though that could work for this as well. But instead, I just want to focus on what we know about Ditto. What a lot of people think happen is if you were to take a Ditto and put it into a daycare with a male Jellicent, that what it's doing is it's transforming into a female Jellicent and together they make an egg. But we already know that that's not how Pokemon breeding works. But additionally, that's just not how Ditto works. Ditto transforms into the thing it's looking at. So Ditto in this situation is becoming another male Jellicent or what I believe it's not becoming anything else at all it's staying as a ditto however in the daycare in this environment that encourages Pokemon breeding the ditto sort of scans or assimilates the biological data of that Pokemon and rather than transforming into that Pokemon instead creates a Pokemon egg from the data of that Pokemon of course the egg also has some data from ditto which is how that Pokemon passes down its IVs and things of that nature this works as a perfect explanation for the Pokemon of the undiscovered egg group that Ditto cannot reproduce with. It can't create an egg with legendary Pokemon because their DNA is too complicated. Their legendary Pokemon, the stuff of myth, can't replicate either with baby Pokemon because baby Pokemon cells aren't mature enough. And that's a big part of the cloning process involves using mature cells. And it is effectively cloning the thing it's looking at and putting its data back into the egg form. And then when it comes to the mythical Pokemon Manaphy, which it can reproduce with to make Fiona eggs. Well, Manaphy is really interesting because its biology is actually a little bit more simple than other Pokemon. Water makes up 80% of its body. I suspect that this is the one mythical Pokemon that Ditto has a good attempt at reproducing or rather cloning into an egg form and it does an okay job and creates Fione, a Pokemon that can't evolve into Manaphy because it is a failed attempt at cloning Manaphy. I do then have to wonder though, what is it about the Pokemon daycare that encourages Pokemon breeding? Like, is it just the case that the Pokemon vibe really well and have an unlimited Netflix subscription? I don't think so. I think the answer might be something to do with food and Pokemon eating. We learn this when we look to the Pokemon breeders in the Pokemon world. Brock wants to become a good Pokemon breeder. He talks about that a lot in the series. And one of his distinguishing features and when he says, oh, I want to become a Pokemon breeder is after he's made incredible Pokemon food that the Pokemon really like. Additionally, when you look to the Pokemon breeder trainer class in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, they're carrying a bucket filled with berries. And sure enough, the new way to get Pokemon eggs to breed your Pokemon is by making them a sandwich. There doesn't have to be a sandwich present. You can go without making the sandwich, but perhaps just laying the table makes a Pavlovian response where the Pokemon are like, oh, we're about to eat good food. Additionally, with the presence of Herba Mystica, which can be used in these sandwiches, we now have our ties back to Infinity Energy for, for, for the Herba Mystica originally grow in Area Zero, which is filled with this incredible life energy life essence of Pokemon. So I do wonder if perhaps food and eating well is somehow responsible for Pokemon reproducing. This also would make sense because in the grand scheme of things, Pokemon reproduction, a species surviving, whether they continue reproducing or not, might be very dependent on the amount of food available to them. If there's not a lot of food available for a species of Pokemon in the wild, that species may not reproduce. And that's an important survival mechanic because it means that there's not more hungry mouths to feed and limits the population size until they find an environment in which there is more food. This makes the Pokemon more comfortable. So perhaps they 
daycares have big berry gardens out the back. And that is my absolute full complete breakdown on Pokemon breeding. And I hope by this point in the video, your fulfillment of Pokemon knowledge and your interest in this topic has taken over any dirty thoughts you might be having. So hi, Pokemon Masters. Pokemon Masters, Bucky Patobi here, and I've done it. I finally caught 150 different species of Pokemon. I've got all eight gym badges of the Kanto region, and now I'm going for number 151, the mythical Pokemon known as Mew. I've only heard about it in textbooks that I found in the Cinnabar Mansion, but I've come here to find it. Up there, that is Mount Silver, or as it's known here, Mount Fuji. Fuji's the very man who created Mewtwo. Anyway, I'm ready to go up there, but I'm a little bit anxious because who knows what? who I'm going to find up there. We all know who's waiting at the top of Mount Silver. It couldn't be anyone else. The perfect final boss of any video game, Red, awaits us, the player character from Generation 1. His team comprised of the starters of the Kanto region, a Snorlax, which he caught on Route 12 or 16, an Eevee that has now evolved through high friendship in the day to Espeon that he would have got in Celadon City, or perhaps the Lapras that he got from Silco, and then of course his mascot, his chief Pokemon, Pikachu, one of the single highest level Pokemon to ever be in battle against. It's unevolved, suggesting that this is the Pikachu from Pokemon Yellow version. This version of Red tells the story of the Generation 1 player, and given that most people who were playing Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal for the first time were playing it as Generation 1 sequel, not part of some big mega franchise that was going to continue year after year, this was a real incredible treat for the player to finally get up to the top of the mountain and face off against themselves. But in order to get to this point, the player character had to travel all the way from New Bark Town through the Johto and Kanto regions, deal with the evil Team Rocket who was rising again, take on 16 Pokemon gyms, and finally get permission from Professor Oak to cut through where the Pokemon League stands, and after thwarting off Ursaring, Mistrevus, and even the pre-evolution to the pseudo-legendary Tyranitar, will make their way up to the summit, where they'll find Red. But the real question is, why exactly was Red there? We don't learn an awful lot about him from his mother character in Pallet Town in the post-game, just we know that he is a powerful trainer from a few years prior who took on Team Rocket initially. Red has come down from Mount Silver. Back in the old days, there was a Pokemon theory suggesting that he was a ghost atop Mount Silver, but he can be seen in the Alola region years on, side by side with his rival Blue at the Battle Tree. But no insight is provided there as to what he was doing on Mount Silver, nor is there any in Pokemon Masters, which is the only other game that prominently features Red. So to look into context clues as to what Red's doing there, we might have to look to some other canons. In the four-part story Pokemon Origins, which is probably my favorite of the Pokemon animated series, we follow the story of Red much as it was in the games. He takes on Team Rocket, gets his gym badges, and of course takes on the primary goal of the game to complete the Pokedex. He encounters the Pokemon Mewtwo in Cerulean Cave, the monstrous creation of Giovanni, and he learns all about it and traits about it from journals found in the Cinnabar Mansion. And at the end of the story, he realizes that there are more Pokemon out there than the 150 he encounters. There must be a 150. 51st Pokemon residing somewhere in the Pokemon world, and that Pokemon is Mew. We see it through the lab window at that time in Pallet Town. Pallet Town is a weirdly special place for Mew. In the Pokemon manga, which also features Red, Mew can be found in the forests around Pallet. In the animated series, when Ash returns from Alola, Mew once again can be found in Pallet Town. The location of the Cinnabar Mansion is just south of Pallet Town, of course. And while highly circumstantial, it's very possible that the events of the first Pokemon movie and the faraway island where Mew goes to take on Mewtwo is just off the shore south of Pallet Town. After all, Pallet Town is where Ash is holding up between getting all the gym badges and heading to the Pokemon. Pokemon League. And this connection to Pallet Town has actually come up in a theory before as to why Mew is in the possession of Professor Oak in Pokemon Masters. Pokemon Masters, for those of you who don't know, is a mobile game that really delves in deep to the lore of the Pokemon characters. I actually got to work on a few campaigns a couple of years ago about Pokemon Masters, and it was clear to me that the team had really done their research. There was very deep lore about Oak and Agatha and their relationship, as well as obscure characters like the Gen 2 female player character who only appears in Crystal, Chris, and how she's different from Lyra from HeartGold SoulSilver. There's really interesting stuff in there, and of all the things they decided to do, they paired up Oak with Mew. And it is interesting that Professor Oak, who created the digitized Pokedex, knew about Mewtwo. He had learnt about it from possibly his colleague, Professor Fuji. The name of this professor, by the way, matches the mountain which named Mount Silver, so that might become important in a moment. But 
Also, Oak numbered it as Pokemon number 150, meaning he must have known about the existence of Mew number 151, but not numbered the Pokemon to keep it secret and safe. So was it possible that Oak knew where Mew was and ultimately he directed Red to go to Mount Silver to seek out Mew to either complete his Pokedex or maybe to keep Mew hidden away from him? I think this is the case. However, the picture might become clearer if we zoom out and see what Mount Silver represents. It is at the center of a vast mountain range that covers the north side of the Kanto and Johto region, and there are a number of other points that are connected to this. Primarily, this mountain range connects round to Mount Moon and Cerulean Cave. Now, in a deeper Pokemon theory, I've done all about what Team Rocket was actually doing in Generation 1, I've already talked about this. Team Rocket were likely in Mount Moon looking for Pokemon fossils, not of Omanyte and Kabuto, which is what they found, but probably of Mew. It's possible that Cerulean Cave was Mew's original home, and that's why Mewtwo is drawn back there after its creation, after destroying the Pokemon Mansion. They were hunting the fossils around Mount Moon, and this is why you have Team Rocket Grunts stationed on the Nugget Bridge outside of Cerulean Cave, and of course, acquiring the TM for Dig from the people of Cerulean, because they were hoping to dig further into the cave from Mount Moon to acquire the Mew fossil. And it seems, of course, very likely that they were successful. This is where Mewtwo returns to at the end of the game, meaning Mewtwo was created, meaning that they must have found the Mew fossil. There must be traces of Mew all across this mountain range. And the part of this mountain range, the closest to Pallet Town, where the most Mew sightings across the Pokemon animated series has been, well, that's Mount Silver. Now, as a little side note to all of this, in the original versions of Pokemon Red and Green, there's actually a team that belongs to Professor Oak. There was supposed to be a final boss there, much as Red is the final boss to Gold and Silver, and that was Oak and his team. But his team only ever consisted of five Pokemon. He had one of the starters, the remaining starter that you didn't choose, and uh, a couple of other very powerful Pokemon. But he was missing a Pokemon. There was an empty slot there, which for a final boss seems quite unusual. There's also the caveat that in order to get to the peak of Mount Silver, you also need Professor Oak's permission. You can't travel there without it. I believe that the Mount Silver mountain range, uh, leading all the way up and round to Mount Cerulean, is a special place where Mew roams. And this might have far-reaching implications into Pokemon lore, because the mountain range of Kanto and Johto, if you follow it northward, leads to the Spear Pillar and the Mount Cornet. So, the origin of the Pokemon world, and here we have the ancestor to all Pokemon in Mew. Additionally, I have to wonder about the inclusion of Espeon on Red's team. While the addition of an Eevee that evolves into Espeon likely is a reference to his manga counterpart, who has an Eevee that it can evolve into all of the different evolutions until ultimately it settles on Espeon on Red's team, Espeon is in itself the Pokemon between Generations 1 and 2 that looks the most like Mew, and in fact shares a lot of traits. They are psychic cats with the same color scheme, and both have connections to unstable DNA that can turn into into many different things. It's a side point. And ultimately, of course, in Hot Gold and Soul Silver, it was later replaced with Lapras. I've also pondered the idea that perhaps Red on Mount Silver is, in fact, Mew. You ever wonder why Red can't talk? Okay, that is silly. But still, between Professor Oak's relationship to Mew and Pokemon Masters, the appearances of Mew all across Pallet Town and the Pallet Town area, the connection to Cerulean Cave, which is part of that same mountain range, and the fact that the very mountain, Mount Silver, is named after Fuji, the man who turned Mew's DNA into Mewtwo, suggests to me a connection. As symbolically, this makes sense as well, as Oak had already programmed in Mewtwo, and it was only after Red went up there and did in fact discover Mew that it was added to the Pokedex as number 151, the new species Pokemon. This Pokemon acts as the gateway, the door between the Kanto and Johto regions. And if nothing else, that is exactly what Mount Silver represents. Dragon type Pokemon are some of the strongest, most vicious, and powerful Pokemon in existence. They've become fan favorites of many trainers all over the world. One such trainer is Bird Keeper Toby, who we'll be interviewing today. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bird Keeper Toby here, and have you ever wondered why there's only two dragons in the whole of Kanto? I know I have. Birdkeeper Toby is a 10-year-old boy from Pallet Town, and he is fascinated with dragon-type Pokemon. He is also known for making Pokemon theories. 
Oh, Lance is like a personal hero of mine. I mean, he's got this cape that's like whoosh, and this hair that's like whoa, and he's got, I mean, he's got dragon Pokemon. He's got a Charizard, although Charizard technically isn't a dragon, so... It's true. Dragon Pokemon are hard to come by in the Kanto region, so even their champion, who specializes in the type, does not have access to many dragon Pokemon and has to use similar modern-day relatives to the type like Gyarados, Charizard, and even the recently resurrected Aerodactyl. Dragon Pokemon don't seem to thrive well in Kanto. The Pokemon Executor, said to originate from Alola, thrives there due to the sunshine. But it's not just their height that it loses here in Kanto, but also its dragon typing. Could this really all be due to the sunlight? Or are other forces at work here? Aliens. No, really, really, it, they are alien Pokemon. I once went on a field trip to Mount Moon and I saw a Clefairy and a Jigglypuff and I was told that they had come from the moon. What else do you think they evolved from the Moonstone? Oh, and there's Mr. Mime. My mom has a Mr. Mime, actually. He lives with us and helps out around the house ever since Dad left. Anyway, I've never seen a Mr. Mime in the wilds of Kanto. So before the aliens crash landed, there probably weren't fairy Pokemon here. Bird Keeper Toby somehow makes an excellent point. There are only three types of fairy Pokemon native to the Kanto region. Mr. Mime, the Clefairy line, and the Jigglypuff line. And Mr. Mime cannot be found in the wild here, only traded in. And the other two Pokemon apparently came from space. So, it's possible there did used to be many more dragon Pokemon here. However, the environmental changes have forced them to the brink of extinction. I'm telling you, all over the world where you'd find Jigglypuff or Clefairy, you don't find dragon Pokemon. Well, apart from the really cool ones like Kirin, but that's a legendary Pokemon, so that doesn't count. But like in the Alolan Islands, there's like this Axew that you have to island scan, but you can only find one of it, and that's on the same mountain where there's a Clefairy. Aside from that, you don't really find any dragon Pokemon where you'd find Clefairy or Jigglypuff. Worldwide, any locations where Jigglypuff and Clefairy have shown up from space, dragon Pokemon are virtually non-existent. The closest to an exception is Meteor Falls, where many dragon tamers train their Pokemon and some say the ancient tribe known as the Dragonids still visit. But even here, in this legendary training ground for dragons, the only dragon Pokemon you can find is Bagon, and even they are tucked away and hard to come by deep in the depths of the cave, likely scared away by the Jigglypuff just outside. All the other regions already had fairy-type Pokemon, but Kanto didn't. So if some just suddenly crash-landed from out of space, that's gonna like mess up the whole environment and all the other surrounding Pokemon or whatever. I mean, it's just like the time that they brought in Young Goose into the Alolan Islands to get rid of the Rattatas, but then the Rattatas had to adapt to survive because the whole ecosystem was messed up. I mean, those Rattatas have to be in the top percentage of Rattatas. They weren't. However, yet again, Toby somehow hits on something here. When a new predator is introduced into a food chain, it can have dire consequences. Ecological systems usually take thousands to millions of years to find balance. Introduce a new species of Pokemon like Young Goose, and the other creatures are forced to adapt rapidly. But what then if the creature is a whole new type that the wild Pokemon in a certain region simply cannot deal with? Likely it would cause an extinction event for any types that have adapted and evolved unchallenged. In Kanto, this was the dragon type. You can still find Dratini and Dragonair very rarely in the Safari Zone in Fuchsia City. You can find Execute there as well, and they'd normally evolve into the dragon type Executor, so it seems likely that it's all part of some conservation program. And it makes sense because there's the Poison Gym Leader there in Fuchsia City too, and Poison is strong against fairies, so hopefully the dragons are gonna make a comeback for my Pokemon adventure. Aren't you like 23? What? No, I'm 10, I'm 10, I'm a. Uh... Sure, man. The story of dragon Pokemon in Kanto is a tragic one. However, with conservation efforts being made, they may see a return in the future. But this isn't the only mystery of the Kanto region. Join us in the next episode for a look into Kanto's secret war. Hello, Pokemon Masters, Bucky Toby here, and I am in Shibuya, or you might know it's Celadon City. I've already got my Celadon City gym badge, and now I'm doing some shopping at the local department store which sells well, it's some very questionable items. But it's not just about what's above Celadon City, it's also about what's below. Did you know there's evacuation tunnels all over the Kanto region? And behind, below this very city, there is also the Team Rocket hideout. So what's with these underground bunkers? What are they for? 
and how do they connect to the Pokemon War? You've heard the classic points for a Pokemon War before. In the world of Red, Blue and Yellow, you play as Red and your rival is Blue, and in the later Pokemon games, you continue to play the part of a child. And while in later Pokemon games, even the player character's dad shows up, like Norman, in Red and Blue, the dad characters for Blue and uh, Red, they're not about. And while the region has plenty of old men like Blaine and Professor Oak, uh, there's not a lot of middle-aged men apart from those who are explorers and then of course gym leaders like Koga who is a ninja warrior, perhaps his ninja skills needed during a great battle, and of course Lieutenant Surge who is the binding piece of this whole theory. He is the Lightning American and he says that his electric Pokemon saved him during the war. So the question has always been, was there a war? What war is he referring to? A couple of years back, I dabbled with the idea that perhaps this was not a real war, that perhaps this was a stage war or a piece of television. After all, in Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, he does sign his gym pad with his autograph, and we actually see this as an item in Pokemon Sun and Moon, where it appears in the player character's room in Alola. Alola being based off of, well, Hawaii, which is part of America, and so the Lightning American maybe came from here. Of course, the inclusion of Hawaii here is quite interesting because America and Japan were at war during World War II and Pearl Harbor was famously attacked. Pearl Harbor is actually an area that's recreated in the world of Alola. So was Lieutenant Surge an actor? Or did he really go to war with his Pokemon? His manga incarnation shows him wielding actual weapons. It's hard to know. But if the world of Pokemon Red, Blue and Yellow is set in some kind of post-war world, it makes sense that they're sending children out into the world to travel with powerful Pokemon and catch them, recruiting them into tools of war, the entire economy based around the catching of Pokemon, Pokeballs costing as much as a regular bottle of water. And the company profiting from this, of course, in Kanto is Selfco, who creates these technologies. The biggest industry in most countries in the world is typically war. As the theory goes, the disappearance of this generation of men in between children and old men may be the explanation as to why Team Rocket is on the rise, with organized crime being a place for people who both can't reacclimate into society or who have had traumatic childhoods being drafted in, into the ranks of theft and crime, joining the Pokemon world's equivalent of the mob. And you might think this is all a bit dark, a bit ridiculous, Pokemon wouldn't touch on the subject of war, except they have time and time again, even even in recent years. In the Lucario and the Mystery of Mew movie, we see the olden times where people fought with armor, swords, and shields alongside their Pokemon. In Pokemon Legends Arceus, Kamado wears such an armor. Wigstrom wears the same kind of armor, a knight of the Kalos region, and of course in Kalos we learn about the ancient Pokemon War 3000 years ago between AZ's forces and some other region. He put an end to the war with an ultimate weapon that used the life force of Pokemon, ending countless lives. Even in Paldea, we learn that the Paldea region wasn't always as one. That didn't happen till an event called Unification, suggesting that back in the days of the Paldean Empire, the region was fractured and at war with itself. So if the Pokemon War did happen, who was this war with? Well, I don't actually think it was with the Alola region or even with the Unova region, despite the fact that Surge may be from those places. I believe that this war was with the Johto region. Kanto and Johto share a very unique relationship, with a Pokemon League at the heart of both of them. In Generation 1, this Pokemon League was just the League for Kanto. Obviously, Johto didn't exist yet. However, there was no gateway to some other unspecified region, and even in remakes we don't see this, as if the gateway, the connection between the two regions is relatively recent, built after the events of Generation 1. If so, it might be that the regions were once closed off to each other, and in Johto there is evidence of war as well. It depends on the canon you're looking at, whether it's the animated series, the games, Pokemon Generations, Pokemon Evolutions, but the story of the Towers of Ecritique City is different depending on the canon you look at. Some suggest a Thunderbolt destroyed the Brass Tower, which resulted in the creation of Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. Others say that it was burglars, and others say it was a warring time. But people in Ecritic do remember this event, even though it was supposed to be 150 years ago. Perhaps their longevity has something to do with Ho-Oh. But I digress. Could this be the Pokemon War being talked about? 
the legendary beasts are interesting to look at because they are the children of ho -Oh, much as Moltres, Zapdos, and Articuno appear to be the children of Lugia. And that's not an anime-only thing. In the games, the Azor Bay and the Sea Spirits Den are a direct reference to Lugia, who is the master of the bird trio. Additionally, every game that has a Moltres, Zapdos, Articuno in after a certain point seems to also feature a Lugia. The two trios seem to be related to their bird masters. We also know, and I discuss it more in a video about the Towers of Ecritique, that the Towers of Ecritique were not the original towers for Ho-Oh and Lugia, there were actually other towers. And if Kanto and Johto were once one region, then there actually is a tower in Eastern Kanto, the Pokemon Tower. So perhaps this was once the roosting spot of one of the legendary birds. But on top of that, Kanto and Johto, more so than any other combination of regions, do share a lot of ecology. Many of the baby Pokemon and evolutions of Kanto Pokemon appear in Johto and vice versa. And in fact, the absence of Pokemon like Electivire and Elekid from Kanto during the times of Generation 1 could be explained by Pokemon War destroying habitats. When you look to the Kanto region map, you realize that it wouldn't be easy to declare war across the land of Kanto as well. If you were warring between Kanto and Johto, you'd have to do it by way of passing mountains, which wouldn't be convenient, or by sea. The Kanto region has a natural sea defense in Cinnabar Island, an island where shady research is being done in the modern day, perhaps because the island is an abandoned old wartime outpost. But additionally, there is the cycling road, which would act as a natural defense for the Kanto region if being attacked from it by sea from its neighbor. This bridge is seen in the anime to be able to open and close, and it must be able to open to allow boats to leave from the Vermilion port, otherwise they simply couldn't. The Vermilion port, of course, being where Lieutenant Surge is based. But if the people of Vermilion were to be attacked, then where could they go? Well, they could evacuate by the Diglett Tunnel, that would take them all the way up to Pewter, or there is a number of underground tunnels and networks that connect all of the Kanto region. All the major population centers, Celadon, Saffron, Cerulean, Vermilion, and of course, Lavender Town are all connected by these underground tunnels. And actually, at the heart of them all, that's where Sylphco is based. There's also an underground bunker underneath the casino in Celadon City. This bunker now, of course, being taken over by Giovanni, but probably not built by him. Probably an evacuation bunker for if an attack were to happen. And sure enough, Goldenrod has evidence of the same thing, with a similar but much smaller underground tunnel running underneath Goldenrod City and an underground sort of bunker area there as well. So definitively, was there a Pokemon War? I just, at this point, can't tell you. I believe that there was. I believe that the creation of things like the Magnet Train and the SS Aqua to unite the two regions of Kanto and Johto do signify a new kinship between the two regions. But the existence of a new kinship that wasn't there before suggests that they weren't always good friends. So I think yes, I think there was a Pokemon War. I think that Lieutenant Surge was a real wartime hero and he's famous in the world of Unova and Alola, which is why he'll happily sign his badge. But it's not because it was an act, it's because he really is what he purports to be, the Lightning American. But what do you think? Maybe I'll have to hop on the Magnet Train and find out. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Birdkeeper Toby here, and today I find myself on the Coney Island Boardwalk, or to those of you who have played Pokemon, Nuvema Town, the starting town for Pokemon Black and White. But in Black and White 2, we get access to two new areas, Route 17 and 18, home to some of the biggest, baddest, and most legendary bugs of the Unova region. I'm talking about an egg that will eventually hatch into Larvesta and become Volcarona, or, of course, the P2 lab that produced Genesect. So let's take a look at these bugs of the past and future, and what they mean for the Unova region. You've all heard the classic Pokemon theory. There's a Pokedex entry that says that both Genesect and Kabutops lived 300 million years ago and that they were both great hunters. So people have taken to the idea that the fossil of a Kabutops was revived and then the Pokemon experimented on by Team Plasma on Route 18. There it was augmented and powered up, given a cannon and changed from Kabutops into Genesect. It's a fun little Pokemon theory, but not one I'm convinced of. The Pokemon are just too different for me. They're both very different types, of course, with one being Rock Water and the other being Bug Steel. I get the Rock upgrading to Steel, and maybe Kabutops wasn't always part Rock type, but it, like many other fossil Pokemon, probably gained that as part of the revival process, but the body shapes are different. 
Genesect is missing Kabutops' back plates, and it's missing the sides, the key thing that makes Kabutops such an incredible hunter. Some people have suggested that it's some sort of ancient version of Scyther, and while Scizor does gain that steel typing, when we look to Cleavor, which existed a few hundred years ago, we can see that Cleavor's hunting style lent itself more to these curved blades in an axe shape. And again, not a trait you want to remove, even if you are sticking a giant cannon onto the back of this Pokemon. No, instead, my favourite candidate for the Pokemon that Genesect was sort of revived from and altered from is some ancient form of Paris. Immediately, you can look to the arms of these Pokemon and see how similar they are. They are the same, not scythes, not claws, not axes, not scissors. Scissor doesn't really have scissors. Anyway, it has the same stubby arms, and you can sort of see how these Pokemon are similar when Jedisek flattens its body and becomes a small disc shape. It looks like it could be some version of Paris. But on top of that, we have the naming conventions. Paris, Parasect, Genesect. It's the same name, like Pikachu and Raichu, or Nidoran and Nidorina. My favourite theory is that a Pokemon like Paris, which is conventionally very, very weak today, uh, couldn't have existed in the ancient past. But instead, in those times, it evolved into something more formidable. That Pokemon, though, that evolution of Paris was ultimately infected by a not so fun fungi, and ultimately it became Parasect, with the fungi taking over. Paris and Parasect became weaker so that they could serve the fungi's needs. However, we now know with the Pokemon of Old Hisui and Fossil Pokemon and the way they revive and resurrect Pokemon in the world of the Galar region, which is just so terrifying. We now know that new ancient forms of Pokemon life are discovered all the time. I believe at that time, Paris or Parasex looked very, very different. It looked a lot more like Genesex, standing up on two feet before being infected. But it's odd to me that Team Plasma would choose any of these Pokemon, Scyther, Kabutops, Parasex, to turn into Genesect, because there's a much more significant arthropod that exists in the Unova region as part of its central history. Volcarona is effectively a non-legendary, legendary Pokemon. It lives in the Relic Castle as a one-of in Pokemon Black and White. The Relic Castle is an ancient place of much mysticism, likely the seat of power for one of the king heroes of the Unova region. Despite the fact that it has what I would call a regional variant in another region of Frostmoth, that Pokemon is held in not as high a regard. Even though Snom is amazing, and it should be held in that kind of regard. Anyway, this Pokemon is tied into the mythology of the Unova region. It rests in the Relic Castle, which is likely connected to the item the Relic Crown, which can be found across the region in the Abyssal Ruins. The Relic Castle is in the middle of what is the Desert Resort, which is surrounded by Pokemon like Yamask and Sigilyph. These Pokemon suggest the existence of an ancient city there. On the nearby Route 4 in Pokemon Black 2, you actually see houses that suggest this was the case. Volcarona is the Sun Pokemon, and it has a Pokedex entry that states, When volcanic ash darkened the atmosphere, it is said that Volcarona's fire provided a replacement for the Sun. Volcanic ash. There is a volcano in the Yanova region, Reversal Mountain, so perhaps long ago it did in fact erupt, and when its ash darkened out the Sun, it was Volcarona that kept the region warm. However, perhaps too warm. A theory suggested on m TV's channel a long time ago is that it's possible that it is that warmth of Volcarona living in the castle that then ended up under the sand that ultimately destroyed everything in the area. It's heat changing the environment in a way where crops could not grow. This actually matches with the Violet Pokedex entry for the pre-evolution Larvesta. In ancient times, Larvesta was worshipped as an emissary of the sun. However, it was also viewed as a burden, since it often caused forest fires. So, Volcarona surely has the ability to change the environment. Its heat so much it can replace the sun is also probably what caused this area to become arid and desert-like. It's interesting though, this idea that it was worship, because I noticed on Twitter there was a tweet and uh, this is just something else. Do you know that shiny Larvesta looks like Arceus? You know, look at the whole little, the, they're both Pokemon that are worshipped. I don't know, I think there's something there. However, in Area Zero, there is a newly discovered Pokemon that may contradict many of the stories of Volcarona in the ancient past. After all, Slitherwing is not a fire type. Then again, perhaps Slitherwing didn't exist in ancient Yanova. But these two powerful bugs of the Unova region, Genesect and Larvesta, are actually tied together more than you might think. On Route 18, it is the only place in the whole of the Unova region where you can get a Larvesta egg. It's given to you by a Pokemon Ranger, who is just looking for a Pokemon trainer to take this egg into their hands. I don't even think they know what they have, or that the Pokemon inside is so rare. However, just a little way upstream against the currents that may have brought the egg to where the Ranger found it, there is the P2 facility, the plasma lab that was built for experimentation on Genesect. N is ultimately against this. He believes that the nature of Pokemon is perfect 
and not to be manipulated with technology. And yet this lab was built for research of some purpose, to create Genesect. This is where we get the Genesect drives. The scientist who works there is furious that this part of the project got shut down. This must be part of the plasma operation that was being kept secret from N and in control of Getsis. And that makes sense. A big part of Team Plasma's plan is about temperature control. They want to use Kirim to freeze over the cities of Drayden and much of the Unova region. Genesect has the chill and burn drives along with a few others, so perhaps he was trying to create a cannon that could freeze things, but also burn things. If the Larvesta egg was found by this Pokemon Ranger outside or nearby the P2 lab after it was shut down and the project for Genesect decommissioned, perhaps the next step was to look into Volcarona, a Pokemon whose core body temperature can burn so hot it can turn a whole city into a desert. And a backup plan for Getsus should anything go wrong with his end plan involving Reshiram and Zekrom. Now, it's interesting to note that the Unova region as a whole exists in this place of paradox, somewhere between the past and the future. It's actually why a lot of the Legends games about being talked about right now, people are thinking about Legends Unova. The Swords of Justice are part of Unova's legend, and yet there are future versions of them, paradox versions found around Area Zero. If you look to Drayden's city, or the aforementioned Route 4, or the White Forest and Black City, these all represent areas of Unova that are in a state of flux, that depending on which version of events you're playing through, either represent the past or the future. This could have something to do with a Legends game, or time-space distortions at the least, that are implied to have happened over the Unova region. Ingo is found in Pokemon Legends Arceus, displaced from his Unova region. I wonder how Emmett's doing. And sure enough, in the tents of the Diamond and Pearl Clan, we see an image to what looks like an ancestor to, or perhaps Alder himself displaced in time. Alder's interesting here because he is the main character in the world of Pokemon, who uses a Volcarona as his ace. Perhaps even the legends of Volcarona in the ancient past saving the Unova a region after a volcano erupts is somehow his Volcarona. So Team Plasma will have known the secret history of Volcarona. The area that this ranger finds this Larvesta egg in, they were doing experiments on past bug Pokemon, so it makes sense that the egg came from there. The region exists in this paradoxical state between the past and the future, and of course they want to use a Pokemon to take control of the weather and the environment of the region, ultimately to take power. Gets this doing so, if not through prophecy and with a puppet king in N, perhaps by his own means with projects like Genesect. I believe that Getsis built the P2 lab on Route 18 as a sort of backup plan for if anything should go wrong with N, and this is actually why the Plasma Frigate docks there at the end of Pokemon Black and White 2. It's the last place it has orders to dock. This is Getsis' fallback. And had the project been allowed to go far enough? Perhaps they finally would have completed what they wanted to work on, converting what they learnt from the Genesect project to the Larvesta project, and created Iron Moth, a paradox Pokemon described to be like a UFO from space, much like where Kyurem is from. A Pokemon that now may never come into existence. Hello there! Hey! Hey, come back! You gotta let me out! You're gonna destroy the world! Pokemon Masters! Come here! Come here! It's me, Bird Keeper Toby. I've snuck aboard Team Aqua's ship. Oh, you've got to help me. Team Aqua are going to unleash the legendary Pokemon Kyogre onto the Hoenn region, and that cannot be allowed to happen. There's archaeological evidence, you see, proving that Kyogre has awakened in the past and flooded the entire region. Everyone is going to drown. Everyone is going to die. They call me crazy, said that, no, this is for the betterment of the people of Hoenn, but it can't be serious. I'm going to tell you about the times in the ancient past that Kyogre flooded the Pokemon world. Rumours of an ancient flooded Hoenn first got Ruin Maniac's attention when deep inland the Hoenn region they found fossils in the desert. At the heart of this desert, there are fossils for the ancient aquatic Pokemon Lilip and Aranith. Lilip and its evolution Cradily are based off of a sea lily and Armaldo too is a water type. That's not right, it's a bug type. <laughs> So never mind. Or is it? Hang on, Armaldo? Rock bug. Rock bug. And Aranith 2 is a trilobite that would have lived in the ancient oceans. What is a desert doing in the middle of the land? Well, this is kind of like the Sahara Desert here on Earth. The northern Sahara used to have an ocean running through it, but after the oceans and waters receded, the desert was all that was left. 
So this suggests that sea levels may have actually once been high enough to pour over the canyon surrounding the desert of Hoenn and fill in this land. And this would actually explain quite a few oddities in Hoenn. In Four Tree City, there are houses in the treetops where the trees grow exceptionally high. Why are the houses built so high up? Well, likely to help people in case of a flood. The grassland south of Four Tree grows incredibly tall, tall enough that you can't even cycle through it. This may be the case so that the grasses can still reach sunlight should the water level rise higher and higher. We see a microcosm of this in Shoal Cave that demonstrates the changing tides naturally do have quite a big effect on the areas of Hoenn. There are mudslides as well all over the Hoenn region, suggesting the presence of soft ground, which is the result of water mixing with the dirt. I did a video a long time ago as well about Laverage Town, a town that in modern day is inaccessible by any roads. It's it's awkward and inconvenient out of the way. You have to get a cable car up to the top of a volcano to then make your way down to the town. But perhaps once upon a time, this village grew because the sea level was much higher. And this was a safer place to have a village above sea level, but away from the ash of the volcano. Evergrande City is also built oddly high on the top of a waterfall. So perhaps this is a way to guarantee its safety should the sea levels raise once again. There are also mirage islands all across the oceans of Hoenn, and it's possible that these islands hide themselves as a result of some kind of mysticism, some magic that means they're there one moment and not another, or it could simply be the case that these islands are so close to sea level that sometimes they disappear entirely under the waves, only to appear very rarely. The Pokemon biology reflects this too. Lotad and Surskit float on the water's surface. Uh, Tropius has a long neck and can fly to get away from the ground and to get food far above the ground should the ground disappear underwater. Barboach and Swampert suggest a world where the earth and ocean meet and water levels change. Perhaps this finally explains as well the biology of Spoink, which is ridiculous. According to the Pokedex entry, it needs to keep bouncing to keep its heart pounding, but this would have made a lot more sense if the ancestor of Spoink actually used to live in the water and it was simply swimming, which sounds far less exhausting. That would also mean that the psychic energy that's left in Spoink's pearls when a Spoink does pass away in the ocean will go to the bottom of the ocean floor, providing as an origin story for Clam Pearl. There's also Seedot and all the Pokemon of the forest like Beautifly and Dustlarks and Slackoth that ultimately would thrive high up in trees. And if the world did become flooded again, it would mean that all three of the Reggie Chambers would have been effectively islands. There's already one that's an island, but Registeel's chamber in particular is quite odd in its placement, just randomly, on some raised plateau in the Hoenn region. But perhaps, once upon a time when the ocean levels were higher, this was an island. So at the end of Pokemon Sapphire version, when Kyogre starts using its power, you can really see the effect that it might have on the region, and the background storytelling that's always been hinting towards this. If Team Aqua access its power, then towns like Little Root, Petalburg, and Rustbro may end up completely under the waves. Pokemon Masters, we've got to do something. If we don't stop Team Aqua, they're going to destroy the world. And it's unlocked, of course it is. Come on, let's go. We've got to stop Team Aqua. Uh, Oh, Pokemon Masters. Him? Don't worry about him. He's a member of Team Magma. Caught, like me, probably sneaking aboard. Uh, unlike me, he was trying to steal the Red Orb, an artifact that was going to awaken the legendary Groudon. Yeah, they're just as bad, so you don't have to feel bad for him. Groudon, in the ancient times, eliminated entire civilizations when it removed all of the water from the Hoenn region with a drought so strong that, I mean, there were civilizations that used to exist as evidence for this under the oceans of Hoenn. Uh, fine, I'll explain that now. Team Magma then are trying to awaken Groudon, whose drought can be seen across the Hoenn region, and if the Hoenn region were more dried out, that would also make sense. The only regions to have access to the dive mechanic are Hoenn and Yanova, and in Yanova it's just at the Abyssal Ruins. We know that the Abyssal Ruins were once above the water, suggesting that the areas of Hoenn that you dive to were also once above the water. This makes sense for the ruin chambers below routes 132 and 133, suggesting that the sea levels were once much lower. You also notice that the information on how to access the Reggie chambers here is in braille, which is a wonderful form and way to communicate to people if the sea levels are to rise. If you write all of your top secret information with pen and paper, well, in vast drought, the paper can set on fire, and in deep rain, the paper can get spoiled and ruined. 
But in Braille, if carved definitively enough into the granite walls of the cave, this could last for generations through all kinds of weather conditions. It also means that if these routes were once dried out, then there would have been a walking route, a pilgrimage that would have connected from Pacific Town, where outside of course is the Sky Pillar, all the way to Granite Cave, where we also see evidence of the Draconids, who probably left the ancient Reggie Caves there along the way. It's also interesting to note that the Granite Cave and the Cave of Origin have many floors below the cave surface, below the island surface, suggesting that yes, the sea level was once much lower and people could dig and uh, excavate down. The Draconids, of course, are the ancient lore keepers of the Pokemon world who knew about the Regis and the Blatties and, of course, Groudon and Kyogre. They built their main base of operations, the Sky Pillar, and nearby Pacifildog Town, a town that's built to float on the water. The kind of thing a civilization might build if the sea level was once much lower, but they suspected Kyogre would strike again in this never-ending clash between these two titans. Sky Pillar is a tower that goes up far beyond where the sea level can rise to. It seems also that its surface level has raised up from the ground, or rather the water level has uh, receded since it was built. So they've had to create a new entrance on a level of rock below it. The Draconids have built this way because they're predicting that the sea levels and land levels will constantly rise and fall across the region's history. And it seems modern Hoenn people have noticed this as well. They've built the cycling road far above the ground for this exact reason. And in fact, there was a project at the Sea Marvel that was supposed to be an apocalypse bunker they were building, a new marvel that descended below the Earth with security doors that would seal up. Uh, there were many notes across the Sea Marvel that alluded to this building being a self-sustaining city of the future. However, the power needed for this project would have had to have come from the life energy of Pokemon, and so ultimately the project was cancelled. No, the Draconids had the right idea. You need to build upwards into the sky. They used Mount Pius specifically as a sacred site where uh, the deceased would be safe, as well as the orbs of red and blue, being hidden away by lore keepers here from the evil Archie and Maxi, who try to use them to control Groudon and Kyogre. But trying to utilize these Pokemon's powers, <laughs> it's tempting with fate. We've made it. The Team Aqua Hideout, Pokemon Masters, and I know exactly what Archie is keeping in here. The red and the blue orbs should be inside. They've got these little symbols on them, the Alpha and the Omega, which, which sort of appear on Groudon and Kyogre's body, which would lead me to believe that they're related, like maybe even biologically. If I had a Tree of Evolution poster, I would know. But then that makes me wonder if they're connected to another Pokemon, a Pokemon that shares symbols, the Delta Rayquaza. If the red and blue orb aren't enough to stop Groudon and Kyogre, then I'm gonna need to turn to the Draconids for help. Let's see what we can do. Thankfully, there is this third Pokemon, Rayquaza, that seems to come down from the heavens, summoned by the Draconids. Some believe that Rayquaza might exist because of a wish, perhaps the result of Jirachi, the wish-making Pokemon. That would explain why these three Pokemon with wildly different biology all have the same markings inscribed upon them. It's possible that they're all created by the same kind of magic. But however, Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza existed, whether they are the results of biology or the results of Arceus creating them, there is one thing for sure. Rayquaza is the only reason the region is now in a constant state of balance, half in the sea and half on land. Because when Kyogre is summoned, it begins to rain quite a lot. And when Groudon is summoned, the drought gets really, really hot. And both the heat and the rain need to travel through the sky to reach the Hoenn region. And that's where Rayquaza lives. I believe that the reason Rayquaza will save us all is not because of prayer and wish or prophecy or anything like that. It's effectively happening because Groudon and Kyogre are arguing over the thermostat of the place where Rayquaza lives. And so Rayquaza has to come downstairs to knock their heads together and knock some sense into them. And that's why the region is currently in a perfect 50-50 split between Groudon's domain and Kyogre's. You too, huh? Pokemon Masters, I got caught again. So I'm sorry to say the world is doomed. It is gonna end and we are all gonna die. But if you get a chance before we die, make sure to click the link at the top of the description to head on over to Live Escape Sorcery and book your slot in this escape room. Without them, I would not have been able to film this video, so thank you so much. Uh, but like I say, do it quick, because we're all going to be underwater soon. So hi, Pokemon Masters. Am I going to die? Yeah. Yeah, you are. Hey!
Pokemon Masters, Bucky Toby here, and I am here at the Temple of Sinnoh, and it's time to rock and roll. This is the illustrious orb, a piece of the legendary Pokemon Palkia, and so too is there an adamant and greasiest orb connected to other legendary Pokemon. Stones of power appear everywhere in the Pokemon world, from the Mega Stones of Kalos to the Z Crystals of Alola, or of course, terrestrialization that's been discovered in Paldea. A region where crystal like structures in battle will envelop a Pokemon, changing their power level and even their shape. Stones of power are a common trope in fiction, whether that's the Infinity Stones, or Sonic's Chaos Emeralds, or Zelda's Spiritual Stones, or, or the Dragon Balls from Dragon Ball. Pieces of rock, pieces of geology connected to the gods that can control the fabric of reality itself. Now, in the Pokemon games, we don't go around collecting these orbs and stones, but instead we collect the Pokemon themselves. There are legendary Pokemon that fill this role, like Dialga being the Emissary of Time and Palkia the Emissary of Space. But the more I look at the diamond in Dialga's chest and the pearl in Palkia's arm, the more I realize that these legendary Pokemon may be connected to gemstones in a really big way. Just look at Arceus that even has bits of jade around its golden ring. And in fact, through this video, you will realize that the majority of legendary Pokemon fit into this. Because this is such a seismic theory though, I have been joined by the wonderful Captain Fidget, who by the way, I've been watching his videos a lot lately and I think he's great. If you want to support a new and upcoming Pokemon theory channel, please head on over and subscribe. He's really helped me dig to the bottom of this geological problem. Hey Toby, thanks for having me. Let's talk about stones. The franchise as a whole has made reference to gemstones since the days of gold, silver, and crystal, and now Legends Arceus is here to shine a huge light on a number of powerful stones. The Origin Ore, Greasius Core, Adamant Crystal, and Lustrous Globe can be found throughout the game. These ores can each be refined into items of power. For the ores of the Creation Trail, we know over time they will change from being simple chunks of ore into fully fledged orbs, held items that can boost the power of their holder. For Giratina, it reverts it into its origin form. But for Dialga and Palkia, it seems that the refinement process that turns these gems into orbs has left them without enough power to transform the rulers of space and time into their origin forms. It's interesting to note that pale and prism spheres can be found in the Sinnoh underground, likely smaller fragments of those same ores that have chipped away over time. With the aptly named origin ore, you'd expect it to be connected to Arceus, but you'd be wrong. The red glow seems to relate to the gemstones we see on Azelf, Mesprit, and Uxie's head, possibly Manaphy too. This ore is connected to the material used to create the red chain, which we know can be artificially created using the lake trio. The red chain has the power to restrain legendary Pokemon, and the origin ball, which is formed from this ore, also seems to have a 100% catch rate even on godly Pokemon. So origin, Greasius, Adamant, and Lustrous, four ores representing four groups of legendary Pokemon, and then Arceus, who has green gemstones upon its body. But this is only the beginning of the connections that stretch back so much further than this generation. Recently in the Galar region, they discovered the body of a Pokemon called Eternatus. The parts of its body weren't all in one place, they were scattered all across the region, all across the wild area in the form of wishing stars, a sort of perfectly red rock that emits a special energy that causes Pokemon to grow. Similarly, in the Isle of Armour and Crown Tundra, we find more ores, the Amorite and Dinite ore, that again share the same colour scheme of Eternus' body, purple and red. Could they be part of this Pokemon's body? In the Alola region as well, we see Necrozma, yet another prismatic space dragon that's body has separated into shards known as Z-Crystals, the same energy shared by the totem Pokemon, Pokemon that are made bigger by a special energy. Much like normal Pokemon from the Hisui region. So it seems like there's a lot of connections here, relating all these Pokemon and energy types together. In Pokemon X and Y, the main trio don't really have that, although of course there are gemstones in Xerneas' crown, and of course in the cores of Zygarde's body. But the biggest gemstone in all of the Kalos region is the Anastar City Sundial. A sundial which seems to be connected to the source of Mega Evolution energy. And in fact, as you can see, its coloration is very similar to the mythical Pokemon of that region, Deancey, whose body is made of the very same crystal. Also, since X and Y, there have been so many locations featuring gemstones from space, either deep in the earth or in caves. The mines of Galar, the Glittering Cave, and the Alolan Pokemon League all feature gemstones prominently as part of the design. 
and the legendary Space Rock Pokemon continue to be everywhere. Just to run through a few more, Latios and Latias have the Soul Dew. Manaphy, Fione, and Meloetta all have gemstones in their head. Many legendary Pokemon have exclusive Z crystals like Mew and the Tapus, and of course a few have Mega Stones like Deansi, the Lattes, and Mewtwo. Even in the Generation 1 movies, there are special sacred stones dedicated to Zapdos, Moltres, and Articuno. And the connections go back even further. In Generation 3, Groudon and Kyogre were controlled by the red and blue orbs. In Heart Gold Soul Silver, the Jade Orb appeared, which was used to control Rayquaza. However, this orb is a little different to the red and blue ones. For starters, it didn't reappear in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire like the other two did, where they granted access to the Primal Reversion mechanic for Groudon and Kyogre, which in itself is not too dissimilar from the origin forms we're now seeing with Dialga and Palkia. Additionally, in the cutscene where Groudon and Kyogre first primal revert, their whole body becomes one giant ore, further pushing the idea that these stones and their bodies are connected. So, just like Dialga and Palkia are the living manifestations of the adamant and lustrous orb, stones of time and space, so too are Groudon and Kyogre living manifestations of the red and blue orbs, stones of earth and sea. But then also, in the manga, the Jade Orb exists, but only as a man-made artifact, and fail to be much more than a glorified power gem, just like any other power boosting gem we see in the games. It's likely that creating a true Jade Orb would be impossible, as this would have to come from the one ore we haven't seen yet, Arceus's ore. And the reason for Jade, well, Lox then did a whole video on this, but the Husui region translates from Japanese to the Jade region. Jade is a very important material in Japanese mythology, with Jade Magatamas being the substance used by gods to create gods. You may recognize this symbol from the Calm My podcast. Toby, did you really just script in for me to give your new podcast a shout out? Oh, what, the Calm Mind podcast featuring my good friend True Green 7 that we release every single week on a Friday at 8 p.m. BSD on the Calm Mind YouTube channel. No. <sighs> yeah, you might recognize this symbol from the podcast, or more likely, from the face of the Pokemon Minior, who also ties into this, being a flying space rock who, in its shiny form, looks like Necrozma, and according to its Pokedex entries, it lives in the ozone layer, where it becomes food for stronger Pokemon, likely Rayquaza who lives in the ozone layer, and, wouldn't you know it, ingesting a meteorite in the atmosphere is what gave Rayquaza access to Mega Evolution. In the Generation 5 era, we never see Kyurem in its full form, but it is separated into the Tau Trio, Zekrom, Reshiram, and Kyurem. And Reshiram and Zekrom await in the Dragon Spiles Tower in a stone form, the White Stone and the Black Stone. They wait to combine with Kyurem, who is in itself a giant ice crystal structure, and we know that Kyurem in its full form is called the original dragon. It may be that the original Kyurem is the source of all dragon energy that we learn about in Reggie Drago's Pokedex entry, where it talks about how it was once composed of crystallized dragon energy, and the Reggies of course themselves, other than Reggie Lecky I suppose, all seem to be elemental rocks. So putting aside for a second the Z-Crystals and Mega Stones that I just mentioned, as well as Moltres, Zapdos, and Articuno spheres that appear in the movie, if you don't treat that as canon, as far as we can tell, Generations 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 all seem to reference some kind of giant crystal that comes from space that has its ties to a legendary Pokemon, usually a dragon. And each of these tie to an energy. Kyurem has the dragon energy, but then there's infinity energy, Z-Crystal energy, Noble Pokemon, Gigantamax, or Primal energy, all of these energies connect back, of course, to Arceus, a Pokemon that also has gemstones in its body. As I mentioned earlier, the Jade Ore is the one that we haven't really seen, and in fact, I suspect that if you could get Jade Ore and refine it, that would be the thing that's coating the Strange Ball, the Pokeball that allows players to transfer the old, weak Pokeballs of Hisui into the future, allowing them to travel through time, wrapping around them and protecting them from being destroyed. By the way, this whole video came about because the captain and I were just trying to figure out how the Strange Ball worked, and it turned into all of this. Looking into gemstones and ores in the Pokemon world is a gift that keeps on giving. It is important to note that across Hisui there are ores found pretty much everywhere, which is a stark difference to modern day. These ores give you Tumblestone, named so for the process used to give them their smooth and rounded appearance, tumbling. Inside these ores, you can also find iron, a pretty typical compound, but sometimes stardust. Which means these ores originated from space before crashing down into the lands of Hisui. And all these connections we've been drawing between stones and aura or the life energy of Pokemon is reflected again here. As we know from the research found at Sea Marvel, the Devon Core used infinity energy of Pokemon in their Pokeballs. When it comes to modern day Sinnoh, we suspect that one of the reasons the ore is gone is that it's all been mined. 
notice that we never visit the Iron Island in Hisui, but in the time of Sinnoh, just a few hundred years later, Iron Island has been completely mined. Not of iron, there's plenty of that there, given the fact that there's wild Steelix who evolve by ingesting iron. No, instead, mined completely dry of all the ores used to create Pokeballs. The lingering presence of life energy or aura are evident though, given that this is the only place in Gen 4 where you can find a Lucario being trained by an aura guardian. Uh, not that one, Riley. Across Pokemon, there are in fact many other items filled with the life energy of Pokemon, such as the fossils that are easily restorable, but are ultimately rocks, explaining the rock typing of the fossil Pokemon, and the evolution stones, which radiate with a special energy, causing Pokemon to evolve. All of this is to say that the same technology that creates Pokeballs also comprises various evolution items and other items across the Pokemon world. Mega evolution items, Z crystals, and pretty much anything you can think about. It's all to do with stones of power to varying degrees. Now, I know what you're thinking, Pokemon Masters. Of course, there's connections to all of these things in the later generations. They've been thinking about all of this stuff when they're developing the Galar region. What about back in the days of Gen 1 and 2? Well, in Cerulean City, there is a cave, a dungeon where Mewtwo sleeps, where there are giant crystal-like structures that actually have a very specific effect on Melmetal, turning it a kind of golden color. It's really interesting. You should try it out in Let's Go. And these crystals kind of remind me of the Stargazer Room in the Sinnoh region. Oh yeah, in the Sinnoh Underground and the Grand Underground, right at the center of the region, and only at the center of the region, there is a giant crystal in a room called the Stargazer Room. So once again, we have our connections to the stars and the cosmos and giant crystals. It would actually be perfect if this was green. This would be Arceus's Jade Ore. Or perhaps this is the origin ore changed over time from the color of red to the color of blue. It's all speculation at this point, but as I just mentioned, the blue stone does seem to react strangely to Meltan and Melmetal. If you take any Pokemon into Cerulean Cave and let's go Pikachu and Eevee and take it up to these stones, none of them will change in the way they look. But for some reason, the lighting and the coloring on Meltan and Melmetal changes to gold, which makes sense because Meltan and Melmetal came out just after the Alola region, a region all about alchemy. And the main purpose of alchemy is trying to find a Philosopher's Stone that can bring eternal life and turn metal to gold. Speaking of gold, finally we have Johto, where the only Pokemon with a crystal-like structure on it is the crystal Pokemon, Suicune. Suicune's origins are pretty much known to us, and I'm fairly certain it didn't come from space. Instead, it was resurrected by Ho-Oh, perhaps using the power of the unknown, who, as we've seen in the third movie, do have the ability to create Pokemon out of crystal. There is one line in the Pokemon Crystal game that implies Suicune to be the leader of the beasts, and to have a special connection with the unknown. Perhaps some future Gen 2 remake with new forms for Lugia and Ho-Oh will shine a light on the history of this region, much in the same way as Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire did for Groudon and Kyogre. We also know Ho-Oh to have a connection to the unknown that appear in the ruins of Alf, which once again ties back to the creation power of Arceus as seen in the Sinjo event of Heart Cold Soul Silver. Additionally, in the original anime, Ho-Oh appeared as pure gold, a phenomenon that was also briefly seen in the card game with Break Pokemon. Then, when it comes to Lugia and Or, we can see the fact that, as opposed to Ho-Oh's rainbow wing, which is simply a feather, Lugia's silver wing is clearly made from pure silver. Yet another rare earth material extracted from ore. Diancy, Uxi, Azelf, Mesprit, Dialga, Palkia, Giratina, Arceus, Kyurem, Groudon, Kyogre, Rayquaza, Necrozma, and Eternatus. All of these Pokemon have ties to space rocks and that power up Pokemon using the life essence of Pokemon. All of them have ties to space somewhere in the background and all of them have mysterious origins. I propose that each of these Pokemon is perhaps not born biologically, but instead from these ingots of power. Or perhaps it is the case that the ores are born from them, sort of like a godly poop. Where did these stones come from? Maybe they came from Arceus. There are inscriptions on the plates of Arceus that suggest as much. But being a bird keeper, my favorite is the inscription on the sky plate. The being poured the remains of its power into stone and buried it deep. Of course, we know that the power of Arceus is likely the life force of all Pokemon. We see in its own movie, the Jewel of Life. This life force of Pokemon expresses itself in Pokemon X and Y as infinity energy and is fired off by the ultimate weapon from a giant crystal-like weapon. Where it lands? Possibly at the heart of the Paldea region, where it lands at the very center of the region and burrows down, creating the crystal rage dens that we see throughout the region and of course terrestrialization, which is the newest feature. I suspect we're going to see many more gems of power like this for years to come. So Pokemon Masters, it seems that these gemstones and rocks represent the fabric of the reality of the Pokemon universe, but I've heard that fabric could be 
at risk of tearing. That fabric is fragile. Tears in reality in the forms of space-time rifts and ultra wormholes are becoming more and more prevalent in Pokemon games. How are such things being created? And what are the implications on the wider Pokemon universe? Quickly, Pokemon Masters, join me over on Captain Fidget's YouTube channel where we can try and solve a few more of these Pokemon theories and mysteries. And as always, so hi, Pokemon Masters. Hey, Pokemon Masters, but keep it over here, and behind me is Liberty Garden, home, supposedly, to the mythical Pokemon Victini. There are a shady group that have been seen there recently, a Team Plasma, who want the liberation of all Pokemon and for them to be released from their Pokeballs. But I've always wondered, in the Pokemon world, is catching Pokemon actually wrong? This is probably the biggest and most moral question that we've wrestled with on this channel over the years. Is catching Pokemon wrong? What Team Plasma was standing for, or appearing to stand for, the liberation of Pokemon, is it truly something worth considering? Well, certainly we should consider it. We should at least think about it. In the ancient days of the Pokemon world, Pokemon were known as magical creatures, and the people that worked alongside them or controlled them were known as creature masters. The word master here is already very complicated and layered, and could be a whole video of its own. There is the historical context, of course, of masters and slaves. If the Pokemon trainers are the masters, then what are the Pokemon? Then again, the word master here might be detached from historical context, and instead simply be talking about someone who is proficient in a skill. They have mastered it. They have mastered the ways of the magical creatures. These two different interpretations of the word Pokemon Master here definitely imply being a Pokemon trainer is either absolutely fine and a skill that needs to be grown or definitely something wrong. This is what Peter was expressing when they made a Pokemon parody game called Pokemon Black and Blue. This, of course, was designed to bring attention to animal abuse. A noble cause, and the parallel they're making here, of course, is that Pokemon battling and fighting each other for human gain and entertainment, this is animal fighting, of course. But this might be a bad or wrong analogy to make, for Pokemon are not animals. Animals did exist in the world of Pokemon, and certainly having them fight one another might be wrong, but for Pokemon I suspect it's a little bit different. They are instead creatures of pure magic. When they fight each other, there are multiple ways in which they can engage in battling. In the first Pokemon movie, when the Pokemon are tearing each other apart physically, we learn from Nurse Joy that Pokemon are meant to fight, but not like this suggesting that they are built to fight in some other way, using their magical powers, which Mewtwo says in the movie he's turned off the Pokemon's special abilities. So Pokemon fighting under certain context is actually part of what Pokemon seem to do. They do this naturally as well in the wild. And not just the small critters that interact with each other in environments, but literally the gods of the Pokemon world, Dialga and Palkia, tend to fight when they come into contact with one another. We must remember that Pokemon exist in a world where there is a confirmed canonical god Pokemon, Arceus, and Arceus seems to be chill with Pokemon battling. So battling Pokemon, at least in some context, seems to be absolutely fine in the Pokemon world. God is okay with it. I think the question that people are often asking when they're thinking about this topic and that Peter is asking when they made their game is, well, but what if Pokemon existed in our world? And that's not the question I'm asking today. I'm more going to focus on the lore because this is a Pokemon lore channel. So from the perspective of Pokemon trainers who are magic creature wielding, and again, we're going to be charitable here and assume that when they're talking about being a Pokemon master, they're talking about mastery of training Pokemon, mastery of a skill, not mastery and dominion over those Pokemon. Not to say that that doesn't happen in the Pokemon world, evil organizations certainly do try to catch Pokemon in unconventional ways and bend them to their will to do things that they clearly don't want to do. But your average general run-of-the-mill Pokemon trainer who's out there with their buddy Bulbasaur, is that Bulbasaur really their buddy? Well, the Pokedex says in episode one of the Pokemon animated series, while Pokemon tend to be jealous of human-trained Pokemon, now, of course, we do have to take this with a grain of salt. After all, the Pokedex was written by people. This is using a human interpretation and understanding. Though, later on in the Pokemon series, Rotom does enter the Pokedex. Rotom being a Pokemon that is able to communicate quite directly with people through this Pokedex format. And while we don't know anything about this specific claim, whether it changes its mind about wild Pokemon being jealous of human trained Pokemon, I can't imagine it would be happy sticking around in the Pokedex and working alongside Pokemon trainers because it's not caught in a Pokeball mind. 
if Pokemon generally had a problem with it. Pokemon do have the ability to very directly and in human language communicate with humans in the Pokemon world. So what do Pokemon get out of a relationship with human trainers? Because it's clear what the humans get. Humans are able to advance their social status by becoming powerful Pokemon trainers. In addition, they're able to deal with great obstacles, whether that's literal obstacles to allow them to traverse the world, or use the Pokemon's superpowers to help them in building buildings, cities or advancing technology or whether it's even in defending the planet that all people and pokemon share against creatures from other dimensions like ultra beasts no what does the pokemon get out of it and the clear thing here is probably evolution Pokemon in the wild don't tend to evolve. It's very common to find Magikarp everywhere, but not quite as common to find Gyarados. You find Pidgey in many of the roots of the Pokemon world, but Pidgeot, not so much. Pokemon in the Pokemon world level up and evolve through battle, and while they do do this in the wild, they're more likely to battle a wider variety and more frequently if they're under the control of a human-trained Pokemon. This might be where the notion that you need to weaken a Pokemon before capturing it comes from. We sort of see this in the battle in the animated series where Ash takes on Trico, Trico wants to be caught by Ash, but it doesn't want to be caught by Ash if Ash isn't going to earn the right to do so. And so Ash has to do so by having a Pokemon battle with it. And again, I want to note here that this isn't a battle in the same way that we're talking about a punch up or, or physical dominion over another creature. This is a magic battle. These are magic creatures using their magic powers to magically fight one another. That quote in the Pokemon movie of the idea of their Pokemon's special abilities being turned off implies that there is a wrong way to do a Pokemon battle, something that's just abhorrent and doesn't happen that often. But Pokemon channel the various elemental types to do magic battle and to clash up against the magical defenses or special defenses or speeds or HP of other Pokemon. And it's only by weakening a wild Pokemon to a certain point that the Pokemon is then more likely to go ahead and be captured, not just because it's submitting because it's weak, but possibly because it deems the trainer throwing the Pokeball at it worthy of its command. Of course, there are Pokeballs that have a 100% capture rate. The Master Ball, for example. This Pokeball isn't commercially sold. It is owned by Pokemon researchers, professors who use it for that purpose, and given out to exceptional Pokemon trainers who have done great feats. Uh, but it also ends up very frequently in the hands of evil team leaders. Perhaps there is something about this 100% capture rate that does make it an, a moral issue in the world of Pokemon. That I could very much understand. But still, Pokemon are able to release themselves from their trainer's control. We see in the animated series Grookey break its own Pokeball to escape the evil Team Rocket, who clearly don't care about this Pokemon as much as another trainer might. So Pokemon have the ability to leave their trainers pretty much at any point, which begs the question, why don't they? Why even have a Pokeball? Well, Pokeballs are designed to be the healing units for Pokemon. Pokemon can rest in them after a battle. They're designed to curl the Pokemon into a specific shape, whether that's the shape of the actual Pokemon being miniaturized or just the energy of that Pokemon that encourages them to rest and be safe. Pokeballs are also fantastic for transportation. Imagine if rather than walking alongside your human trainer across the Pokemon world, instead your human trainer would turn you into energy, store you in a Pokeball, and then just take you across the Pokemon world with no physical exertion to yourself. It is convenient. But furthermore, by sticking with those Pokemon trainers, the Pokemon might finally be able to do enough battles to achieve evolution. Or better yet, the greatest form of evolution, Mega Evolution. Mega Evolution is only achievable between a Pokemon trainer and a Pokemon that have a particularly strong bond as well as the relevant keystones. This bond is integral to the Pokemon transforming into this state. This may be the want, the end goal for a Pokemon. Then again, maybe not. Mega Evolution does have a lot of Pokedex entries talking about how the transformation process is painful for Pokemon, overflowing with this incredible life energy, this aura that's within them. We know that Aura is a big component in actually catching Pokemon, and again, I'm going to leave that to my video on how Pokeballs actually work and the history of Pokeballs, because I think that's more relevant there. 
but in terms of how it feels for the Pokemon, not good to transform to that state. So perhaps this is human technology once again pushing evolution a little bit too far, not understanding the Pokemon's need. There needs to be a correct balance between evolving a Pokemon as far as it can go naturally, not exceeding that. Humans in the Pokemon world are not immune from making bad choices and uh, immoral decisions. This is where teams like Team Snagum and Team Rocket create shadow Pokemon. They try to push the Pokemon incredibly far, but not through love and care, instead through just sheer force of will. This often causes the Pokemon to close its heart off to the trainer and become a shadow Pokemon. These Pokemon can become incredibly strong, like the Tranitar in the fourth Pokemon movie, but then again, they do seem to become mindless beasts. But there is another form of transformation that I've mentioned on this channel before, because Pokemon with especially close bonds to their trainers do tend to be very, very happy. Pikachu seems very happy with Ash Ketchum. And sure enough, much as there are Shadow Pokemon, or Dark Pokemon as they're known in the TCG, there are also Light Pokemon. Light Pokemon appear in just the one Pokemon TCG set, but all of their effects and abilities, all of their attacks, revolve around cooperation, teamwork. And sure enough, we actually see something like this in the animated series as well, with Greninja. Ash's Greninja shares a bond with him so close that it becomes Ash-like when it becomes the Ash Greninja form. This transformation, as far as we know, is not painful for the Pokemon at all and seems to actually be a very positive thing, allowing Greninja to reach even higher heights. So perhaps there is a true and best form of Pokemon that is incredibly rare, but totally possible through the collaboration of humans and Pokemon working together. Additionally, if you want to think of Pokemon in a more animalistic sense as well, there is certain advantages to symbiosis across species. We often think about survival of the fittest as like the survival of the fittest individual, thwarting all opponents, having no predators because it is the apex predator. But this isn't actually true all of the time. In fact, many times Times, like with humans, they focus on being a social species, collaborating, units working together. Sometimes, like when we look to bees, for example, and beehives, there are members of the species that don't even have the interest in reproducing. Instead, their goal is to help the hive by collecting food. It's not about survival of the fittest individual, it's about survival and reproduction of the entire hive. And so the worker bees collaborate with the bees that are ultimately the ones that are going to be reproducing and the queen bee, and they all work together. Sometimes, and it is rarer, species work together, they collaborate. Mutualism and symbiosis exists across various animals across the animal kingdom, and it's true in the Pokemon world, we know that for a fact. You see how Remoraid works with Mantyke to help the Mantyke evolve into Mantine, and perhaps by being able to defend the Remoraid, then the Mantine can evolve and transform into the Octillery. Pokedex entries talk about how Crocodile and Flygon hunt together and share the bounty of that hunt. And in the much grander scheme of things, we know that Pokemon exists in a world, in a universe, where there are extraterrestrial threats. Ultra Beasts from other dimensions who can literally destroy reality or consume the light from the sun. So it may be that in the version of the Pokemon universe that we see in the animated series and the games, it's one where people and Pokemon have learned to work together for the benefit of that reality. It seems likely that in universes where people and Pokemon did not learn to work together and where they didn't enjoy that relationship, those universes were wiped out by the Ultra Beasts, the Lovecraftian nightmares from the Ultra Dimensions. And to allow for that to happen, well, that would be wrong. So is catching Pokemon wrong? If Pokemon existed in the real world, in our human world, then almost definitely so. I'd love to see a video on that topic. But within the lore of the Pokemon world, within the confines of the reality that they have, the canonicity of the life force of Pokemon as magical creatures to be wielded by masters of that magical energy. A universe where a god canonically exists and takes the form of a Pokemon and seems perfectly happy with Pokemon and people working together in this way. A universe in which if people and Pokemon don't work together, it may be under threat by creatures from the other side of the cosmos. And one in which Pokemon themselves are able to grow and expand their range of different abilities, powers, and strengths by evolving, by battling alongside human trainers. I think in this world, in this reality, I think catching Pokemon is probably fine. And Team Plasma almost definitely didn't have a leg to stand on. Actually, when you think about it from the perspective of someone who exists in the Pokemon world, Team Plasma really do seem quite radical. But maybe you have a different take. Let me know in the comments down below what you're thinking. And of course, soar high, Pokemon Masters.
Hey, Pokemon Masters, Bookie Toby here, and I am in Tokyo, or as you know it, Saffron City, behind me, Silph Co., currently being raided by one of the most evil organizations in the whole of the Pokemon world. But do not worry, for I have got the device that they were looking for, the project, the Master Ball. A Pokeball with a 100% catch rate. The man who's after this will one day become Master of the Multiverse, but uh, not if we can stop him. The Master Ball. It's debatable as to whether the regular Pokeball is an evil piece of technology, for while it is created using Infinity Energy, the life force of Pokemon, at the end of the day, a Pokemon has to really choose to join a trainer. This happens as the result of battling only against the strongest of trainers, for it is only with them that they will achieve evolution. But the Master Ball has a 100% capture rate. No other Pokeball in existence is like it, apart for, say, the Origin Ball from Pokemon Legends Arceus, and perhaps the Pal Park Ball. The Origin Ball is a special case, perhaps Perhaps it was by learning about this that Silphco learned that it was theoretically possible to create a Pokeball with a 100% catch rate. The other, the Park Ball, was likely in production as a result of working alongside Professor Oak. The Pal Park was opened by Professor Oak. Then again, perhaps the catchability of the Pokemon in the Pal Park is as a result of the fact that they're already caught, so we can't lean on this too much. It is interesting to note, though, that it is typically Pokemon professors who give the player characters the Master Ball, whether that is, of course, Professor Juniper or Elm or even in the side series like Pokemon Gale of Darkness, where it's the Pokemon Professor who gives the Master Ball to the player character, and only to player characters who have achieved the absolute incredible. Alternatively, you can get the Master Ball through a lottery system, but your chances of that are, well, well as rare as winning the lottery. The other most consistent place that the Master Ball turns up is in the hands of the least trustworthy in society, the evil teens. The Master Ball can be found in the evil team bases for Team Aqua and Magma. Team Galactic 2 have possession of this legendary item, and it seems that they don't want to use the item to capture Dialga or Palkia. Cyrus talks about how the Master Ball would somehow weaken or restrict the Pokemon, unlike the Red Chain, which will allow him to control those Pokemon without dampening their strength. But Team Rocket doesn't mind. Team Rocket isn't looking to destroy the world necessarily, they simply want to use Pokemon as tools. Dampening the power of the most powerful Pokemon even slightly still leaves you with the most powerful Pokemon of all time. A Pokemon that they commissioned. Mewtwo. Mewtwo is the most powerful Pokemon to exist, for it is not natural, but instead it is created. It's an abomination, and the most powerful Pokemon I've ever encountered. If Pokemon are tools to be used for conquest and for money, then why not have the most powerful tool in your disposal? This is the monstrosity that Giovanni created. But he didn't count for Mewtwo's free will and the want to be out of its own containment, and so he needed to go to Silphco and obtain the Master Ball to get Mewtwo back. But after the raid on Selfco, the Selfco president says that production on the Master Ball is going to stop because it can't be allowed to get into the hands of evil people. This, of course, though, is untrue. The R&D department must be up to something because it ends up in the hands of these Pokemon researchers and in the bases of these other evil team members. It seems that Selfco is particularly bad at allowing this ball to not fall into the hands of these types of criminals. But while Archie, Maxi, and Cyrus don't use their Master Balls, Giovanni only wished he had one, for there was only one Pokemon that he needed to capture, his own creation, Mewtwo. With this Master Ball, he was to travel to the Cerulean Cave, where he already had Grunts stationed outside. It was his goal to reclaim this Pokemon. This after his plan of battling it normally and weakening it with Ghost Pokemon fell through when he was unable to obtain the Self Scope. However, in the events of every Pokemon game that we've ever played, you, the player character, manages to stop Giovanni, stop him from getting hold of the Master Ball plans. But we do know what would happen if Giovanni succeeded. We see this at the end of Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, where the Rainbow Rocket episode happens. There we meet Giovanni, now with Mewtwo on his team, trying to conquer the multiverse with the other team leaders by his side. They are all using Master Balls for their Pokemon. It seems that they were somehow convinced their minds were changed to grab Master Balls and catch the legendary Pokemon whose power they sought to use. Who convinced them? Probably their leader, Giovanni. But given that Giovanni's raid on Selfco happens before much of the rest of the Pokemon timeline, how did Giovanni know when and where to seek out these team leaders? And also, how did he get access to ultra wormholes and jumping between dimensions? Well, I believe this also came from Selfco. See, the Selfco building is littered with warp panels, panels that spin you around and teleport you across buildings. It's possible this technology was made by studying Abra, a Pokemon pretty important to Saffron City. I've done a video all about that. 
But for now, what I want to focus on is this. In the Delta episode of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, the Devon Corporation are working at the Moss Deep Space Center to create a warp hole, through which they're going to send a meteorite to a different version of reality. This isn't an ultra wormhole necessarily, but it is a portal to another dimension, and it's fueled by the same technology as they confirm themselves the warp portals, the panels that make you spin around and travel everywhere. This technology also fueled by Infinity Energy. I believe that after his raid on Selfco, acquiring the Master Ball and acquiring Mewtwo, Giovanni returned to Selfco to get a better idea about this specific technology. And using this technology, before traveling the multiverse by way of ultra wormholes, instead traveled by the way of these warp holes, these warp panels, and he appeared in the headquarters of... Team Aqua and Magma, and Team Galactic, and the Plasma Frigate, and Team Flare, because all of their evil team bases have the warp panels. And actually, the Plasma Frigate is where Colrus gives you the Master Ball. So all of these evil team layers are, are linked by the warp panels and, of course, by the presence of Master Balls. It is this way that Giovanni found his candidates for Team Rainbow Rocket. And he brought with him, of course, his Mewtwo, which, by the way, can Mega Evolve. Mega Evolution happens as the result of a transformation of Pokemon using stones that came from an ancient time 3,000 years ago. But Mewtwo wasn't around 3,000 years ago. Giovanni made it in recent history. The answer to this might be found in Pokemon Origins, where Dr. Fuji, or the old man Fuji from Lavender Town, gives Red the Mega Stones for Charizard, the Mega Stone X. Charizard and Mewtwo are alike in that they both have access to two Mega Evolutions. I suspect that Mega Charizard X's Mega Evolution is not natural, just like Mewtwo's. It's not something that happened 3,000 years ago because Mewtwo didn't exist 3,000 years ago, but using their understanding of Infinity Energy and the Life Force of Pokemon, as learned through the information that they stole from the Devon Corporation and from Sylphco, Team Rocket in the games were able to artificially create the Mewtwo Knight, which allows them to mega evolve Mewtwo. So this is how Giovanni assembled his team across the Multiverse of Madness, and once Rainbow Rocket was put together, they first attacked the Friend Plaza in the Alola region. This is a digital realm that acts as this game's horrible online feature that allows you to connect with other players, much like the Link Cable in the days of old, the same Link Cable that is the inspiration for the Link Cable in canon that connects these warp portals. So perhaps that's what they were doing here, setting up a Link Cable to the warp panels and warp portals that appear in the Aether Paradise. However, they could have gone somewhere else. For now, we have Area Zero, which also once again features that warp panel technology. We don't know why Team Rainbow Rocket didn't come here. I mean, obviously it's because the games didn't exist at that time, but perhaps it was something to do with the various paradoxes that would happen if they did. Giovanni is interested in taking over the multiverse as is, and if the stuff of wishes and dreams and time travel can happen in Area Zero, it could prove to be a weapon against Giovanni. For now, he was just taking on the regions that he knew he could take over one by one as he continues to amass his power. At the end of the game, he disappears though, having been defeated, swearing to defeat somewhere else, and he heads off to conquer some other region. Perhaps that region is Passio in Pokemon Masters, where we see characters from all across the Pokemon multiverse, including a different Archie and Maxi from their incarnations in Rainbow Rocket, teaming up. And actually, we even see Giovanni with Mewtwo with his Rainbow Rocket outfit. So maybe this is where he went after he was done in Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. We just can't know for sure. Still, if a Paradox Mewtwo, like Iron Brains, one of the fake mon created uh, for this channel uh, a few months back, does show up somewhere in the future, then we'll know for a fact that Giovanni did swing by Area Zero in his creation of Rainbow Rocket. Of course, a final reason that he might not have come here is due to the Pokeball jamming signal that exists here, because there's no good in having a Master Ball if the thing won't open. We're facing off against the Protection Paradise post call. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is that a Master Ball in Professor Sada's hand? Sure enough, Sada and Churo both have access to Master Balls, and maybe this is just a coincidence here. Maybe it's because, of course, they were once the Pokemon Professors of the region before they went missing in Area Zero. Pokemon Professors are the other faction who give you Master Balls throughout the game, but 
Saturn Shiro also fit the role in this game of the hidden secret big bad boss. And warp panels are in Area Zero. Is it possible that Giovanni did in fact swing by Area Zero and building Team Rainbow Rocket? You might be inclined to say no. After all, anyone who beats the Hall of Fame in the Paldea region gets given a Master Ball. Sada and Shiro are among those. However, it's not just the one Master Ball. Sada and Shiro have every single Pokemon they catch, every Pokemon that they've been catching, contained within Master Balls. As if they had the ability to create their own, as if they had the instructions for the Master Ball directly from Silphco. Is it possible that Giovanni really did come by Area Zero? I think so. Because I said at the beginning of the video that all of the evil team leaders from all of these various bases, Aqua, Magma, Galactic, the Plasma, Frigate, and of course Lysander Labs, where Master Balls are given to you, these all happen at different points in time across the Pokemon timeline. And yet he's able to pull all of these evil team leaders together in the same time period in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. It's almost as if, after mastering the power of traveling the multiverse, he would have needed to come to Area Zero to access the Time Machine to pull together Team Rainbow Rocket. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Murky Toby here. And right now I am in the abandoned New York farm colony, or as it might look like to you, the dream yard of Unova. This video has been sponsored by Whatnot. I could not be traveling out here without them. More on them at the end of the video. But for now, let's look at the Pokemon that live here in the dream yard, Muna and Moonshana, who create a special dream mist that allows people and Pokemon everywhere to access the world of dreams. So what is the dream world in Pokemon? Join me, Team Snooze. Let's investigate. The world of dreams. Long ago, I was the leader of one Team Snooze, an organization so powerful it rivaled Team Rainbow Rocket. Unfortunately, everyone fell asleep on the job and all of the grunts disbanded. Though who knows, maybe they're out there taking over radio towers trying to call back Team Snooze. Uh, who am I kidding? Everyone's having a nap. And where those Team Snooze grunts will be going along with their Pokemon is the world of Pokemon Dreams, which is a real physical place in the realms of Pokemon. It is the main existence, of course, where Pokemon trainers live with their Pokemon. This is where most of us spend our time in the world of Pokemon. But layered on top of that, there are other dimensions. The Distortion World, Ultra Space. In the animated series, we also see the Mirror Dimension in Reflection Cave, a dimension to a sort of ghost realm. So there are many realities stacked upon one another in the Pokemon cosmos. And the plane of existence where sleeping Pokemon go, where their minds travel to physically be? Well, you could play that through the Dream World game that used to exist on the internet. You'd connect your DS up using Black and White or Black and White 2. And your Pokemon will go on adventures, play in mini games, go to real locations, and you could even catch Pokemon in Dream Balls. Additionally, there was a 3DS download title called The Dream Radar, where one Professor Burnett of the Alone the region was researching the Therian forms of Landorus, Tornadus, and Thunderous. She speaks in Pokemon Sun and Moon of the world of dreams as if it is another dimension that she really was researching. There too, you can catch Pokemon in Dream Balls. And off the northern coast of the Sinnoh region, for an unlucky few who go to sleep, they might not wake up as they're haunted by the Pokemon Darkrai. Darkrai exists on the Nightmare Isle, and while you can go there via boat, because again, it's a physical, real place, you can also access there telepathically and most people get trapped there by way of dreaming in the wrong hotel. It's like the island and these other realms are mirages, sometimes there, sometimes not, the doorway only open in specific circumstances. This is like the Mirage Islands across the Hoenn region. There's a Mirage Paradise in the animated series as well where Togepi lives and that's going to be important later. There's obviously the main Mirage Island where Wynart can be found, uh, Wynart are said to have ties to the unknown who are also from another dimension, but I digress. And of course two of the key other ones are the southern islands of Hoenn where Latias and Latios are said to be. Pokemon Masters, I've taken a stunning old trip out to the beautiful city of Ultimar. There has been sightings here of the legendary Pokemon Latias and Latios, but sightings are hard to come by because the Pokemon seem to disappear whenever hunted. I think it has something to do with a Mirage Garden. Yes, connected to the world of Altomar in the fifth Pokemon movie, there is a sort of mirage garden that Latias and Latios can bring people it trusts into. This is not too similar to the previously mentioned Mirage Paradise that Togepi is connected to. And I've done Pokemon Epics talking about Togepi and Latias and Latios before. The Pokemon seem likely related by Pokedex Entry talking about how they only like to appear before trustworthy people and only at peaceful times, and how their designs ultimately, with Togekiss being a winged plane-shaped Pokemon, and these two Pokemon 
on last year's Anatios being the shape of jet planes, as well as the red and blue and the triangles on their body matching the triangles of Togepi's eggs, suggest some kind of connection here. There's a Pokedex entry for Togepi that says that a proverb claims that happiness will come to anyone who can make a sleeping Togepi stand up. So again, we have our connection to dreams here with Togepi, and on Southern Island, when you interact with the rock that's at the center of the island, after capturing Latias and Latios, the rock says, all dreams are but another reality. Never forget. So once again, we have our symbolism here of dreams and being another realm, another reality. A reality that exists outside of time and space completely. Togepi has lots of traits that makes it kind of similar to a fossil Pokemon. It learns ancient power. In the animated series, its egg is found as a fossilized egg inside a, a sort of fossil dig site. But at the same time, and I've done a video about this recently, it's possible that Togepi's egg came from the future. An imagined more peaceful future. If you want to learn about that and how it might be connected to Celebi's Pokedex entry, talking about how it leaves behind eggs that it bought from the future, as well as the relationship to the Kimono Girls and how all of that relates to one another, I'll leave a link in the description. The other places that you can find Togepi in the wild are in the White City of Yanova, itself a city that doesn't seem to be very stable, fluctuating and changing every time you exit and enter. You can also find Togepi through the Dream Radar game, so yes, this Pokemon is very likely from there. But Pokemon trainers and people can access the Dream World either by going to sleep, and maybe that's what's happening during when you're playing Pokemon Sleep, or of course, by using the power of Marshuna and Mushroona and Muna. And wait, what are they pronounced? How are they said? What are their names? Pokemon that produce a dream mist. I now find myself in Central Park, which is another part of the Nova region known as the EntryLink Forest. You might remember this place from the world of your dreams, but you can't picture it quite. And that's because you can't actually access it now in Pokemon Black and White or Black and White 2. You had to connect up your game to the Dream World game online. There you could catch Pokemon in Dream Balls. They'd have special Dream World abilities. That's what the hidden abilities used to be called. And of course, the Dream Balls had an aesthetic that matched that of Muna and Mushana. These Pokemon create a special Dream Mist that takes people and Pokemon to the world of dreams. And they're kind of the Gen 5 equivalent of Hypno, the poster child for Pokemon theories generally. But the world of dreams and entering dreams extends far beyond Generation 5 and all the way back to the early days. Yes, there was Hypno, and also there was the classic Dream Eater Gengar, but then there were other legendary Pokemon as well that really delved into the world of nightmares. The nightmare Pokemon Darkrai, the Pokemon that heals those dreams, Cresselia, Latias, and Latios. There are many legendary Pokemon mythoses tied to the world of dreams and Pokemon, but there are also three other Pokemon. Well, four, technically. The forces of nature. Landorus, Tornadus, Thunderous, and Enamorous. Each of these Pokemon have the form that exists in our world, much like Giratina, and then they have uh, Therian, or in the case of Giratina, you'd be looking at an origin form. A form that's more comfortable, changing the biology to match match its original environment. They float on clouds, the clouds possibly made up of dream mist, and an animus aesthetically just looking a lot like the dream ball. These Pokemon are all also connected to the dream world and everything we've already talked about. I actually did a video a few years ago on an uh, and that video got so many views despite the fact that disappeared was spelt wrong in the thumbnail, but I didn't change the thumbnail because the video was doing well. But I will leave a link to that video down below because it's a really good one. It talks about how Cynthia and Alder are hooking up. Anyway, that's besides the point. The main key feature here is tying together a few Pokemon theories, like the one I previously mentioned about Celebi, we have the shrine in Ilix Forest, which looks like the shrine that appears in Yanova, the abundant shrine to these three dream Pokemon, which also looks like the shrine in Celestic Town, the town that was ultimately built over the ancient retreat where Kogita from Pokemon Legends Arceus hangs out with Enamorous. While at first, all three of these shrines seem completely unrelated, with the one in Sinnoh being placed next to cave paintings of Azel, Fuxi, and Mesprit. Uh, one, of course, just being in the wilds of the Unova region, and one being deep in the Ilix forest where Celebi is thought about. Suddenly, their lore ties together. Perhaps the reason that these shrines are all aesthetically similar is they're not shrines to any one of these Pokemon, but instead shrines reminding us of a gateway to a reality, a realm beyond our own. A gateway to the world of dreams. I do find it interesting though that the dream world was first officially introduced in Generation 5 in the Unova games, and now with the Blueberry Academy we are heading back to the Unova region to discover the truth about Terrapagos and the other element of dreams, the Paradox Pokemon. No one's quite sure whether they came from, whether they really came from the past or the future, or whether they came from the dreams of people, the three loyal ones of Kitakame, all of whom have Pokedex entries talking about how they were once smaller, meeker, weaker, or less beautiful, until they wished and dreamed 
deemed and wanted for change. It may be the case that while there is the realm of literal dreams, as in dreaming and sleeping, this also somehow fuels the power of the dreams, wishes, and wants of people. There are many more legendary Pokemon that can grant wishes, including Jirachi, Arceus. The Unknown can tap into the mind of the dreamer and make their thoughts reality. The Unknown do this using a crystal-like power, and so too then is their Terrapagos, the Pokemon that uses its crystal and shapes reality into the form that is wanted by a dreamer. Ah yes, it's a beautiful sunny day, and behind me a gorgeous lighthouse. Or is it, in fact, a sinister lighthouse, a laboratory on the Poco Path, the home to Professor Sada? Or was it Professor Chiro? I'm not quite sure. In their research notes, the special Pokémon that shouldn't exist, Pokémon from the past or the future. They're known, of course, as Paradox Pokémon. Since they were first discovered in the depths of Area Zero, Paradox Pokémon have both bemused scientists and conspiracy theorists alike. Pokémon that seem impossible to be real from the ancient past and far-off future. The far-off future Pokémon are described often as UFOs and weapons and cyborgs, and the ancient Pokémon like Screamtail are said to be a billion years old, older than any Pokémon in the fossil record. These fanciful descriptions may well be the result of just incorrect Pokedex data programmed by children travelling the Pokemon world, or information that's come from the Occulture magazine that's very pervasive in the mindset of the people of Palbea. This was so powerful, in fact, that it drew Professor Sada and Churo down to the depths of Area Zero, where they intended to create a time machine to bring these Pokemon from the past and future to the present day. So they say, while we have had time travel and time machines in Pokemon before, between Celebi and the time capsule in Generation 2, as well as a man who's making a time machine in the Unova region in Pokemon Black and White, we just haven't had deep canonized lore time travel, and certainly not Pokemon that have just come from the past and future. These Pokemon also feel very different to the likes of Fossil Pokemon or Genesect. So what are they really? Well, many people have put forward the idea that these Pokémon are not real. They were actually manifested from the dreams and wants and hopes of Professor Sada and Churro. In large part, this is because... Dreams and wishing comes up a lot in dialogue throughout Pokémon Scarlet and Violet, and the first part of the DLC, Teal Mask. The loyal trio wished to be stronger, and so they were. So too did Kieran, and sure enough, in the Indigo Disc. Oh, is he tough. But it seems that this wishing power has not come from Terrapagos, the Pokémon that makes its home at the subterranean level of Area Zero. No. That seems to be connected to another mysterious Pokémon altogether. Terrapagos's power is around Pokémon types, and changing Pokémon types to be sure. It seems to be the case that Terrapagos's power in its many forms seems to be pretty integratable into technology. We see this in the Terrarium, where at the top of the dome there is a giant orb filled with liquid that has come from Terrapagos's power. This allows for the Terrarium to exist. A magnificent and very expensive feat of technology. So too is their AI, Sada and Churo, who have been made possible as a result of the integration of terrestrial technology. And it seems that this terrestrial technology also powered the time machine. So was it really a time machine? Well, in some ways, at least, yes. We know that Heath did see Paradox Pokemon 200 years ago. But how is this possible if Sada and Shiro made the time machine to bring these Pokemon to the present time rather than sending them away to the past or future? Well, all is explained at the end of the Indigo Disc. This is your last chance for those big spoilers. Professor Sada and Shiro have many labs. In the Poco Path Lighthouse, you can see right now, if you walked in today, Terrapagos on the screen. It's a diamond shape, but it is the one that was revealed to be Terrapagos, so they knew all about it. How? Well, when exploring the new cave system in Area Zero, we find that Sada and Churo had in fact been down there doing research, and in a personal journal entry, they mention just at some point having a, a strange experience, appearing somewhere humid, where there is a crystal pool of water, and interacting with a child who gives them a white tome. Of course, if you've played to the end of the Indigo Disc, you know this white tome is the tome of Briar that has the complete information about Area Zero and Terrapagos having witnessed it herself. 
you give this book to Professor Sada and Shiro. You are this child in a sort of bootstrap paradox. They got the book from you and you got the book because Briar completed it from the events that they set in motion. The book is a paradox. You are a paradox. And in this way, they are paradox Pokemon. They were created as the result of a paradox. But where do they come from? Well, Sada and Churo say it pretty explicitly. They come from other timelines. So they are coming from alternate universes. You might think, is that not like Giratina or the Ultra Beasts? Well, think about it like this. If Giratina comes from the distortion world, a reality that is so different to ours that the, the laws of physics work differently, and the Ultra Beasts that come from Ultra Space, possibly beyond the reach of the observable universe, parts of reality so far away that the beings are just odd, then these Paradox Pokemon are from Earth. They're from the Pokemon Earth, just not the Earth that you are on, or perhaps any Earth that we've ever experienced. Somewhere there's a different timeline where all Pokemon are very cyborg-esque. That is where the future Paradox Pokemon are from. And there's also a timeline where Pokemon are savage and wild, and that's where the past Paradox Pokemon are from. I expect in future games we'll get them in the same way that we get Pokemon like Ultra Beasts through wormholes. Because that's all they are. They're Pokemon from Earth in different dimensions. You might say, hang on, isn't that kind of like Guzzlord? Because wasn't he from a, a version of Alola? But I think that Alola is not on this Poke Earth, but rather on a copy Poke Earth far off somewhere else in the universe. But that is a theory for a different time. There was one more point for the dream theory, because of course, Sada and Mishiro appear to you in the form of a sort of mist. When I first saw this, I likened it to the dream mist that you find in the Unova region. And of course, Unova has been getting a lot of nods with this indigo disc, with the actual Blueberry Academy itself being there in the Unova region. But Tarapagos doesn't seem to have any connection to that. I do believe it's the Paldean Academy's sister site, the Blueberry Academy, and its co-founder, uh, Cyrano, who is sort of the main investor behind Sada and Churro's research. But other than that, the connections to Unova and the Dream World are actually relatively limited for Area Zero itself. Note, despite how non-technological it's looking, what we're seeing here is time travel. It's a less technological version of time travel. I believe this is how Sada and Churro also after awakening and finding Terrapagos, managed to present themselves to Heath 200 years ago. He saw them with Terrapagos, drew Terrapagos in its ultimate form. He, from them, learned about the secrets of time travel, uh, secrets that would set all the events in motion, and of course witnessed the Paradox Pokemon, who were there 200 years ago for a moment, and then gone until they were recently discovered for the first time by Sada and Churro. And so there you have it. That's it. That's the canon explanation as to how Paradox Pokemon work. Pokemon Masters, Berkey Potobi here, and welcome to Kitakame. All new secrets, lore, history of the Pokemon world can be found. And I got a theory that I think you're gonna particularly like. There's a folktale in Kitakame, a myth, a legend that's come down from old Hisui of a creature that survived from the ancient times. See, modern day, Ursaring does not evolve. It is the final evolution in an evolutionary chain that has stayed that way for hundreds of years. But in old Hisui, the area now known as Sinnoh, it was said that you could evolve your Ursaring into Ursa Luna, an incredibly powerful and protective Pokemon. But rumor has it that in Kitakame, there is a form of this creature that survived, known as the Blood Moon Beast. Perrin, a descendant of Adaman of the Diamond Clan, is on the lookout for this Pokemon. And she reckons that if you get very good at photography on a misty night, you might be able to find this Pokemon in the Timeless Wood. And sure enough, you can. You battle it and it has a health bar, like a Titan Pokemon. It's the only Pokemon like this. When you catch it, you can hatch eggs from it and you can get Teddy Ursa, but the Teddy Ursa will never evolve into this form of Ursa Luna ever again. It seems to be a one of one Pokemon. And oh, you can bet that it's got Pokedex entries. In Scarlet, it says that it crossed the sea and drifted ashore in a new land. Surviving in this place led it to take on a unique appearance and gain special powers. In Violet, it says that this special Ursa Luna can see in the dark with its left eye and protects itself with mud that is as hard as iron. For I believe that the Blood Moon form of Ursa Luna isn't just a, a species of 
versus Luna, a group of Pokemon that have survived down here in Kitakami. No, as I mentioned, it is one of one. I believe that the Blood Moon form of Ursaluna is the last surviving Ursaluna. Its body has changed and warped and transformed as a result of living for so very long. This would explain, of course, why any new cubs that hatch from its eggs can no longer evolve into this form of Ursaluna. But the question is, how? How would a Pokemon like this survive here in the Timeless Woods? Well, let's just take a little look at the name, shall we? Timeless Woods. As if time doesn't move on here. A Pokemon that might find itself here in the woods might find itself staying the same way forever. There are many ghosts that inhabit the Timeless Woods, and you can even find White Striped Basculin here. Another form from the days of Hisui. So something about this forest makes time stand still. Despite how it looks, this form of Versa Luna hasn't changed to like steel type from the ground type. Or normal hasn't changed into ghost. It's not some kind of possessed creature. In the old days, Ursaring used to evolve into Ursa Luna thanks to a resource called the Peak Block, which is just simply no longer available in modern day. Ursaring cannot evolve into Ursa Luna anymore. There's certainly no indication of the Peak Block being available in Kitakame, and if it was there, it wouldn't be available in this woods. The Peat Block is found in marshy areas like the marshes in the south of Hisui. And what's more, Teddy Ursa and Ursaring don't live in the Timeless Woods. Again, this Pokemon is a lone wolf, or lone bear, so to speak. It says in the Pokedex that this Pokemon crossed the sea, suggesting that it came from the Hisui region. Now, I believe Hisui and Kitakame to be pretty much connected, but that didn't mean it didn't come by way of sea. It likely swam south of the Hisui region as its kind were dying out, and found its way following a stream upwards. Up, up, and into Kitakame. That actually is a stream that runs from the north up to the top of the Oni Mountain. There, in the very center of the Oni Mountain, is a pool that has very particular properties. A crystal-like structure that's very similar to the one found in Area Zero. You can even find Glimmer and Glamora here. This place has the music of Area Zero that will even play little riffs from time to time. It's a sacred place. Heck, there's even a wild and unique Milotic here. According to Briar, studying the area of Kitakame and studying this pool specifically might be able to help her in bringing the power of terrestrialization to other regions. In Paldea, it seems that terrestrialization is happening because the crystals in Area Zero seem to have an energy that flows through the Earth and creates Terror Raid Dens, as well as that Herba Mystica grows and certain Pokemon eat it, and they can even become Titan Pokemon. If the same is true here, it explains why there's Terror Raid Dens all over Kitakami. And it explains why the herbs that were put in the mochi that the uh, heroic trio uh, ate caused them to become gigantic and have health bars like Titan Pokemon. And perhaps that ties into Ursaluna. Ursaluna is the only non-Titan Pokemon to have a health bar like this. Perhaps it's been getting its nutrition from the leftover remains, or, or, or rather, a source similar to Herba Mystica. If we follow the water from the Crystal Pond at the top of the Oni Mountain, it actually goes off in two directions. One runs north, up towards where I believe the Hisui region, or Sinnoh region to be. This is possibly where Ursaluna swam from. The other pools in the timeless wood. So I suspect that this Ursaluna has been getting its nutrition from this pool. This is where it gets its drinking water from. And it's the minerals that is in the crystals, in the in the water, and in the earth that has allowed this Pokemon to survive for so very long. And also that it ends up inside of the herbs of the mochi that allows the other Pokemon to become titans. I've said, of course, in different Pokemon theories that there's a lot of tie between the life force of Pokemon as it displays itself in Mega Evolution and Z Crystals, Gigantamaxing and terrestrialization. And right here, we have another example of how the life force of Pokemon might be affected. This very idea was actually explored pretty recently in the new Pokemon Snap game. And it's interesting to note that when you find Ursaluna, you do it through a little Pokemon Snap mini game where the boss Pokemon of that game are said to be the actual Pokemon from hundreds of years earlier, the Lumina Pokemon depicted on ancient cave walls because they've been feeding off of the Lumina energy inside the plants. This is the same here for Ursaluna. And this makes sense, because if this Ursaluna is the last living Ursaluna that's lived well beyond its years, changing it into the Blood Moon form, it makes sense how Perrin found out about it. Because ultimately, there will be stories from old Hisui of the dying out of the Ursaluna species. And this information will have been passed down through her family from the time of ancient Hisui. And so she will be the last person in her clan likely to see this Pokemon until ultimately you catch it. But with a Pokemon this cool, let's put some preservation efforts in and make sure it doesn't go extinct. Hello there, it's me, Professor Oak. This video is over, so please choose another one wisely and quickly. Bye-bye.
Hello, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Vitovi here, and I'm just keeping my voice and energy down a little bit because it's the Japanese celebration of Obon, and where I am, behind me, well, it might look like the Dragon's Den, but actually, this is Lake Biwa, known to you as the Lake of Rage. The Lake of Rage is home to one of my favorite and I think probably most solid Pokemon theories. It's a short one, but I wanted to share it with you as well as this incredible place. This Pokemon theory is known well by the community, as a lot of people have come to the same conclusion, making me believe that this Pokemon theory is probably actually one of the few that is definitely real and intended by the creators. The Lake of Rage is one of my favourite places in all of Pokemon. It's beautiful and the home to, of course, the Red Gyarados, the first shiny encounter in all of Pokemon. Now, at the time, the reason that the Red Gyarados was red was actually because of forced evolution by Team Rocket's nearby radio waves that had made the Magikarp evolve into Gyarados, making it extra angry and extra orangey red. Of course, this doesn't really make sense in the context of other shiny Pokemon, but this was the reasoning. And an angry Gyarados is a terrifying thing. According to Pokedex entries in Shining Pearl, ancient literature suggests that there's a record of Gyarados that raised a village when violence flared. Pokemon Legends Arceus expands on this. Laventon, who is the writer of the Pokedex in this game, says, I suspect this Pokemon to be the true identity of a dragon written in ancient texts, which claimed that it raised an entire village with height white hot beams from its moor. The belief is that yes, north of Mahogany Town, there used to be a village where the Lake of Rage now stands. There are very few places in the Pokemon world that you can just fly to using the fly mechanic. It normally has to be a town or where there's a Pokemon center, but the Lake of Rage is an exception, despite the fact that through Sinnoh, there are three very important lakes that would be very convenient if we could just fly to them. The Lake of Rage is the one that you can. Additionally, in the beta development of Pokemon Gold and Silver, the Lake of Rage actually had a map that had a Pokemon gym. This was intended to be a village. I suspect that in the lore of the games in the past, this really was a village. This is where Old Mahogany Town once was before it was destroyed by Gyarados. Pokemon Legends Arceus, the game though, really expands our view on this. We have Commander Kamado and Benny. Now on Commander Kamado's desk is a picture of a woman in a white dress. She's nowhere to be seen in the game. Where did they leave from? Where did they come from? In the Japanese version of the game, Kamado actually speaks with Kansai Ben dialect, which is the dialect found most commonly around the Kyoto area of Japan, the area that inspired the Johto region. So he's from Johto, but I more specifically think he is from the area that is now the Lake of Rage, Old Mahogany Town, we'll call it. There is dialogue in the game from Benny, Commander Kamado's oldest friend. He says that he and Kamado saw their hometown burn down but to the ground by a Pokemon running amok and that they lost plenty of friends and comrades that day. When it comes to friends, I think it's not just friends, but also family, and that is the picture on Commander Kamado's desk. But what it comes to comrades, it suggests a level of militarism, a level of unity between them all in a time of violence. And that's just interesting because Gyarados' Pokedex entry, as I mentioned earlier in Shining Pearl, suggests that Gyarados raised a village when violence fled. Additionally, in Legends Arceus, that Pokedex entry written by Laventon says that Laventon suspects that Gyarados is the true identity of this dragon written about in ancient texts. And I think the reason that Laventon suspects that is because he's heard of Gyarados doing something very, very similar when he heard it from Commander Kamado after the destruction of his home in Johto. And there's one more bit of evidence that ties into all of this, and the fact that it's referred to as a dragon in Pokemon Legends Arceus. There aren't Magikarp statues on the top of the Galaxy Expedition building, and they were put there by Sanqua, an ancestor to both Karen of the Elite Four in Johto, but also Claire and Lance of the Gym Challenge and Elite Four. She was likely also part of the same dragon clan that worships in the Dragon Den, and one of the dragon Pokemon of Johto is Gyarados. Actually, in the Dragon Den, there are these big writhing snake-like dragons. Whether these are supposed to be Gyarados or Dragonair, we don't know. But we do know plenty of the dragon trainers in the gym, as well as Lance himself, use Gyarados as their ace Pokemon. Gyarados is considered a dragon. And Sanqua originally, before making the Magikarp statues adorning the Galaxy Hall, wanted to make them Gyarados statues. But I'm guessing, given Commander Kamado's feelings towards Gyarados, that was not gonna happen. Now, for the next part of this video, I want to move away from the Lake of Rage. While the Lake of Rage is an interesting story and it is one of my favorites, while researching for this video, there were so many other little tidbits and bits of lore to do with Gyarados and indeed Magikarp that felt so interesting it would feel wrong to not mention them. For example, when Mega evolving, Gyarados was often criticized for not gaining the dragon type given its relationship to Lance. It's even being used by Lance in the latest animated series. However, it gaining the dark type now in light of this theory makes a lot more sense. 
Pokemon have always thought of Gyarados as a particularly dark Pokemon. It also makes a featuring role on Lysander's team in the animated series as a shining version once again. And this idea of the red Gyarados or the shining Gyarados indeed being the result of radio waves from the tower in Mahogany Town actually ties into Team Rocket's wider plot in Goldenrod City where they try to take over the radio tower. Now, while we know that they want to use this tower to reach out to Giovanni and resurrect Team Rocket, the radio director has a different concern. He says that Pokemon across the Johto region are in danger if Team Rocket have access to this radio tower. And I think it's because what the radio director knows that Team Rocket don't is that the power of these radio towers is really spectacular. It has the power to change the molecular structure of Pokemon, causing Pokemon to evolve and rampage. All the other towns and cities of the Johto region could become like the Lake of Rage. This is actually backed up in the Pokemon TCG lore, where electromagnetic waves are used by Holon in the search for Mew, and they alter the Pokemon's DNA, not forcing them to evolve, but instead altering their type and changing them. So we know that radio and electromagnetic waves can interfere with these Pokemon. I also can't not talk about Magikarp's Pokedex entry. The very first Pokedex entry from Red and Blue that says that in the distant past it was somewhat stronger than the horribly weak descendants that exist today. Why would Magikarp evolve to become so weak? And the answer is simple, it's because this Pokemon then becomes numerous. Magikarp is one of the most common Pokemon appearing in every single corner of the Pokemon world, apart from in the Unova region where Basculin seem to have won out over this species of Pokemon, but you can still find them at incredibly high levels in the nature preserve, including at level 100. Anyway, Anyway, I digress. This Pokemon is numerous, and that is its evolution strategy. By not investing so much energy and points into the strength of the Pokemon, it means that this Pokemon can focus on eating and of course reproducing. And with one of the lowest egg step counts to hatch, it means that this Pokemon can flourish basically anywhere. The survival strategy of this Pokemon is that even if it becomes prey for certain Pokemon, like we see in New Pokemon Snap, it being swooped up by Pidgeot, even if it is to become the main prey source for most Pokemon in the wild, there are just so many of it that it simply cannot become extinct. The next part of the evolutionary strategy is even more simple. While a lone Magikarp can't fend for itself, nor can a batch of a hundred, a hundred defended by one single Gyarados, means that all of those Magikarp are likely to continue to reproduce and evolve further on into Gyarados. Variations in its evolutionary strategy can be seen in what is effectively the first regional variant, other than perhaps Arbok and its many hooded patterns, that being in Feebas, a Hoenn Pokemon that looks exactly like Magikarp. This Pokemon evolves into the beautiful Milotic and is clearly related to Magikarp and Gyarados, with them being parallel evolution lines. Feebas is, well, the ugly duckling Pokemon. So this Pokemon is less likely to reproduce. However, it's also less likely to become the prey of any particular Pokemon because it looks less delicious to eat. The idea of a regional variant for Magikarp as well is not that far-fetched or sir-fetched or hang on, where's this analogy going? In Pokemon Legends Arceus, in many of the houses, you can find statues of Magikarp, but they are in fact of different Magikarp hanging over the cooking pots in the room. According to some leakers online, and I'm not sure how credible this is, there was supposed to be a regional variant of Magikarp introduced in Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and so this would have been a hint for that Pokemon, which of course does not exist. There is of course the old classic theory that Magikarp and Dratini swapped evolution lines, and that Dragonite is somehow supposed to be an evolution to Magikarp, and that Gyarados an evolution to Dratini and Dragonair, given those serpentine bodies, and again, the connection to the Dragon Tamer Lance, but this makes no sense. Gyarados and Magikarp take very specific inspiration from the mythos of the carp that jumps over the waterfall and finds itself becoming a dragon. It's interesting to note that in this legend, the carp doesn't just jump over a waterfall, but specifically jumps through a Tory gate, and such a gate exists here at Lake Biwa, where I'm recording this video. Anyway, that was just excess Gyarados and Magikarp lore that didn't tie into this story, the story that I actually think happened. The story of Old Mahogany Town, a real town within the world of Pokemon's history, the home of Benny and Commander Kamado, destroyed by the rampaging Gyarados. Pokemon Masters, Berkey Batobi here, and welcome to the wonderful world of Pokemon. Where precisely, I don't actually know. Last I remember, I was in the Hoenn region. You know, I think I might have stumbled upon the Togepi Paradise. It's a secret place. 
Oh, Togepi. Oh, you must know about Togepi. It's a very popular Pokemon. Although there haven't been that many sightings recently. I do remember there was a beautiful gym leader from Cerulean City who had one one time. Of course, she then ended up getting married to... Oh, sorry, you don't care who she got married to. What you care about is Pokemon. And I'm here today to tell you about Togepi. Togepi is the Spike Ball Pokemon. It's a fairy type, although that classification was once considered to be normal. Although Togepi is truly anything but. If cared for by a trainer with extreme happiness, it can become a Togetic. And then with a shiny stone, the Jubilee Pokemon, Togekiss. Pokemon Masters, I am here today doing something very special. I am returning something I found. A petrified Togepi egg. I doubt we'll be seeing it hatch today. And I found it on a fossil excavation. And this isn't the only documented case of this happening. Togepi has been found around fossil Pokemon before and shares similarities to fossil Pokemon. For example, it knows the move Ancient Power, which prior to the events known as Generation 3 were only learnable by legendary Pokemon, fossil Pokemon, and a handful of other oddities, most of which are like Relicanth and Claydol, who are also known for being ancient. In fact, there's even similarities in the way that it goes from being an egg to a Pokemon, in the same way that the claw fossil goes from being a fossil shaped like a claw to an Aranith, or a dome fossil to a Kabuto, or a Helix fossil to an Omanyte, praise be to it. So, if it's not a fossil Pokemon but shares similarities, and it is ancient, why isn't there that many documented recordings of it? For that, we're going to have to take a look at my notes. My notes indicate that Togepi and its evolutions only appear to kind and pure-hearted people. Togetic is disheartened around sad trainers and is known as the happiness Pokemon. And there are proverbs that talk about happiness coming to those who can make a sleeping Togepi stand up. Some even speculate that Togepi and its evolutions could be related to the Eon duo, Latios and Latias. Maybe one in a million Togepi become one of these Pokemon. These Pokemon are brother and sister and share a lot of design traits with the Togepi lines, including the triangles on their bodies and the colors. As well as that, they fly, have mystical powers, and are very in tune with the emotions of people and will only open themselves up to trainers who have compassionate hearts. So a lot of the same themes as the Togepi line. And just like we're sitting in Togepi's secret mirage garden right now, Latias and Latias also have their own secret garden. Of course, we've talked about legendary Pokemon, fossil Pokemon, and Togetic, Togepi's first evolution. But there is a Pokemon that is rarer than all of them, Togepi's final evolution, Togekiss. And that's a whole other matter. Togekiss's Pokedex entries talk about how it only appears to the pure-hearted and kind people. Everyone knows it only appears in regions where there's no conflict. But given that every region has its own version of Team Rocket or Magma or Galactic, it's not surprising that sightings have become fewer and fewer. And that's without the intergalactic Pokemon War coming up. Oh, I'll tell you about that another time, though. For now, though, I bought this egg to the Togepi Paradise because it might be one of the few places in the whole Pokemon world where a Togepi egg might hatch away from other humans. Plus, that's why I brought you with me, Pokemon Master, because I know that you are pure of heart. And perhaps, if we look upon this Togepi egg together, then maybe, just maybe, so high, Pokemon Masters. Hey, Pokemon Masters, Berkey Patobi here. Sitting next to me is a Stantler here in Nara Park, or as you might know it, Violet City. I just beat the gym leader, Falconer, who's a bird keeper like me. And after beating him, I got a call from Professor Elm. See, Mr. Pokemon had this mysterious discovery, a Pokemon egg that was left for a trainer like me. I believe Mr. Pokemon got this egg from the Kimono Girls, but what were they doing with it? And what's the mystery behind Togepi in Johto? Now this theory was created by the incredible Ruin Maniac Files, who's actually editing this very video, and I'm just transcribing it for you here. It is one of my favorite, and definitely one of the least talk about theories in the whole of the Pokemon world. But before we talk about Togepi, we have to talk about those Kimono Girls. The Kimono Girls, of course, appear in Ecritique City in Johto. They are Kimono dancers, and through dance and songs, they pray and commune with Ho-Oh. They are worshippers of Ho-Oh, and descendants of the people who created the Ruins of Alf. This ties them not only to the Johto, region, but also to the Tanboy ruins in the Sevi Islands, but also to the Salacion ruins in the north in ancient Hisui. It's possible that they are connected to the Draconid people and the Diamond and Pearl clans that traveled north, as well as the Celestica people 
that traveled north before them. They are guardians of history, but what makes them really interesting is that they are actually sisters. They're all related. They're Bill's sisters, the creator of the Pokemon PC system. He gives you an EV, and they are all evolution specialists. Almost every evolution is represented, apart from Glaceon, Leafeon, and Sylveon. But they don't all live in Ecrateague City. Valerie lives in the Kalos region, despite the fact that we know that she came from Johto. A dialogue in Pokemon Masters uh, suggests that she's not a true kimono girl, but perhaps at least spiritually, she is the Sylveon user. Erica, according to the Pokemon manga, is the daughter of the head of Selfco, another industry with ties to Infinity Energy and the Life Force of Pokemon, and she may well be the kimono-wearing girl who is the Leafeon specialist. Leafeon can be seen on her team at certain times, and in the manga, she has a connection with an Eevee. What's interesting to note is that when it comes to the kimono girls of Ecrotique, their father worked on the Sea Marvel project, which has its ties to the Devon Corporation. In Pokemon Omega Ruby or Alpha Sapphire, when obtaining the clear or tidal bell, Captain Stern will mention that someone came over from the Johto region, a young lad who worked under him, whose family had this bell, and that they passed down a special form of dance and this was when working on the Sea Marvel project, a project designated to using the life force of Pokemon inside the form of Infinity Energy. I actually found such a mythical bell while exploring the Pokemon world myself, and I also found out more about Infinity Energy when exploring the ruins of Alf. Pokemon Masters, behind me is the ruins of Alf, now a popular tourist site for people passing through, but a long time ago, a special place of worship to a Pokemon that is unknown to us. There are also depictions of ancient fossil Pokemon and even the legendary Pokemon Ho-Oh. But who exactly worshipped Ho-Oh? What was it all about? I know this is a little bit of a sidetrack from Togepi and the missing Kimono Girl, and I promise we will get back to them. First, we need to talk about this. The Ruins of Alf and the Sinjo Ruins, built to the north of Johto as a merging of the cultures of the people of Sinnoh and Johto. This is why the architecture of this place in many ways matches that of old Hisui and the Spear Pillar, but also we can see the worn down Rhydon statues, which are found in the Ruins of Alf. But if the Sinjo Ruin event is all about Arceus, then what's that got to do with the Ruins of Alf and the depiction we see there of ho -Oh. Well, everything. Because Arceus in this event that you can only access via going to the Ruins of Alf with your Arceus uses the power of a Pokemon called the Unknown. The Unknown, normally weak by themselves, come in a plentiful amount and they use their powers together to manipulate life energy. There they create eggs of the creation trio, Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina at level 1. The Ruins of Alf then, with their depiction of Ho-Oh and fossil ancient Pokemon, might be telling the story of Ho-Oh's ability to revive long lost Pokemon? But we know from Jotonian legend that Ho-Oh did resurrect three lost Pokemon, lost in the tower that burnt down. They became Raikou, Entei, and Suicune. And no, I'm just gonna say it here, I think they probably didn't look like their paradox forms before they were resurrected. But according to its Pokedex, Ho-Oh doesn't actually have this power by itself. What seems more likely is that when this tragedy occurred, the people of Ecrotique City of that age, likely the Kimono girls that were existing in the city then, borrowed the power of Ho-Oh or rather they worshipped Ho-Oh, and Ho-Oh borrowed the power of the unknown, using their creation power to bring life to Raikou, Entei, and Suicu. This idea is further explored in Pokemon Crystal. There's a specific line of dialogue from a sage that suggests a particular connection to Suicune. It is the unknown that are a life-giver Pokemon. In the third movie, they're even depicted as a legendary Pokemon in a book full of Pokemon legends. <laughs> again, not too dissimilar to the Scarlet and Violet book, though again, I truly believe that the Raikou and and Suicune that perished in the tower did not look like the Raikou and Suicune paradox forms that we know about, and the Entei that I'm sure will be joining soon. Still, it seems that the Unknown have an incredible godly power, and there are certain Pokemon like Arceus and Ho-Oh that can tap into this power, and by worshipping to these Pokemon, the Kimono Girls of old were able to help the three Pokemon that perished in the tower, perhaps their own Vaporeon, Flareon, and Jolteon, and they brought about Suicune, Entei, and Raikou. Before I move on and finally get to Togepi, I do have one last thought about the unknown, admittedly unrelated to this theory. Okay, Pokemon Masters, so I'm walking around the ruins, I'm checking out the cool excavations that they've got going on here, um, and I've been thinking about the Pokemon Wobbuffet. Wobbuffet is a Pokemon that biologically isn't like other Pokemon. It's not a mammal or a reptile or a fish. Its biology is said to be that of singularly the tail. The tail that before it was Wobbuffet was, of course, Wynut, the black shape with one eye. I'm wondering if perhaps Wobbuffet's closest living relative is its closest relative in the Pokedex order. I wonder if it's related to the unknown. 
Yes, you see, Wobbuffet is Pokemon number 202 in the Pokedex, right next to 201, the unknown. When you look to Wobbuffet's tail, it alone doesn't look that much like an unknown, but when you look at its pre-evolution, why not? It looks well, a lot more recognizable. Warbuffet's Pokedex entry talks about how it desperately tries to keep its black tail hidden. This behavior is said to be proof that its tail hides a secret. It is a defensive Pokemon, its body taking hits, uh, because again, the tail is the real Pokemon. It can take the hits because the rest of the body of Warbuffet is does exactly what it's designed to do, be a defense mechanism for the tail. Why not, according to its Pokedex entries, huddle together. They're very communal, much like the unknown. It seems likely that the unknown took this form to further explore the Johto region and the rest of the Pokemon world. It's a mysterious Pokemon, and when it comes to why not, it can only really be found in the wild on Mirage Island, a, well, Mirage Island, and that's not too dissimilar to the other baby Pokemon that is a bit of a mystery that we're finally going to get to, that being Togepi. But before I can get onto that, I should finally reveal to you who the missing Evolution Glaceon user is when it comes to the Kimono Girls. Knowing who she is will make Togepi's role in all of this a lot clearer. But the Kimono Girls are traditionalists, and they strive for joy and peace between people and Pokemon. They're not looking to use technology for evil or humanistic gains. So we still have a missing user here, Glaceon, and I previously mentioned that perhaps it was Bryson of the Unova region, but Bruin Maniac makes a much better and more compelling argument. Cynthia is the Glaceon user. She uses Glaceon on her team in Pokemon Black and White and Black and White 2, and she is from an ancient law-keeping clan, those found in Celestic Village. In the Sinjo Ruins event, she tells you about the Kimono people's ability to dance and sing to commune with godly Pokemon. The Sinjo Ruins created as a merger of the people of Sinnoh and the people of Johto. Additionally, she uses a number of Pokemon that are very important to the lore of the Pokemon world. Lucario can sense great aura, tie to the life force of Pokemon. Spiritomb was literally made out of angry spirits of Pokemon being bound to an odd keystone. This happened at the Sea Marvel. And then she has Togekiss a very rare and unique Pokemon, uh, the evolution of Togepi. Togepi is found very rarely in the Pokemon world. According to its Pokedex entries it and its evolutionary line, only like to appear in times of great peace. It's actually quite peculiar that Volo has one in Legends Arceus, though that might be a whole other thing. And Togepi are mysterious. Perhaps they're an ancient Pokemon. They can learn ancient power in their evolution line after all, and Ash finds the Togepi egg in the animated series at part of a fossil excavation site. We know Togepi can open portals to Mirage Worlds where Togepi live together, and I've already done a Pokemon epic talking about exactly how Togepi might be related to Latias and Latios, further tying it to the dragon clans of the Pokemon world. But Cynthia just has a Togepi egg, as did Mr. Pokemon in Johto. Cynthia will give you this Pokemon egg, and Mr. Pokemon gives it to you, well, gives it to Professor Elm who gives it to you, but he got it from the Kimono Girls. And sure enough, there's another NPC in the Savvy Islands near to the Tanboy Ruins who will give you a Togepi egg. Probably again, Mr. Pokemon who got the egg from the Kimono Girls. So what's the connection between the Kimono Girls and Togepi? Well, in the Sinnoh region, where Cynthia lives, her home, it's Celestic Town. And at the center of Celestic Town, there is a shrine, a shrine that looks a lot like the shrine of Ilix Forest. This is a shrine to Celebi, and if you take the GS ball here in Pokemon Crystal version on the Virtual Console, Celebi will appear. Celebi is the final legend of Johto, and so far every legendary Pokemon in the Johto region has in some way had its connection to the Kimono Girls, be it the legendary beasts Lugia or Ho-Oh. Celebi is no exception. And it too has Pokedex entries talking about how it likes to appear in peaceful times, much like the Togepi evolution line. But it also has another interesting Pokedex entry. In Silver Version, it says that when Celebi disappears deep in a forest, it is said to leave behind an egg that it bought from the future. So maybe Togepi eggs aren't from the ancient past at all, but instead are from a more peaceful time, far in the future. Symbols of optimism for the lore keepers and kimono girls of the modern age that one day things will get better as long as Celebi keeps bringing these eggs from the future and we give them to trainers who have good intent. Again, I have no idea why Volo has one of these Pokemon. Hey Pokemon Masters, Bird Keeper Toby here, and I've made it to the place where legends are still alive. Behind me, one of the many towers that inspired the towers of Ecritik City. But did you know there are towers for legendary Pokemon elsewhere in the Pokemon world, specifically in Johto, in Goldenrod? Ah, you didn't know about that one, but there was long before the radio tower stood there. 
It's a deep hidden bit of Pokemon lore and it's one of my favorites. But before I get into that, I want to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Whatnot, without whom I would not be able to check out this legendary location. More on them at the end of the video. But for now, let's talk about the hidden missing tower of the Johto region. In Pokemon Gold, Silver, Crystal, Heart Gold, and Soul Silver, there's a very important piece of dialogue given to you by the Radio Tower Director when you save him from Team Rocket. He brings to you, depending on the version of the game, the Silver, Rainbow Wing, or the Clear Bell. These are the summoning items for ho -Oh, Lugia, and of course Suicune. He mentions that this item was found in the Radio Tower back when it was just a dusty old tower, a different tower that used to stand there, ultimately destroyed and replaced with the Radio Tower of today. It's clear then what he's referring to is an old room spot for ho -Oh and Lugia that lived on the Goldenrod coast. Now, given the name Goldenrod, this might suggest a connection to ho -Oh. ho -Oh being a golden sun deity. This would make sense as well because the ruins of Alpha nearby that depict ho -Oh, but I don't think so. First of all, this coast lines up with the Wild Islands, and I think would be better for a home for Lugia. But also, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. It would make more sense if ho -Oh used to roost on a tower to the east of the region. And sure enough, in the east of the region, away from Ecritic City, is Violet City, where another tower stands. The Sprout Tower. Now you might think, but hang on, they built this tower to Bellsprout, but that's not actually true. They simply observed Bellsprout's structure and the way that it moves its body and decided that this would be a good structure to base a tall tower around. I like this especially because the gym leader is a bird keeper like myself, so having a ho -Oh ho as your patron deity would make a lot of sense. Still, there might be other options here. For the tin and brass towers were created 700 years ago. The radio tower replaced whatever came before it, probably within the lifetime of the player characters much more recently. Suggesting that other towers may have coexisted alongside the two from Ecritik, we know that 500 years ago, the guardian deities of Alola fought against Solgaleo and Lunala. Uh, there are library entries in Mali City that talk about, as well, kings of the islands, which have been replaced, of course, in modern day with Kahunas. Mali City is an interesting city, Nearby and here, here, we learn that people of Kanto and Johto came over on the backs of their Pokemon to create the city, and Jotonian culture can be seen all over the Alola region, including in the Mali City Garden, where a five-tiered tower stands in the corner, replicating that that we see in Ecrity. So perhaps this golden tower is the kind of tower that used to exist in Johto. Maybe this is what the Tower of Goldenrod looked like before it was torn down and replaced with the Radio Tower. The Golden Tower which again would indicate more towards ho -Oh than Lugia. There are other towers in the Pokemon world. The Tower of Darkness and Waters appear in the Isle of Armor, likely built and constructed based on those yet again seen in the Johto region. There's a whole theory about how Kubfu came from Sinnoh and Johto after training in the mountains that exist between those two regions. This is why Urshifu has single and rapid strike, mimicking the battle styles of old Hisui. I do wonder, however, if the other tower of Johto was actually in the Kanto region after all. At first that might seem odd to you. Except we know that while ho -Oh is the leader of the legendary beasts, Lugia is the master of the legendary birds. And this is not just anime exclusive. While we see this in the movie 2000, in Azur Bay in the Kalos region there is the Sea Spirit's Den. The Sea Spirit is referring to Lugia, and this is where you'll find Moltres, Zapdos, and Articuno. In most games where Lugia and ho -Oh appear, the beasts appear alongside ho -Oh and the birds will appear alongside Lugia. In the Crown Tundra there are the Galarian forms of Moltres, Zapdos, and Articuno, set on the Pokemon website to only migrate to the Galar region, suggesting they're from somewhere else. Uno dos tres in the name could suggest a connection to Paldea, but we don't have a huge amount of evidence for that. Still, it seems that Lugia has some connection here to the Crown Tundra, for the Sea Spirit's Den in Kalos is actually in the Pokemon world equivalent of the English Channel, the space between France and England, or in this case, the Crown Tundra and the Kalos region. It's called the Sea Spirit's Den, reflective of perhaps the nearby Max Raid Dens. This is where Lugia definitely once was. But we know that legendary Pokemon can roam and travel the Earth, none more so than the legendary birds that can fly anywhere they like, pretty unrestricted. ho -Oh and Lugia though do have a roosting spot between Kanto and Johto, that on Naval Rock in the Sevi Islands where they can both settle down. I do wonder though if ho -Oh is more connected with the Kanto region, actually even more so than Lugia. Perhaps after acquiring the legendary beasts, the legendary birds were given to Lugia to look after. 
This is because not only do we see Ho-Oh flying across Kanto several times in the animated series, but if we are assuming that the Tower of Goldenrod in the west was Lugia's Tower by the Sea, then there was one in on the same landmass in the far east. That would be Ho-Oh's, the place of the rising sun. And sure enough, in the east of Kanto, there is actually a tower, but it's not one of the more traditional towers that you might think. It's the Pokemon Tower. And the Pokemon Tower is a very special place where spirits appear not as they should, not as ghost Pokemon do anywhere else across the Pokemon world. There's a healing circle set down in the middle of the building. And Ho-Oh itself represents a phoenix, a Pokemon that rises from the dead. So I wonder if this tower was originally built as a tower to Ho-Oh before Kanto and Johto separated, now only reunified by the presence of a modern day Pokemon League between the two, the Indigo Plateau. If this is the case, then it's interesting to note that in the time of Gold, Silver, Crystal, Hot Gold, and Soul Silver, the Pokemon Tower of Lavender Town is actually gone, replaced with, oh, you guessed it, the Radio Tower. The Radio Towers are Kanto and Johto, one in the far east and one in the far west. There's all sorts of odd stuff to do with radio signals. Radio signals and Heart Gold and Soul Silver allow for the control and rampaging of Gyarados, uh, and that's actually what forces the Magikarp to evolve early into Gyarados, creating the Red Gyarados. Team Rocket want to use radio waves to summon back Giovanni, but the radio director says that actually just in them having access to the radio tower, people and Pokemon all across the land are in danger, suggesting that the radio director knows something that Team Rocket doesn't. We know that radio frequency can tune into the sound of the unknown and the ruins of Alf. Perhaps the people working at these stations know something about the Pokemon world very deep. And in fact, the people who work at these stations is actually Silphco. Silphco, of course, have their hands in all sorts of Pokemon conspiracies and made the modern world version of the Pokeball that Kanto and Johto use, but they also have other technologies, like the Silph Scope, which they were likely using to scope out the Pokemon Tower before taking over and turning it into the Radio Tower, but also the Poke Gear has the Silph Scope label slapped on top of it. The Poke Gear is the very thing you use to tune into the radio. So it seems it's them, after all, that own these two radio towers. Perhaps they use the radio signals to manipulate the legendary birds to leave or come to the region, or perhaps they're trying to do something to do with the unknown, which we know are connected to Ho-Oh, as we see the mural of Ho-Oh in the ruins of Alf. Still, this is all dependent on the basis that Kanto and Johto were once one region, though I think that's probably pretty likely. Nonetheless, I find it absolutely fascinating that this one line of dialogue from the Johto games by the radio director shed so much light and history on the world of the Johto region. For before there were the two towers of Ekritik over 700 years ago, there were towers elsewhere in the region. Heck, maybe there was one up at the Lake of Rage before the Lake of Rage village got destroyed, but that is a whole other Pokemon theory. Hello, Pokemon Master, Spooky Toby here, and I've made it down to a part of Japan that inspired Hoenn. We're somewhere between Rustbro and Full Harbor, so maybe Meteor Falls. You might recognize these three from Attack on Titan, but the only Titan, the only giant I'm interested in right now is that of AZ, a man from the ancient past who's talked about by the Draconids that live in this very area. Dating back thousands of years, his history is interesting, and he knows all the secrets to infinity energy and a cursed past. There's someone in the Kalos region who has seen the passage of time as he has wandered all across the earth. AZ, a man of 3,000 years. He is giant and immortal when you meet him in Pokemon X and Y, but in his own time, 3,000 years ago, he was normal, a human, but he was a king. Some might say he was the king of multiple Pokemon regions. We'll talk about that shortly. First, what you must know is that he was the king at the time of the Ultimate War 3,000 years ago. This war was ended by the creation of the Ultimate Weapon, which used the life force of Xerneas, or Evelcor. It used the life energy of Pokemon to not only restore his fallen partner Pokemon Floette, but to end the war with a cataclysmic blast. In a great sadness, his Floette left him for 3,000 years, now a mortal like 
like he was, and he began to grow in size, likely as a result of being exposed to that energy. We know throughout Pokemon that changing size and shape as a result of excess energy is a thing. We see this with Gigantamax Pokemon, Totem Pokemon, Noble Pokemon, and Titan Pokemon. And AZ began to travel the world, he took with him a key that would be needed to activate the device should someone find it, and the ultimate weapon was buried by AZ's younger brother. You could learn about this by some files in Lysander's lab, which are only available for a very short window of the game time. Lysander has these files as he is the descendant of AZ's younger brother, and ultimately is researching where the ultimate weapon has been hidden underneath Geosenge Town. However, very shortly after your battle with Lysander, the ultimate weapon has a false start and ends up blowing up itself. So who exactly was AZ? Where did he come from? How did he become king? And who was his younger brother? Well, there's evidence that AZ was from the Unova region. If we look to the Parfum Palace, which is inspired by the Palace of Versailles, we see this picture of what looks to be King Louis XIII. However, this is actually supposed to be a picture of AZ. This is one of AZ's palaces across Kalos. And in the garden, Reshiram and Zekrom. Parfum Palace was built 300 years ago, and to be clear, Reshiram and Zekrom have been stuck in the white and black stones for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years before this, which means their statues being here, they can only have been designed by someone who actually saw those Pokemon thousands of years prior. Sure enough, in Unova in the ancient times, there was two kings of Unova, or two heroes, depending on the canon you're looking at. I believe in the time before AZ's giant war and the ultimate weapon fight, that AZ and his younger brother were the royalty of Unova. We actually know that one of the kings, at least, is buried in the tomb that is the Abyssal Ruins in the east of the region. In the west, there is the Relic Castle, and sure enough, in the Abyssal Ruins are the Relic items, along with 14 of the Arceus Plates. There are also inscriptions all over the world, and there's a lot of symbolism here, and there's a lot of reasons why and to do with character length, but it is theorized that the name of the person who was buried here, the royalty, was someone called Harmonia, which links them to Getsis. In fact, the crown that Getsis uses to crown N at the beginning of the game is the Relic Crown, and it's the same item that you can find here in the Abyssal Ruins. But there's something super interesting about the Abyssal Ruins. As I've mentioned already, there were 14 of the Arceus plates there as well. So AZ has a connection to Arceus? Why were they buried down there? Well, it could well be the case that the other Arceus plate, the one that's of course missing from those that are found in the Abyssal Ruins, the Fairy Plate, is the one that they left behind in the Galar region. That's because, yes, a further connection here, I believe that AZ and his brother before they were kings of Kalos and kings of Inova were the king heroes of the Galar region. Yes, those that we learn about from the darkest day. Not only is the relic crown the same shape as Zacian's crown, and that's about to be super important, but also, Pokemon are yet again in the space of just a couple of generations referring back to this same mythos of two heroes. And what do you know, the darkest day was 3,000 years ago. I suspect not the same day as the day the ultimate weapon fired. I actually believe that the story that's happening in Galar is when these two are quite young. The story starts that the two heroes on the darkest day wish upon a wishing star. Then the darkest day happens. Eternatus wakes up, but Eternatus has been around for much longer. We know that from Pokedex entries that it actually dates back to 20,000 years ago. Why did it wake up 3,000 years ago? The two heroes awaken Zacian and Zamazenta and fight against this Pokemon. They fight against the Darkest Day and are heralded as heroes. After the battle is done, they bathe in Sir Chester Baths, just north of where the Fairy Plate was buried. I believe that the Darkest Day happened, not as a result of the ultimate weapon firing, but instead as a result of the wish made by these children, a wish to go on a grand adventure, to wake up Eternatus. That might seem ridiculous to you, but actually it's not. I believe that the wishing star that they saw, which they literally describe it as such, is actually not one of the wishing stars that's the part of Eternatus' body, but the other kind of wishing star that we know that travels around the Pokemon world every thousand years. The Millennium Comet, as it's known in the animated series, or just Jirachi, as we know it in the games. Jirachi's signature move, after all, despite being a wish-fulfilling Pokemon, is that of Doom Desire. I suspect that the conflicting wishes of these two heroes resulted in an apocalypse and the saving of that apocalypse, the darkest day, which would only last for a day. 
And this is where our heroes of the time would learn everything they need to learn about giant felling from the plates of Arceus, which, as written, tell us that the power of fallen giants were infused within the plates. With these sacred tablets in hand and Zashkin and Zamazenta by their side, AZ and his brother were able to defeat the giant Pokemon on the darkest day and ultimately put Eternatus back to sleep. It is interesting to note that in Zashin and Zamazenta's Pokedex entry, they're described as the Fairy King's Sword for Zashin and the Fighting Master's Shield, suggesting that even though they were both ultimately crowned and both technically kings, one became the Fighting Master while the other ruled as king. Fairy King is also interesting because it's the fairy plate that was left behind south of Surchester. The rest of the plates were taken, of course, to Unova when they ultimately colonized. We also see this, by the way, with one of the chief Pokemon found by the Abyssal Ruins being Frillish, and Frillish being dressed like uh, noble dignitaries from like England and France, actually, yet a further connection. That's besides the point. All of the relics of the Abyssal Ruins are also said to be 3,000 years old, dating them to the time of the Darkest Day and the ultimate weapon firing. And the connection might be drawn because the relic statue also looks a little bit like Deanne. Deancey is a Pokemon that's created from an irradiated carbon as a result of an exposure to a certain kind of energy or beam. It's possible that this beam was the very beam of the ultimate weapon 3,000 years ago. Carbon can commonly be found in the nearby mystical reflection cave, so it seems likely that Deancey is from here, especially as it's the only Kalos Pokemon that can mega evolve and its pink diamond structure matches that of the Anastar City Sundial. I'll digress. There's also a connection here to another mythical Pokemon, a Pokemon I don't think I've ever mentioned in any Pokemon theory ever before. That is the mythical Pokemon Meloetta. Another Pokemon somehow connected to Unova, it's possibly connected to this story. It knows a special move called Relic Song, and there are 32 relics in the Relic Castle. Meloetta's Relic Song would be the 33 relic, and 33 has some special symbolism around it. But the interesting part is this might be how Tarachi ties into the overall narrative. I didn't just get it out of nowhere. Yes, it's a wishing star, much like the wishing stars of the Galar region, but it is also said that Jirachi wakes up with a song, and according to an NPC talking about Meloetta, it seems to have lost its song when darkness covered the world, connecting all of these elements together. It is also true that the crown that was forged for AZ is that of his Pokemon, Zacian. Zacian and Zamazenta were hidden away in the rusted sword and the rusted shield, and tucked away, uh, hidden out of sight. Ultimately, over time, the history was even changed from being two heroes to one hero, and we see that statue in Motorstoke. It was the younger brother who shunned AZ and ultimately hid the ultimate weapon, and it was he who told his sons about it. It's interesting to know that in the Lysander Labs files, AZ was said to be the first king of Kalos, which means he is the one who settled the region and perhaps even established the Kalos region as we know it today. He took the plates to Unova next, where he and his brother fought over truth and ideals with Reshiram and Zekrom. A palace was created in the Kalos region, where he went to then further expand his rule and ultimately the Great War happened. The ultimate weapon is fired, and finally, their history is at an end. The little brother helps AZ bury the weapon. AZ goes traveling with the key and is no longer a king. He is an immortal who becomes giant himself, with all of this knowledge on how wishing stars works, on how the Arceus plates work, and of course, ultimately, one day, he would bury his brother in the abyssal ruins with those very plates. And in the ruins, an old writing system. Not the oldest, however. Braille exists throughout the Pokemon world created by the Draconids. And also, there is another type of writing. The Unknown. Their ruins can be seen all over the Pokemon world, but not dating back that far. The Tenobi ruins are said to be around 1500 years old, which means that they were created during AZ's time. Additionally, with the existence of the Arceus plates, we can finally move on and talk about what all of this has to do with the Draconids. Part 2. The Law Keepers, the Draconids. We know, of course, that the Arceus plates are tied to Arceus, and Arceus is tied to the unknown. It not just a writing system, but also the fabric that seems to hold together the Pokemon world, as seen in the Darkrai movie, and of course, in the uh, Sinjo Ruins clip. We see Arceus use these unknown to create Dialga, Palkia, and Giratina in the Sinjo Ruins. We think that Ho-Oh used these Pokemon alongside to create Raikou, Entei, and Suicune, and perhaps even give long life to humans in Ecritique, who seem to remember the falling of the tower 150 years ago. Something 
think not too dissimilar to AZ's long life. In the manga, Team Rocket used the Arceus plates here to control Arceus. The mystery stage is described as Cynthia as also being a place that people use to show respect to Arceus, and they celebrate with music and dance. So this knowledge is passed down by people like Cynthia and the Kimono girls, who seem to know a lot about the lore of the Pokemon world. Between them, they know about Dialga and Palkia and Arceus. They know about Ho-Oh and Lugia. They're not too dissimilar from the Dragon Clan, the Draconid. The Dragon Clan also exists in the north side of the Johto region, and in the manga, we see that their leader has a Rayquaza upon their head. This isn't an accident. There's also the embedded tower in Johto, where Groudon, Kyogre, and Rayquaza can be found. Markings on the floor of the embedded tower match those found in Sky Pillar. Sky Pillar and Cave of Origin sounding very similar to the Hall of Origin and Spear Pillar. Not only that, the Cave of Origin and the Sky Pillar are both guarded by Kimono Girls. As you can tell very quickly, all of these areas across Johto, Hoenn, and Sinnoh seem to be connected, and all of these clans of Kimono Girls and Dragon Tribes, whether that's Cynthia's family from Celestic Town, or perhaps the Draconids from Hoenn, all seem to be related. And this makes sense. We learn about the Draconids from Zinnia, who is herself a descendant of the original tribe that lived in what is now Meteor Falls, their home destroyed 2,000 years ago by that same meteorite shower that brings with it Jirachi. Since then, they've been nomadic, traveling across the Pokemon world and keeping Pokemon lore, so that makes sense for all of the aforementioned groups. We also know they traveled the world by way of sea. Civilog Town is right next to the Sky Pillar, but it's also next to the Braille Puzzle from which you can access the Regis. The Regis locked away eons ago by an ancient people. I suspect the Draconids. Perhaps a precursor to the unknown writing is the Braille writing, which can be found all across the Pokemon world. This would tie them directly to the people who built the Snowpoint Temple at the north end of Sinnoh, but perhaps again all the way back to Galar, where Regigigas can be found in the Crown Tundra deep underground. And temples to Regidrago and Regileki can be unlocked. Meanwhile, across the world in the Alola region is the Seafolk Village, again another group of nomadic people who seem to have ended up on the island, the one island that is the home to the altar of sun and moon. They have their hands in pretty much every legend that happens across the Pokemon world. And when we think about how they traveled, whether by sea or by land, if they were traveling north from the Johto region through the Dragon's Den where that Dragon Clan was established, then they would have made their way up to Isui that way. I believe that these are the people from Sinjo that Kogita references in the old verse. At least we assume this is the writing of Kogita. She references the fact that Sinjo is kind of like the Hisui region. If people traveled north to Hisui from the Johto region, they would have passed through Sinjo. And in fact, this is what they describe as the birthplace of the Sinnoh people. Perhaps it was there that they learned about Arceus and decided to continue to pursue the lore and knowledge about it by traveling upwards. Kogita, of course, is settled in the ancient retreat, and she brings with her legendary Pokemon as well. She has Anamorous with her. One day, though, this will become Celestic Town, where there'll be a shrine not too dissimilar to the shrine that appears in the Unova region that looks just like this. This is connected to Landorus Thunderous Tornadus, but it's also very similar to the shrine that appears in the Ilix Forest that Celebi uses. So there are a lot of connections between all of these different peoples and clans. And of course, her descendant is Synth, and while Cynthia herself isn't technically a dragon Pokemon trainer specifically, her Pokemon are very interesting. She uses Lucario, which is a Pokemon of immense aura, Togekiss, which has its own ties to the Kimono Girls, uh, Spiritomb, which has its ties to <laughs> the spirits of Pokemon, and then of course, Garchomp, her lead dragon Pokemon. Furthermore, in the Kalos region, she seems to have a cousin, which is Drasna, who has all dragon Pokemon and, and says that she comes from a Sinnoh village that respects old traditions. This is clearly, of course, talking about Celestica Town. And Celestica Town is, of course, where the Celestica people got their name. The Celestica people simply used to be Draconids, likely the very ones that built the Snowpoint Temple. Anyway, I digress. From what we know about the Draconids from Zinnia, we know that they have a sacred duty, and that is law keeping. Law keeping in relations to dragons, sure, but about all the legends of the Pokemon world. So the question becomes, when did they get this mission? How did it happen? And this is where I connect the two halves of the video together. Their culture and their entire tradition was given to them back in Meteor Falls by the one and only AZ. Just some points here for context, 2,000 years ago was when Rayquaza first appeared. 
1,000 years ago was when the Draconids wished for it to mega evolve, which happened thanks to a meteorite. AZ was there, and he named it the Delta Pokemon. He likely traveled to Meteor Falls as a result of everything that went down with the ultimate weapon and the darkest day, likely to try and find Jirachi, the wishing star Pokemon, from which both so much great had happened, but also so much terrible. He found the Draconid people and taught them about so many of the Pokemon worlds, what we consider legends today, taught them of the Arceus plates and likely warned them of the prophecy of a wishing star that will come by in yet another thousand years. Xenia also knows of the Kalos War and she has a particular question for the player character about if they follow truth or ideals. A very pointed question from someone who also must know the lore of Yanova. So Zinnia knows the lore of the Pokemon world, a responsibility handed down from her ancestors, likely given to them by AZ, the man who discovered all of this lore. But her job is not just to pass it down from herself to her descendants, it's also to safeguard this information from those who wish to use this knowledge for a great evil. Organizations like Aqua, Magma, and Flare to be sure, but also to protect it from the seemingly friendly corporations in the Pokemon world. Tired of running out of potions, TMs, and Pokeballs? This is where Devon is your best friend. Here at the Devon Corporation in Rustboro, we believe that the power of science is amazing. We're working on everything from Pokemon Dream Vision to the restoration of ancient Pokemon fossils. And we're bringing these incredible scientific advancements to you at your local Pokemart. The Pokeball is now just 200 Poke Dollars, and for every 10 you buy, you get yourself a Premier Ball all for free. Nowhere else in the Pokemon world can you get this kind of saving, so get on out there, Pokemon trainers, and catch them all. The Devon Corporation, a Pokemon trainer's best friend. Hey Pokemon Master, Buggy Patobi here and I've made it to the Hoenn region. This is Fukuoka City in Japan, or as you might know it, Rustbro. You can already hear the brass instruments in the air. I'm here, of course, doing research on one of the big technological companies, Devon, responsible for Pokeballs, medicines, and of course, the Hoenn Pokedex. I've been researching many Pokemon out here, but what's more interesting than the Pokemon is the technology itself. Because this technology, Pokemon Masters, is nothing ordinary. It was made from something very dark and very sinister. I'm talking, of course, about Infinity Energy. Part 3, The Abuse of Infinity Energy, the Life Force of Pokemon. The most powerful force in all of the Hoenn region is by far the Devon Corporation. Their reach can be felt across the region, and they're responsible for Pokemon technologies like Silphco. They create the Pokeballs of that region. They are also involved in Fossil Resurrection, a powerful technology that also Silphco has access to. And one researcher in the facility talked about working on a technology to see into Pokemon's dreams, a technology realized in the Unova region. The company's president, Mr. Stone, tells you about these technologies and how they came about, how his grandfather learned to harness the life energy of Pokemon itself to fuel these technologies. His grandfather was able to discover the methods that AZ had learned and harness the power of what he trademarked as Infinity Energy. It's not actually called Infinity Energy, it is simply the life essence or life force of Pokemon. You may also know it as Aura, and you may see versions of it in the form of Gigantamaxing, Z Crystals, and of course being used for Mega Evolution. But this is trademark Infinity Energy, and they use it on their submarines for deep sea exploration and on the rockets that they send up from the Moss deep space to enter for deep space exploration. They can use this technology to open wormholes as we see in the Delta episode between realities. The power of infinity energy is truly infinite. And there was a time in Hoenn's history when this energy was being used for an incredibly important project. The Sea Marvel. The Sea Marvel, of course, shares its name with Marvel City, and also the New Marvel, which is nearby. The New Marvel was intended to be a giant underground bunker of many floors. However, the project was cancelled. While the player can access the top floor, in theory, there are 69 floors underground, but the project died in development. We can learn more about this at the Sea Marvel, which today is a nature preserve for Pokemon, but it's littered with letters and notes from the time that it was used to harness the energy of Pokemon. For example, the seeming the innocent 10 slogans for a cheerful and fun workplace. Say good morning very loudly. Don't bring your Pokemon to the workplace. A strange thing for a world that's focused on people and Pokemon walking together. Always arrive on time and always stay late. Lay your life on the line in safety checks, so you have to be safe and you have to dedicate yourself to the job. Take joint responsibility for teamwork and obey your superior's orders absolutely. So now there's a clear hierarchy. Maintain top quality. Give up your sanity. Worship and praise the founder. Beginning to sound like a cult. Don't expect time off before you retire. And finally, no need to think. 
just work unceasingly. These are the slogans for a cheerful and fun workplace. This is not the kind of place that you would want to work if you had any other option. It seems that the goings on here were pretty shady. The need to not bring your Pokemon work and to lay your life on the line for safety checks implies that something dangerous is happening here as well. This is indicated by the presence of Spiritomb and an odd keystone. There's an apology note in the same room where Spiritomb can be captured from Professor Cosmo's dad. I am responsible for the loss of the odd keystone donation by the Orberg mine. Why did the people working here need a Og Keystone? And what's this got to do with Devon? Well, you can find a special confidential Devon secret investigation report, which says that the development of the new energy turned out to be true. The energy uses Pokemon's bioenergy. It's called Infinity Energy. This seems to suggest that the Devon Corporation were committing corporate espionage, assuming that CEOs of companies live a really long time, as Mr. Stone himself is already very old. We can assume that perhaps it was even even the case that his grandfather was alive and CEO for a long time, possibly even just skipping over his father. If so, this may be how his grandfather learned about Infinity Energy. It also mentions a report on Watson, who's deemed to be a traitor to the cause. Watson is a gym leader who is alive and well today, so this is recent history. In the manga, there was also a lore keeper before Zinnia, Aster, who died in a fire in the Embedded Tower protecting Rayquaza, and it was the Devon Corporation who were trying to capture this Pokemon for the Pokemon Association the main government in the Pokemon manga. Zinnia rescued her burnt cape from the fire and of course named her Wisma after her. And the Og Keystone? Well, it's not just a nod to the fact that the Sea Marvel is on Route 108 and Spiritomb is the combination of 108 angry spirits, but it is in fact just that. It's the combination of spirits, lost spirits, perhaps angry because their life energy was used in the pursuit of technological discovery. This is why you don't bring your Pokemon to work at the Sea Marvel. As well as Cosmo's dad and Watson the traitor, there was also the man with no power. His notebook can be found in the Sea Marvel. It's an old hidebound notebook. And it says, The damage caused by the cancellation of the new Marvel project has been catastrophic. As a member of the management, much of the blame and the debts will fall upon me. But that will be little consolation to my employees working under me who will lose their livelihoods. Which does make sense. To work in this job, you'd have to be desperate. And so these people needed this job. He laments that he is a man with no power, protecting nature, Pokemon, and the environment. It's a great idea, a fine ideal to aspire to, and Watson is a great man for dreaming of it all. But cruel reality and the organization that I must try to preserve have dashed those dream. So this is to suggest that the Sea Marvel was originally designed to preserve and protect nature and Pokemon in the environment. That's what the Sea Marvel was trying to do for the new Marvel project. So in what way was it trying to protect the world? And Watson was the man that dreamt of it all? It seems that perhaps he had a great ideal, but as the man with no power says, cruel reality has set in. Perhaps Watson wanted to protect nature and Pokemon and the environment, but couldn't do so without going by unethical means and so pulled the plug on the project. So. What use would the Hoenn region have for a 69-floor underground bunker? And the answer, of course, is to save people and Pokémon in the case of a, an apocalyptic event. Hoenn is no stranger to apocalypses. Meteorites fell down 2,000 years ago, destroying the home of the Draconid people. A thousand years ago, a meteorite came down and actually created the crater from which Sutopolis City was built out. And that's fine now, but meteorites hit the Hoenn region every thousand years. Another well-placed one could take out Sutopolis City, or perhaps any of the other central hubs in Hoenn. While the Moss Deep Space Center does act as a sort of orbital defense for the Hoenn region, protecting against meteorite showers with their various technologies, technologies described as Zinnia as being abominable, it doesn't hurt to have a failsafe, a place for the people of Hoenn to go. And it's not just the threats above the sky that fall down, but no, the Hoenn region has Groudon and Kyogre that can warp and tear apart the land and sea. Too much water or too much land? An underground bunker could survive them all. And actually, this ties into Team Aqua and Magma's plan. See, both Shelly and Tabitha, high-ranking members of the organization, used to work for the Devon Corporation. And there are files in the basis for Team Aqua and Magma. 
talking about primal energy, the same energy that Devon has turned into infinity energy, the trademark version. This primal energy used to flow regularly through Groudon and Kyogre and all Pokemon of old. The Azoth project was to have Archie or Maxi awaken Kyogre or Groudon and revert to the world to its primal state by using this energy. Possibly they learned about this energy from Shelby and Tabitha. But of course, not only standing in their way as you the hero of Hoenn, but also the Draconid people, who are also familiar with this energy. They learnt about this energy from AZ, the name of which likely inspired the Azoth project. But none of this changes the fact that Pokeballs are still being produced today. And in the olden day, it seems that Pokeballs were produced by an Apricorn and special ore jetting up from the ground, also likely filled with the life energy of Pokemon in a more natural state. Meteorites and rocks are a big part of Pokemon and they can contain energies. Uh, that's also seen in like the red and blue orb, for example. But that's besides the point. To produce Pokeballs on a mass scale in the same way Devon does, in the way that Selfco does, or using this technology to see inside a Pokemon's dreams, the dream world being a literal other realm in the world of Pokemon, like ripping open a wormhole into a Pokemon's mind, much like how the wormhole technology uses infinity energy, we have to assume that infinity energy is still being used today. And just because the new and sea marvel projects have been shut down, we are much like the man with no power. We have to face the cruel reality of it all. The Pokeballs are fueled by infinity energy. The question is just how much of the Pokemon's life force do they take? I mentioned earlier and in plenty of other videos how this energy displays itself in all sorts of different ways. There's Aura and Gigantamaxing, there's uh, Z Crystals, and there's even Noble Pokemon that seem to get the energy direct from Arceus itself. The more energy you add, the more the Pokemon can grow and transform. They become more powerful. It's thought that this energy is in fact the energy of evolution. It was irradiated at Evolution Stone that created the Mega Stones. The more energy you have, the more powerful the Pokemon can become. And this is confirmed pretty much with the Pokeball and the power that's inside, with the red light beam being pretty reminiscent of the red light beam that comes out from the Max Raid Dens. It's an outpouring of energy that literally changes the Pokemon's size, much like the Pokeballs. So it's possible that the technology harnesses this energy in a way that doesn't outright kill the Pokemon or hurt it too much but it does take some level of energy and agency away from the Pokemon. And in fact, it could well be the case why these evil team leaders, despite the fact that they have Master Balls in the offices of Team Aqua and Magma and Team Galactic, don't use those Master Balls to catch the legendary Pokemon because it would take away some of their life essence and weaken them. In fact, Cyrus says exactly this. This is why he seeks out the Red Chain instead of using the Master Ball to catch Dialga or Palkia. So let's hope, at the very least, that these Pokeballs are being made, at least somewhat ethically. So Pokemon Masters, you still sitting back and relaxing? Good. Here, let's draw these threads together. It's my belief that 3,000 years ago, two young hero children wished upon a wishing star that brought about the darkest day. A darkest day they were able to defeat with the help of Zashkin, Zamazenta, and lore about legendary Pokemon, including the Arceus Plates. Using their status and their new kingdom of the Galar region, they traveled over to the Unova region, where they became the hero kings of Unova, the youngest of which would eventually be buried in the Abyssal Ruins with the other Arceus Plates. The elder of the brothers, of course, AZ, also becoming the king of the Kalos region, basically king of the Pokemon world. However, he used everything he learned about legendary Pokemon and the life force of Pokemon, and abused this technology, creating the ultimate weapon to help revive his flow at AZ. He knew about the lore of legends of the Pokemon world and traveled across the earth, ultimately passing this knowledge on to lore keepers called the Draconids. It was their role to be guardians of this knowledge, knowing that such abuse could result in the wiping out of possibly an entire Pokemon nation and killing many, many Pokemon. However, in the modern day, there are technological companies, Devon, and I suspect, as you've probably seen in other Pokemon theories of mine, the Self Corporation, that have tapped into this very energy for technological means. And so once again, we have to be careful how we use this technology. We must learn from AZ's mistake 3,000 years ago. And this is really only the tip of the Pokemon theory iceberg. Over the last couple of months and years, I've done so many Pokemon theories that tie into this. The ethics of his catching Pokemon wrong. Uh, the dream world, how does it work? 
like uh, why Togepi is extraordinary. The combination of the four legendary big boss Pokemon ultimately being parts of the Arceus. Silphco and how they use teleportation. How Giovanni probably used teleportation and infinity energy slash the life force of Pokemon to open up wormholes into other realities for Team Rainbow Rocket. How this energy created the Blood Moon Ursa Luna in, in Kitakami. There, there is so many of my videos tie into this. This literally is the tip of the iceberg. So if you want to go anywhere deeper, uh, make sure to check out my whole Pokemon Epics or Pokemon Theories playlist. The Epics are the ones where there's usually like me doing cool live action stuff like in this video the theories are the ones that are exactly the same just without that so thank you all so much for watching and of course saw hi pokemon masters hello there it's me professor oak this video is over so please choose another one wisely and quickly bye bye thank you anyone who has ever contributed through patreon and especially the big patrons of this month lucas gates anthony lee charmander anzibal white seed geek pancake Immortal Absol and Jed Rubin, thank you for your incredible support.